No. No, stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour. Murder wears a strange mask. Every highway and byway is destiny's trail, and where it leads and what lies ahead is destiny's secret. Down a dark road speeds a car, bearing in it two who are destiny's children. Oh, they don't know it. To themselves, they're two people on their way to a masquerade ball. Steve Raymond and his fiancée, Marsha Phillips, heading for an evening of gaiety and laughter. But they are destined to spend a strange, macabre evening in fear. For one of the guests at the masquerade is death. You're rather fetching in your gypsy costume, Marcia. <laughs> in a moment, I'll be tempted to read your mind. Well, there isn't much I can hide from you, darling. Your womanly instincts are quite remarkable. Especially where Joan Williams is concerned? Oh, now, now look here, Marcia. I must admit this magician's disguise of mine isn't too effective. For one thing, it hasn't helped me to change your disposition. Steve. But if you will, my dear, please try to check your suspicions at the door. Fortunately, we're not married as yet, and Ben Carter's masquerade promises too good a time for you to spoil. At the risk of being stubborn, dear, I'm curious to know what you see in her. Or perhaps you can tell me why Roy Benson is still madly pursuing her. Well, I guess he never stopped loving her. He was her first husband. Just the same, Steve, dear. If I so much as see you go near her tonight... I might be tempted to drop a potent mixture in the punch bowl. <laughs> oh, be careful with your predictions, darling. You're a gypsy fortune teller tonight, and I'd rather not see you proven accurate. That's up to you, Steve. You're a little early with your masquerade, Marsha. Wait till we get to Ben's place. Then you can feed Strict Nine to Joan Williams and all my other lots. <laughs> Steve, my shirt. Oh, pardon me. I'm not supposed to know who you are. That wasn't fair, Ben. Uh, what else could we expect from my partner, dear? He knows every hair on my head. Well, don't fear. I won't give you away. Well, you both look perfect. You've adopted a rather simple costume, Ben. I've used this clown suit for 15 years. It's a durable disguise. Good heavens. What's that fellow in the black tights and shirt supposed to be? Hmm? No, he's posing as the royal executioner. Who can it be, Steve? It's hard to tell from here. I don't seem to recognize him. Steve, I've simply got to find out who that executioner is. Oh, now, Marsha. He's just over there. Well, can't you wait till midnight? Quiet, quiet. Here he is. Why, oh, uh, I beg your pardon. Good evening. That's a very unusual costume you're wearing. Thank you. I uh, merely borrowed it from a friend of mine. I hope it's effective. Your voice, it, it's quite familiar. Oh, now, Miss Phillips, don't you recognize Steve Raymond's rival for Joan Williams' hand? Roy Benson. Oh. Of course. I follow Joan everywhere. And especially on a night such as this. I couldn't resist seeing her dressed as Cinderella. And in a very charming costume, too, no doubt. Oh, but naturally, my wife, I beg your pardon, my former wife, has a talent for being beautiful. Now, what sort of executions do you have a hand in, Roy? Oh, no special method, Steve. I've really no preference. Hush, gentlemen. The dream approaches. Cinderella. Oh, my, what a charming trio. A magician, a gypsy, and an executioner. You're looking lovely, my dear. Thank you, Roy. How are you, Marsha? I don't know. As yet. How are you, Steve, dear? Looking for a glass slipper, Cinderella? And perhaps a way to break our engagement. Perhaps. Quiet, everyone. Ben's getting ready to speak. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the masquerade. 
As master of the revels, I welcome you to the ball. You've been asked here, disguised in the roles for which you have all longed these many years. You're all strangers to one another, your identity known only to yourselves. Thus you will remain till midnight. But till that hour, the mystery of the unknown is yours. The excitement of living a dream is in your hands. I see a magician here, a peasant, a statesman, a clown such as myself, and... Oh, there. There's Cinderella, who at midnight will find that dreams must end. But until the clock strikes, give yourselves to music and wine and dancing. <laughs> Wiles of a sorcerer are many. Oh, show us another trick, magician. No, no, I must put my knives away now. One more trick, and your eyes will be quicker than my hand. <laughs> Steve, I've got to see you. Oh, want to know how I did that last trick? Come here, quickly. What's the matter, Ben? There's something upstairs I want you to see. Can't it wait? You had better come now. <laughs> Whatever it is, you're guarding it like a state secret. Ben, don't look so pale. It can't be as bad as all that. Were you up here earlier this evening? Yes, I think so. Were you in the library? Hmm. You must have been spying on me. I was there a little while ago. Where are we going? To the library. Here. Here we are. There. In front of the fireplace. No, it can't be. Unfortunately, it is. Joan Williams. Stabbed to death. I don't believe it. It's not an illusion, Steve. It's real. I found it like this a few minutes ago. But how did it happen? I thought you could tell me. What are you talking about? Look at that knife closely. Good heavens. Isn't that one of the knives that you were using in your demonstration tonight, Steve? Oh, you're talking nonsense, Ben. I didn't kill her. Who said you did? Well, you inferred it. Oh, what's the sense of this wrangling? Joan's dead. I didn't do it, but I want the man who did. There's a set of prints on the knife handle, Steve. If they match yours, well, that's the answer. You're pretty well convinced that I'm murderer, aren't you, Ben? We'll let the police decide that. I'm going to call them. Well, no, no, you can't, Ben. You've got to give me a chance first. No. What do you mean? I swear to you that I didn't do it, Ben. Now, you've got to let me find who did. Just a few hours, that's all I need. Just till midnight. All right, Steve. Till midnight, then. Hello, darling. Who's in the library with you? Oh, come in quickly. Ben told me that you were hiding away in here. <gasps> no! Steve, you killed her. No, I didn't do it. I'm wondering if you did. Don't be a fool, Steve. You can't get away with murder that easily. I had no motive, Marcia. Unfortunately, you did. Does anyone else know she's dead? Ben found the body. And he's called the police? No, he's given me till midnight to find the murderer. Oh, what a complete waste of time. Uh, not altogether, Marcia. Have you forgotten your prediction earlier this evening? That's of no importance. I'll admit I'm glad she's dead. But my wishing it didn't put that knife in her back. That remains to be seen, darling. Let's get it over and said with, Steve. I hope you're guilty. I hope they hang you. You've treated me like a fool. You've asked for everything you're going to get. I didn't know you could be so vicious, Marcia. I only hope that I'll be able to testify against you. Thank you, my sweet. I'm not interrupting, am I? No. No, I'm leaving. Good luck, Steve. Don't go too far away, Marcia. You might be very helpful to me. I'll be here when the police come. So long, Marcia. Well, we both lose, Roy. Yes. So Ben told me. He also said he thinks you did it. But I don't agree. Thanks. But how about some evidence? Haven't you any ideas at all? No, but that executioner's costume of yours worries me. I'm sorry, Steve, but this is my night off. My record's as clean as yours. How about Ben? I can't figure out a motive for him. Well, he's my business partner. He might be trying to pin this on me. Very weak, old pal. Did you have a motive? Well, I wanted her to marry me again, but she refused. Said she was waiting for you to make up your mind. The police could claim I killed Joan to get her out of the way. Oh, they'll dream up some motive. I'll tell you what I'll do, Steve. I'll come in with you. I don't think you did it, and I've as much a stake as you in finding the murderer. 
Thanks, Roy. But we've got to work fast. I want to talk to Marcia. She had a pretty good motive for killing Joan. Yes, jealousy is still fashionable, Roy. That's a good lead. You'd better quiz Ben. See what you can find. He's been pretty anxious to call the police. I wonder what he's hiding. Suppose you rattle a skeleton or two in his closet, Steve. Maybe we'll come up with a murderer. <laughs> so far, Steve? It's not very encouraging, Ben. Remember our agreement. Midnight's the deadline. You know, Ben, I've completely neglected to ask you some rather important questions. Hmm? No. What's on your mind, Steve? Well, for one thing, how come you happened to find Joan's body? I'll tell that to the police. Oh, I'm trying to clear myself of suspicion of murder, Ben. Make a very bad debating partner. Why not question Roy Benson? Now, listen, Ben, this is no idle business transaction. You've accused me of murder. It might be decent enough to explain why I should be so certain of your innocence. Suppose I call the police. Right now, Steve, let them settle the question of where the guilt belongs. You you promised to hold off till midnight. Very well, then, but you might do better trying to clear yourself than just standing here arguing. Goodbye. Where are you going? I have an appointment with an executioner. Want to come along? <laughs> Is Roy waiting in the library? Yes. That's strange. What's wrong? The door's locked. But the key is in the lock. Here, here, let me open it. Here we are. Ben, look, there by the table. Great Scott. It's Benson. We're too late. He's dead. It's horrible. And the bullet did a thorough job. Strange we didn't hear the shot. I used the silencer. It's still on the gun. No, don't touch it, Ben. Leave it for the police. I want to apologize, Steve. You're completely innocent. How do you know? Well, it's obvious now. Roy killed Joan probably because he was incensed at her refusal to marry him again. Then he committed suicide at the realization of what he'd done. Well, that's a logical explanation, Ben, and it clears me completely, but I can't accept it. Why not? Because Roy didn't commit suicide. Steve, look at the layout of the room yourself. The gun's in his right hand. He was shot in the right temple. And the body of his victims beside him. Very neat deduction, but you left out the one flaw. Hmm? What's that? The door to this room was locked from the outside. Obviously, death was instantaneous. If Roy had shot himself, he couldn't have locked the door from the other side. Yes, you're right. I unlocked that door myself. Yes, Roy Benson was murdered. And the killer must have been frightened away while he was locking the door. Then you're still implicated. But it's a rather gruesome joke on you. Somebody killed the executioner. A murderer has a sense of humor. Fine. Maybe my laugh's coming up. Destiny's Highway has led Stephen Raymond and his fiancée, Marsha Williams, to the home of Steve's partner, Ben Carter, where a masquerade ball is in progress. It is a house of gaiety. Music and laughter pervade the lower floor. Yes, downstairs there is revelry, but upstairs, death. In the library lie the bodies of Joan Williams and Roy Benson, her ex-husband. Steve Raymond, who has come to the masquerade dressed as a magician, is the chief suspect. For while Roy Benson was shot, the knife found in Joan Williams' body was used in Steve's magic act. Ben Carter, Steve's host, has promised to wait until midnight before calling the police in order that Steve might find sufficient evidence to exonerate himself and perhaps find the real murderer. Steve is alone with Ben Carter. They're talking. It's not very far from midnight, Steve. Well, until they unmask Ben, I have a chance to find the murderer. The same person killed them both. The knife that killed Joan was yours. But whose gun was it? Well, the police can trace the registry. That's impossible. The serial number was filed off. How do you know that? I examined the gun while we were upstairs. But I had told you not to, Ben. I wanted the police to find things untouched. I was only trying to help you, Steve. After all, you're the only one on whom the police can build a case. Remember, it was your knife that killed Joan. Well, whoever stole that knife from me killed Joan and Roy. Better use your magician's get-up of yours, Steve, and see if you can pull a murderer out of your top hat. Yes, I'm going back to the party and do just that. <laughs> Yes, madam. 
home, I'm a successful stockbroker. Same thing. How about another chick? Oh, I'm sorry, but I've concluded my last performance. For a long while, I'm afraid. Steve, I've got something to tell you. What is it? I can't tell you. Here, come into the next room. All right. Steve, I think I know who killed Joan and Roy. Good girl. Who? Ben Carter. Are you sure? Practically. I was in the library looking at Joan's body, and I heard somebody in the next room. I turned out the lights and hid behind the large chair next to the fireplace. Did he come into the library? Yes. It was pitch black without the lights, but he had a flashlight with him. He played the light all over the floor as if he were looking for something. Do you know what it was? No, Steve. I was afraid to look out from behind the chair for fear he'd see me. How long was he there? Oh, about five minutes. I don't think he found what he was searching for, though. When he left the room, he muttered something about coming back later. Did you come right down here after he left? Oh, no. Right after he left the room, I went to the phone and called the police. Now, why did you do that? Oh, I found the murderer. So it was my duty to notify them. How do you know Ben didn't hear you call? Oh, I waited until he was far enough down the hall. I even kept the lights out in case he happened to look back. How long ago did you phone? Just a few minutes ago. I came right down here to you after I called. Well, I'll have to work fast. Come along, Marcia. I want to look at that library. Oh, no light showing under the door. Let's go in. Nothing's been touched since I was here. Now, what could Ben have been searching for? Well, perhaps he dropped something when he killed Joan and Roy. Yes, possibly, but what? Steve, look. Hmm? There. Under that chair near the fireplace. Yes, I see it. What is it? A large black button. I recognize that. Didn't you notice that one of the buttons on Ben's clown suit was missing? Yes, you're right, Marsha. There. Doesn't that prove his guilt? Well, not necessarily. The thing that still interests me is his certainty that my fingerprints are on the handle of the knife that killed Joan. Well, how could it have been used without disturbing your prints? By wearing gloves and using the blade part of the knife for throwing. That's very clever of you, darling. If my prints are still on that knife handle, they were placed there when I used the weapon in my little act downstairs. When it was stolen from me, the prints were very carefully preserved. What are you going to do? I'm going to make a call, try to get some information on fingerprints. Let me have the inspector, please. Wait a minute. Someone's on the other extension. Who is it? Ben. He's decided not to wait till midnight as he promised me. He's a little worried. Listen. Inspector Bolden, this is Ben Carter, 116 Ocean Road. Yes, Mr. Carter. There have been two murders in my house. You'd better send someone out immediately. Two murders? Both at the same time? No, they happen separately. What's going on up there? Please hurry. The murderer is still in the house. I'll watch him till you get here. We'll lock the doors. I want no one to leave before I get there. He's crazy? He's giving himself up. I'm afraid he's not, Marcia. He's determined to prove me guilty. Oh, he hasn't a chance. Oh, hasn't he? What proof do we have? Well, I saw him in this room. When Joan and Roy were killed? Of course not. But why was he sneaking around in here looking for this lost button? Well, whatever the reason, I'm afraid my goose and I are cooked quite thoroughly. Oh, no, you're not. Hey, where are you going? Quiet. There's someone at the door. I oh. think you ought to know I called the police. They'll be here shortly. Yes, I know. We heard you on the phone, Ben. I wouldn't advise either of you to leave the house. Why don't you stop all this pretense, Ben? We know you killed Joan and Roy. <laughs> Marcia's still loyal to you, Steve. I was behind this chair earlier this evening when you came up here prowling around with a flashlight. Well, why didn't you help me find what I was searching for? Was it this? Yes. That's the button from my costume. Please give it to me. Oh, no, no, no. This goes to the police. Well, I... Oh, don't be absurd, Marsha. I, I lost it up here before the ball began. I'm sorry to contradict you, Ben, but it was on your clown suit when we first came tonight. Well, oh, I... Uh... Thanks for calling the police, Ben. All right, I admit I lost it up here after Joan and Roy were killed. I, I wanted the button back because I knew it would look suspicious if the police found it. Mm-hmm. It's midnight. I have to end the masquerade. Yes, and we mustn't delay the master of the revel. Uh, coming, Steve? Yes, might as well, Ben. We'll keep an eye on one another until the police decide which one of us is the murderer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
and of the masquerade. The time has come when you must leave the mystery of the unknown and return to the reality of the present. The peasant will become a wealthy man, the clown a respected philosopher, the beggar a statesman. This is the moment. Unmask, please. Then, the police are in the hall. Take care of them for a minute, Steve. I'll be right back. Oh, I'll give them all the clues they require. Well, what's the delay? Mr. Carter will be here in just a moment, Inspector. My name's Steve Raymond. I believe that Mr. Carter considers me the principal suspect. Did you do it? No. I hope you'll believe me. I believe no one, only evidence. Would you care to see the bodies? I want to see Mr. Carter first. Come on, Inspector. That came from the garden. Then that's where we're heading for. Let's go. <laughs> oh, it was horrible. All right, now. Calm yourself. We've no time for hysteria. Under this arbor when I suddenly heard someone moving in back of me. I turned around quickly and saw Ben come toward me. That gun was in his hand. What did he say to you? Oh, his face had sort of a crazy look on it. He told me that I was the only one who could possibly testify against him. He came closest to me and brought the gun down as if to strike me. Did he hit you? No. No, I dodged the blow and, and I grappled with him for the gun. Finally, I managed to get possession of it. And I shot him. It was the only thing I could do. <laughs> Let me see that gun, Mr. Raymond. You say you are, Inspector? Will you hold the flashlight, Mr. Raymond? Surely. Now, just a little fingerprint powder over the butt of the revolver. There we are. Now, do you see the impression? Yes, there are two distinct sets of prints on the butt. Just as I told you, Ben and I fought for the gun. Is your conclusion the same as mine, Mr. Raymond? I'm afraid it is, Inspector. Marsha lied in her story. That's ridiculous, Steve. Don't you see the two sets of prints? That's just it, Marsha. If you and Ben had fought for possession of the gun, the two sets of prints would have been smudged and blurred. Not distinct and clear as they are now. It was very convenient of you to tell that story. Why'd you try to kill this man? Try? He's dead, isn't he? Not quite. Fortunately for him, one bullet missed and the other just creased his scalp. He'll be around shortly and in fine shape to testify against you. And this was your second mistake, Marsha. I first became suspicious of your sudden reformation in my behalf when you told me you dialed the police telephone number in the darkened library. I was convinced you hadn't phoned when we listened in on Ben's call to police headquarters. It was obvious from the inspector's reaction that it was the first report of the murders he had had. Watch out, young lady. Don't make me chase you through the garden. I'm not that young anymore. Let go of me. Let go of me. Of course I killed him. Joan was a worthless fool trying to take you away from me. I stole your knife and used it the way you guessed I did. Your prints were on the handle, but Ben didn't know for certain whether they were yours. Why did you kill Roy? He accused me of killing Joan, and he told me that he had the proof to back up his charge. And I couldn't take a chance. If I hadn't locked the door, you would never have guessed that it wasn't suicide. One mistake is all that's needed, young lady. Well, Mr. Raymond, I guess that's about all. Yes, Inspector. I'm afraid the masquerade is over. <laughs> shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. <laughs>
stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour. Ptolemy's Grave Over the tomb which held the mummy of Ptolemy the Third, these words were written. Death to him who disturbs the everlasting resting place of these sacred remains. Two weeks ago, William Cartwright, a famous Egyptologist, defied this curse. He bought the mummy, had it sent to his home. That same day, he slowly walked down the stairs from his upstairs study. His wife, Martha, heard his familiar footsteps in the hall over the stairs, but she did not know that her husband was then walking into a nothingness, that he would completely disappear, leaving no trace of his whereabouts. Now, it is two o'clock the following morning. The Cartwright house is still. A taut feeling of mystery hovers in the air. Martha Cartwright is dreaming of her missing husband. And in her dream, as in her waking hours, she is haunted by the fear of Ptolemy's curse. William? William? Martha, I hear you. Do you hear me? William, where are you? Downstairs. I'm downstairs, Martha. Downstairs? Here in our house? In our study. Come to the study, Martha. I'll come. I'll come, William. Here in the study, Martha. Come to the study. Yes, William. The study. I'm here, William. Here at the study door. Look for me. Where are you, William? Look for me, Martha. Darkness. Can't see you. Come over the carpet to the mummy case. To the mummy case. The mummy of Ptolemy III. Yes. Yes, William, I'm here. Look at the mummy closely, Martha. I am looking, William. Don't you see? All I see is a strange, misty light. Like a halo. Shining, glowing about the mummy. Lean forward then, Martha. Look closely. Uh, Look closely. No, I can't. I can't. You must, Martha. Look at the mummy's face. The face? Can't you see, Martha? Can't you see what it is? No. No, it's just... I don't know what you mean. The features, Martha. Don't you see anything different about the features? Gray, shrunken, shriveled skin. Gray and horrible. But the lips, the forehead, the eyes. Don't you see, Martha? Have you forgotten so soon? Forgotten? I remember you, William. I'll always remember you. But if the eyes were open, if they were open, Martha, could you? Look, now they are open, Martha. Yeah. I see. Now I see. William, the mummy has your face. Yes, Martha, that's it. The mummy and I, we're the same, Martha. The same. The same? Dr. John Crandall. This is he. Oh. Who's this, Martha? Yes, John. Look, I had to call you. I'm so afraid. I thought the operator could never get my call through. Yes, I know. The long-distance lines are pretty well tied up. What's the matter, Martha? What time is it? It's very late, but I couldn't wait till morning. 
John, something's happened. Have they found William? Yes. I, I mean, no, I, I don't know. Look, John, I need you badly. I think I'm going out of my mind. Oh, nonsense. What happened? I've got to see you, John, please, tonight. I'm asking you this not only as a patient, but as a friend. But I can't come into town tonight, Martha. Oh, you're all right. It's just your imagination. Oh, no, I thought it was a dream. Well, I've got a job here that's got to be finished, but I can leave the hospital early in the morning. Come as soon as you can, please. I promise, Martha. Now, take hold of yourself. Control is the word. Remember. I'll try, John. I'll try. <laughs> is Martha Cartwright, Mr. Crow. I'm sorry to wake you up if I did. Oh, no, no, no. That is all right. I've got to see you first thing in the morning. It's important. It's urgent. Why, of course, Mrs. Cartwright. Will you come here to my house at nine o'clock? At nine. I will be there. But what is the trouble? It's about that mummy you sold my husband. Oh, I, I see. Don't fail me, Mr. Crow. Oh, no, no. I will be there without fail. <laughs> Mrs. Cartwright? You're Mr. Kroll. Yes. Come in, please. Thank you. You're the gentleman who sold my husband the mummy, aren't you? Yes. Well, I want you to take it away. Take it away? Yes, immediately. You're here right away. But, Mrs. Cartwright... I'm sorry. Uh... I'm terribly upset. No, I understand. How soon can you take it away? Perhaps tomorrow morning. Oh. But what do you want me to do with it? I don't know. I don't care. Sell it or give it away. Do anything you want with it. Well, that would be very difficult. You see, one reason your husband was able to buy it was, well, <laughs> perhaps we'd better not discuss it right now. You mean it's cursed? Yes. Misfortune has always been attached to it. Do you believe in this curse? I have specialized in the art and civilization of the pharaohs for 20 years. My experience has taught me to respect their ideas. Yes, Mrs. Cartwright, I believe in the curse. Can you tell me what the curse says? Death. To him who disturbs these sacred remains. A death of torture, of maddening pain. Death in its strangest form. And now, now that my husband is dead, I may be the next victim? Hmm. You must take it back. Please, Mr. Kroll, I can't have it here another night. I haven't slept for days. I can't keep my eyes open, but I'm afraid to sleep. Why don't you leave this house until tomorrow? I can't. I'm expecting my doctor's. Then perhaps you will be able to take a nap before he arrives. Perhaps. Well, thank you, Mr. Kroll. You'll take it tomorrow, then. Yes. Uh, goodbye, Mrs. Cartwright. Oh, William. Death in its strangest Form. Not you, William. A death of torture, of maddening pain. They couldn't, William, they couldn't. Martha, do you hear me? William. Yes, Martha. Where are you? I'm in the study, Martha. You remember where you saw me last night? No. Oh, it was a dream last night. You were in the mummy case, then it couldn't be. Yes, I'm still there, Martha. Come and you'll see. No, William, I couldn't go there again. No. I haven't disappeared. I'm here in the house. You want to be with me? I'm here in the study, Martha. I can't come to you. I'm afraid. Afraid of me, your husband? Yes, William, I know. I'll come to you. Down here, Martha, in the study. I'm coming to you, William. I'll do anything you say. But don't make me look at the face. You must, Martha. No, William, I'll do anything. Not that, please. No, not that. No. Martha. Please don't make me. Well, please, I can't do it. Martha, uh, wake up. It's John. No. John Crandall. I'm going to die. I know I'm going to die. I don't want to look at that face again. Please don't make me. William, please, please. Oh, Martha. John Crandall. You were walking in your sleep, Martha. I'm, I'm sorry I slapped you, but I had to wake you. Oh, you're here, John. Thank 
heavens, you're here. Is there anything left that you haven't told me, Martha? That's all I know, John. I'm not going crazy, am I? No, Martha. As a psychiatrist, I can tell you that you're not going crazy. This is all the result of the shock of Will's disappearance. But that doesn't explain the curse, John. What oh, about... Oh, nonsense. Civilized people don't believe in curses. Those statements were inscribed on tombs to frighten away grave robbers. It's so hard for me to believe that now. Martha, I want you to make an experiment with me. What? Let's go into the study together and look at the mummy. Oh, no, 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 but I you've can't. you've got to. It's the only way you can overcome your fear. Now, just let me prove that it's only your imagination and nothing oh, more. Please, if no. If you want me to help you, Martha, you have to help me, too. Come. All right. That's it. Here's the study. Where's the light switch? John, wait. Don't turn on the light. But, Martha, it's I... It's there, John. You see it? You see that misty light? It's just the moon coming through the blinds. No, no, it's the mummy. Look at it. The mummy. You see it? That gray light that shines around it. I'm not sleeping, John. I'm here with you. And look at that face. Look closely, John. I am. You see that face? William's face? As though it were dead for centuries? Is this a nightmare, too? No, no, it's not a nightmare. I see it. And that mummy is William's body. It's the curse of Ptolemy the Third. But you laughed at John. You laughed. Martha. Now William's gone. He's dead. Martha, please. And I'll be cursed after John was. You don't believe that. I do, I do. Why didn't he believe it when they told him? Now it's too late, don't you see? Now I'll die if William died. Because now the money belongs to me. <laughs> Cartwright, a famous Egyptologist, purchased a mummy called Ptolemy III, despite the fact that it was known to be cursed. The same day, he vanished. Now his wife has been suffering from the delusion that the mummy has acquired Cartwright's features. In fact, is Cartwright. Dr. Crandall, a psychoanalyst and a friend of the Cartwrights, has tried to disprove this only to find that he, too, notices a strange resemblance. Now, we find Dr. Crandall attending Mrs. Cartwright in a hospital. It's daylight, isn't it? Yes. How do you feel? Better. What happened to me? Well, you were suffering from lack of sleep, Martha, and your nerves were so unstrung that I thought it best to bring you here for a while. Do you believe in the curse now, John? After what you saw? No. But you saw the same thing I did? Yes. How do you explain it? I'm not sure that I can explain it yet, Martha. But after I brought you here, I went back to the house again to look at the mummy. And? It was gone. Go? Oh, I suppose Mr. Kroll called for it. Who is Mr. Kroll? He's the man through whom William bought the mummy. I asked him to take it away. I see. Well, I'm going to leave you now, Martha. There are several things I want to take care of. But I'll be back this evening, and I want you to come with me to Mr. Kroll's place. Why? I want to see that mummy again. Oh, but, John, why must I do that? Are you still afraid of the curse? Yes. Well, I still intend to prove to you that there is no such thing. I'm going to buy that mummy. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Kroll. Oh, Mrs. Cartwright. And... Uh, this is Dr. John Crandall. No, oh, good evening. How do you do, sir? Mrs. Cartwright brought me here so that I could see the mummy of Ptolemy III. Of course. Of co May I ask why you wish to see it? I'm interested in buying it. I've tried to convince him that it's cursed, Mr. Kroll, but he doesn't want to believe it. Mm -hmm. Many men have refused to believe it. It is only fair that we inform those we intend to buy. And the rest is entirely up to them. Now, if you step this way, please. The mummy is in my workshop. Thank you. Hmm. I notice you have many other mummies here, don't you, Mr. Crow? Oh, yes. I am known as an expert in repairing them. They are sent from museums and collectors all over the world. Mm. And which is Ptolemy the third? In this sarcophagus right here. 
Will you open it? Why, of course, certainly. Now, just a moment, Martha. Don't go away. I want you to look at it. John! It's very important. There. Uh, there you are, sir. There it is. Martha, is that the mummy we looked at last night? You see, I'm not sure. I saw it for only a few minutes. It looks the same, but... But what? The faces... I mean, the features are not so familiar. How do you mean? This one doesn't look like William. Perhaps the light is too sharp here. Uh, do you think you could turn the lights off for a second, Mr. Kroll? No, 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 Mr. Kroll. No, I'm afraid. Martha, you know I'm not trying to hurt you any more than you've already been hurt by this whole affair. But I must get you to believe that there is no such thing as a curse of this kind. Uh, uh, if you don't do as I say, your condition may grow even worse, beyond my control. Is that clear? Yes. Now, Mr. Kroll, will you turn off the light? Of course. Are you looking at the mummy in that sarcophagus, Martha? Yes. Do you see anything now? No. It's so pitch black, I can't see anything at all. Nothing. I see. John, you know I haven't been imagining all this. You... <gasps> what is it, Martha? Over there. Look near that other wall. Face. That's Williams, just as we saw it last night, John. With that glow all around it. And, it, and it's moving. Look, it's moving. John, make him turn on the light. John, Mr. Crow, please. will you turn on the light? Please, hurry. Why, certainly. Oh, John. Oh, John. All right, Martha, all right. We'll get you out of here. Will you open the door, Mr. Crow? Why, of course, Doctor. And uh, could I ask you to get Mrs. Cartwright a glass of water? A pleasure, I'm sure. Martha, Martha, listen to me carefully. Mm. I've got to explain quickly. As soon as you leave here, go straight to the nearest telephone and call the police. Tell them to come here immediately. I don't understand. I know now that William was murdered. What? Yes, Kroll killed him, and I'm going to stay here with him until the police arrive. I beg your pardon, I, I have the water. Thank you, thank you. Now, drink this, Martha, and take the pill I just gave you. Yes. That's it. Now, I think you'd better go home and... Uh, don't forget what I told you. Yes, John, I'll go home. Goodbye, Mr. Crow. Goodbye, madam. Oh, it's terrible, sir. She's completely obsessed with the fear of that mummy, and it's destroying her. She loved her husband very much, I'm sure. Of course, of course. But more than anything else, it's her insane fear of that curse. And is that the reason you want to purchase the mummy, Dr. Crandall? Precisely. In that case, maybe I can help you. You can? Uh, yes, let us talk about it. Uh, but first, would you like to have a drink? I notice you're rather fatigued after what just has happened. Yes, I guess I could stand something. Uh, will you join me? <laughs> Why should I leave myself out? <laughs> Why, of course, I, I have some very fine old spirits here. <laughs> and now, <laughs> there we are. Uh, I hope... What was that? What? Is there somebody else in your workroom? I... I thought I heard a noise from there. Well, there is nobody there that I know of. No, no. It must be your imagination, Doctor. Oh. Perhaps you yourself can take one of those pills you just administered to Mrs. Cartwright. <laughs> yes, she, she has been a very trying patient, I'll admit. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> to her early recovery. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> hey, dear, there is nothing quite like it, is there, eh, Doctor? Yes, it's, it's very fine, I must say. Now, I don't like to hurry you, Mr. Cole, but I'm very much interested in your idea to help Mrs. Cartwright. Well, let us start at the beginning. When you first came into the shop with Mrs. Cartwright and she looked at the mummy, she did not see anything about it that frightened her. Is that right? Right. But when you suggested that we turn off the lights, it was then, for the first time, that she was aware of her, well, shall we say, her hallucination. And uh, what do you suggest? I suggest that she have the mummy return to her house and then have her practice looking at it while the lights are on. And in this way, she might forget the hallucinations of seeing her husband's face. But suppose she is not suffering from hallucinations, oh, Mr. Crow. Well, you yourself saw what a change came over her when the lights were turned off. But she was not frightened by the mummy you originally showed her. No? No, Mr. Crow. Mrs. Cartwright saw the mummy you didn't want her to see. The mummy that you took from her house. The mummy that happens to be no mummy at all, but is, in fact, the body of her husband. 
You know that? That was why you hung a curtain in front of that mummy before we arrived. And how did you know it was behind the curtain in my workroom? Mm. Because of the glow of light around it. I could see that glow when the lights were turned off, so I took the curtain away completely. <laughs> that was what made Mrs. Cartwright think it was moving. Oh, I see. You are a very astute doctor. Could you tell me, perhaps, what you think made the misty glow? That's simple. It was the natural body gases and fluids which you forgot to extract before you applied your preservative to Dr. Cartwright's corpse when you mummy. You are quite right. That was the only mistake I made. There are certain things that you can't hide, Kroll, such as your bleached hair and beard. Your real name is Cavarella, isn't it? Oh, so you are not only a doctor, you are a detective as well. Well, you see, I knew that William Cartwright was one of the foremost Egyptologists in this country. And as such, he was often called upon to testify as an expert witness in many fraudulent cases connected with the culture. Ah, uh, so? Yes. So I went through those cases with the district attorney on the assumption that one of those defendants was connected in some way with Cartwright's disappearance. And the district attorney told you about me. I found out that you'd been convicted in one of those and sent to prison for 12 years on the basis of Cartwright's testimony. Oh, well, we all make mistakes, Dr. Crandall. Even you. What do you mean? That drink you just had. It was poisoned. And in a few more minutes, perhaps, you will be dead. But I promise you one thing... I will not make the same mistake on your corpse that I did on Cartwright. So, you... You... Oh, my throat! <laughs> you are beginning to feel the effect of the poison. You can't get away with this. I, I'll come back after I'm dead. I am not the superstitious one, Doctor. I, I can't breathe. My, my throat! <laughs> dead. And now, before Mrs. Cartwright can return with the police, as you have instructed her, I... Mrs. Cartwright. Yes, I want to talk to Dr. Crandall. You say... I... You killed him. Yes. And I am very glad you have returned. What are you going to do? Well, you see, I was just about to change Dr. Crandall's features completely so that I would not have a repetition of the same trouble. Although I did not want to kill him, I guess I was a little hasty. It was you I should have killed, my dear Mrs. Cartwright. Catherine? So you were out to call the police, eh? But they will never find out. Not with my way. You'll find out. You can't do this. You can't get away with to it. To the police, it will be just another disappearance. A disappearance caused by the curse of Ptolemy. People like to believe those things, Mrs. Cartwright. No. No. You can't do it, Cole. For you, Dr. You didn't believe me, Cole. I told you I'd come back. John! It's not true. It can't be. I... You feel the pain, Cole. The pain in your throat. I feel it much more. Yes, I do. What is it? In your chest, and now it's around your heart. No, no. Yes, it is. Come into my heart. I can't breathe. Oh, you're choking me. Choking me. Dead? John, you're alive. I don't understand. I know how trying this is for you, Martha, but listen to me. I'll explain but it. But I just... Saw... I wasn't dead. Kroll offered me a poison drink, but I distracted his attention by pretending to hear something outside. Oh. When he went to look, I switched the drinks, and he was the one who got the poison. When I saw you there, I thought the mummy's curse had worked again. No, Martha. That curse we talked about so much was only Kroll's own invention, and it came back to him. If he'd never thought it up, he would never have died as a result of it. <laughs> From shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory. In the haunting hour. No, 
stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. A corpse there was. Will you listen to me? I- I've got to tell it to someone, and, well, I guess you've heard a lot of strange stories. I'm Catherine Holland. It all started about a year after I'd come to work for Martin Reed and Stephen Corey as the housekeeper. Oh, we'd have such fun, the three of us. Martin was forever making me promise that I'd be with them always. Always. I didn't know how long that could be. (laughs) You're you're only joking, huh, Kathy? You wouldn't leave us. You'll stay with us always, won't you? Not if you keep doing that, Martin. Oh, oh, you'll get used to it, Kathy. Oh, but cutting your own name on a tombstone, it's, it's positively morbid. I don't see that. If a cobbler can make his own shoes, then surely a stone cutter can make his own monument. Well, that's true. But... After all, a man must do something with his spare time. And you, Stephen, of all people, have no right to scoff at me. Imagine a cemetery caretaker who wanders through the graveyard day and night talking to the dead. If the people I met outside the cemetery, my dear Martin, were as interesting as the people I meet inside, perhaps I wouldn't. Since there are only neighbors along this godforsaken road, and since I must get away from you occasionally... Now, look here. Enough is enough. (laughs) Are we going to let her boss us around, Martin? You nearly 60 and me twice her age? That's right. And you're 42, aren't you, Steve? Yep. You know, I think for your next birthday, I'll start on a nice marble headstone for you. Okay, I quit. I resign. Oh, no, no, don't say that, Kathy. We need you, Stephen and I. Always before, our housekeepers were stout and rheumatic. You're so young. It was like all at once having the shades pulled up and the windows opened when you came. You won't leave us, will you, Kathy? No, I won't leave you, Martin. You promise? I do. If you promise to take your medicine. No. No, I told you, Kathy. I don't believe in that quack doctor. There's nothing wrong with my heart. Oh, Martin, don't be stubborn. It's not a matter of being stubborn. I know I'm perfectly all right. How about those attacks you've had? They were indigestion. You don't want to take that medicine because you and the doc have been enemies for years. You won't give them the satisfaction of treating you, even if it means... Please, Kathy. Don't you think I'm old enough to know my own mind? But Kathy's right, Martin. You should take your medicine. Oh, now you start. I'm going for a walk. I'll go with you. I don't want company. Now he's mad. Oh, don't take it to heart. He'll get over it. I wish he hadn't gone out in this weather. Yeah. I think it's getting worse. I'll go call him back. Stephen, what's that noise? I don't know. It was just outside the house. Our cedar tree. That last flash of lightning struck it. There seems to be. Kathy! What? Move away from the door so I can see Juice. No, Kathy, please. Stay in here a minute. I'll go out. Oh, I'll go with you. I. I think I. I think I see something beside the cedar. Come on, Kathy. Stephen, it can't be. Yes, Kathy. It's Martin. He's dead. The tree? It didn't touch him. He died from the shock of it falling so close. It was hot for Strange, isn't it? The last tombstone he ever carved was his own. We buried Martin the next evening. There weren't many mourners. We lived too far from town to be well acquainted. At last, the few who'd come went away and left Stephen and me alone at the grave. They've all gone. Your eyes are all red, Kathy. Do you suppose he likes where we buried him? Right across the road from the house? I'm sure he does. 
He can sort of watch us from here if he gets lonely. It won't be us much longer, Stephen. What do you mean? Well, I... I can't stay here with just you. It isn't proper. Kathy, you know I wouldn't... Oh, I know, but what'll people think? I don't care about people. They're not important. Well, they are to me. I have a good reputation, Stephen, and I don't... Kathy, don't leave me. Oh, but I must. Losing Martin was unbearable, but if I lost you, I'd have nothing left. I'm sorry, Stephen. There'd be no one to care if I live or die. If you go, I'll be all alone. You'll find another housekeeper. Housekeeper? Oh, Kathy, dearest, don't be such a little fool. I'm not a fool. You are if you can't see how much I love you. You love me? Oh, no. How could I help it? You're sweet and fresh and lovely. And I never knew before what joy it was to... to watch a woman. Anything you do, the way you walk and laugh, even the way you get angry. It's beautiful. Oh, keep away from me. I don't know what's come over you. I was content just having you about the house, being near you, but now... Oh, my darling, you mustn't go away. Oh, please don't look at me like that. Please, Stephen. Dearest, let's get married. I'll make you happy. No, I, I don't love you. Don't touch me. Oh, I, I like you a lot. I'm very fond of you, but... Well, it's, it's not love. I could never love you. Why, Kathy? I'll make you a good husband. Oh, no, Stephen, no. You, you're twice my age. But I'd worship you, Kathy, dearest. Oh, would you quit bawling Kathy, dearest, at me like a lost lamb? <laughs> I'm going to the house and pack my things. I won't let you go. You belong to me. I don't belong to anyone. If you don't get out of my way, I'll throw this rock at you. There's someone else. You love someone else. No, no, Stephen. I just don't love you. Don't come near me. I'll throw it. I swear. Kathy, no! I told you I would, didn't I? Why couldn't you believe me? Well, get up. Stephen... He was lying on his back, motionless. I bent over him and... His face, the rock had caught him between the eyes. I I couldn't think. I I, I was terrified. I only knew that Stephen was dead, that I had killed him. A murderess, that's what everybody would say. They'd put me on trial, all those faces, gaping at me like I wasn't human, and then they'd... No... Had to get out of here. The road passed the graveyard. If I followed it, I'd reach the main highway. I'd run. I'd run so fast, no one would catch me. It was dark. The body wouldn't be found till morning. By then, I'd be far away. Had to keep moving. Had to. Where could I go? Where could I hide? Flying down the road for hours and hours. Till my legs were numb and my heart tearing and my chest deafening me with its thunder. No, that wasn't my heart. It was a car. They were looking for me. Somehow they'd found Stephen already. Oh, it was getting nearer and nearer. I slipped behind a tree. <laughs> Not police. Not police at all. I... Picnickers. Oh, the only ones who might have seen me. They'll forget they even passed this way once they're safe at home. <laughs> safe at home. Suddenly, I realized what a fool I'd been. I couldn't escape a police dragnet by running away. They'd never stop looking for me. The best place to hide was at home. Why, of course. I'd gone back to the house from the funeral and straight to bed. Stephen had decided to stay at the grave a while longer. Everyone in town knew he liked to wander through the cemetery. And especially tonight, with Martin just buried. He... he must have caught a prowler, and the man had thrown a rock at him. That's how it happened. I felt perfectly calm. I turned around and started back. The sky had been cloudy all evening, but as I walked up the road toward home, it cleared. I remember how lovely the moonlight looked, spilling down the steps of the house. I started to climb them. Suddenly, I I had an impelling desire to see Stephen's body. I tried to fight it, but the thought of him, cold and crumpled... Lying like some cast-off doll in an attic hypnotized me. 
I went down the stairs and started across the road. He'd been lying at the foot of Martin's grave, I remembered. From where I was, I couldn't make out the body. Well, that wasn't right. The old man was buried directly across from the house. I should be able to see Stephen. I slipped through the gate. Hurried to where the corpse had lain. It was gone. There wasn't a trace of it. I dropped to my hands and knees, searching about the new mound of earth for some proof that it hadn't all been a nightmare, that I'd really killed Stephen. There wasn't anything. No matted grass where the blood should have dried. Nothing fallen from his pockets. Not even the stone with which I'd struck him. And it was so quiet. So deathly quiet. With the moon whitewashing Martin's headstone. And the one next to it. The one next to it. But there hadn't been any grave there before. And this one was fresh. As fresh as Martin's. I slowly raised my eyes and looked at the tombstone. Stephen Corey, born May 9th, 1901. Died April 20th, 1944. Why, I'd... I'd know that carving anywhere. Martin was dead. But Martin had made that gravestone... stands in the moonlight, staring at the grave plaque of Stephen Corey, a plaque identical with the one Martin had made for himself before he died. And yet, how could Martin have carved that headstone? He had not made one for Stephen before he died. I knew that. Still, Stephen had been buried, and the date on the monument was right. I felt the answer, but I pushed it back away from my mind. It couldn't be true that Martin had kept his promise even now and had carved the stone. And that these dead who were Stephen's friends had buried him. Had he loved me so, he wouldn't make me pay for what I'd done. Did he plead with them to cover him so I'd not be found out? I didn't know. I was paralyzed with fright. I had to get out of here back to the house before I lost my sanity. <laughs> I don't know how long I lay there, cowering in my bed. At last, the darkness of the night closed in about me, and I slept. But then, out of the darkness, the doorbell rang. Sharp sound, a streak of fear over my flesh. The police had come. Stephen's grave had been discovered. I had to go to the door. Are you Catherine Holland? I'm Estelle Bailey, Martin's sister. Oh, yes, I should have known. Uh, come in, Mrs. Bailey. Stephen sent me a telegram this afternoon about Martin's death, and I took the first train out here. I'm sorry if I woke you. Oh, that's quite all right. Come in. I know it's been a long trip. Perhaps I can fix you a bite to eat? No, thank you. I'd like you to take me to see the grave right away. Martin's grave? Now? Oh, Miss Holland, I hadn't seen Martin for nine years. I'm ashamed of that, and I want to rectify it now as soon as I can. If you won't take me, perhaps Mr. Corey will. Oh, he's not here. He's in town. Well, I'll wait up till he comes in. Oh, you'll wait a long time. I don't understand. Oh, uh, Stephen was quite shocked by your brother's death, you know, and, well, he felt he had to get away from this house, so, well, he mightn't be back tonight. But if he went into town, why didn't he meet me at the station as he wrote he would? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Every moment she sat there, she'd think more and more about Stephen's absence. I had to distract her the only way I could. I had to take the chance that she wouldn't notice that other headstone. But if she did notice it, I would have to kill her too. But just then, something happened to spare us both. 
Oh, good heavens. Oh, look, it's raining again. Yes, the moon's gone in. It's pitch black outside. Uh, then there's no use going into the cemetery, I suppose. I'm afraid not, Mrs. Bailey. What a shame. Finally, she went upstairs. I waited until I knew she slept. Then I took a spade and crept across to the cemetery. It was wet and cold, but I didn't notice the weather. <laughs> For I had a scheme. <laughs> a very clever scheme. I was going to dig up someone else's headstone as well as Stephen's and switch the two. I couldn't disguise his new-made grave, but at least I'd conceal who was buried there. It was just before dawn when I slipped back to the house. Mrs. Bailey woke me about eight, and together we went into the cemetery. I came up level with the graves, and... Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. Why, I'd switched them last night. Stephen Corey, born May 9th, 1901. Died April 20th, 1944. His headstone. Exactly where it had been before. But I had dug it up. There were blisters on my hands to prove it. Mrs. Bailey, had she noticed? No. She'd gone right to her brother's grave and stood staring at it, wiping away the tears. I'm very glad of one thing, Miss Holland, that Martin is buried a little apart from everyone else. He liked to be alone most of the time, you know. Even in death, he would prefer solitude and being isolated from all the others. Solitude? Isolated from all the others? But Stephen was lying right by his side. She couldn't see Stephen's headstone. It was incredible, but it was true. Come, Miss Holland, it's raining. We might as well go now. I'll take the early train back to the city. After she'd gone... The house was empty, yet full of a screaming silence. And I sat looking out at the grayness of the lonesome day. Had there really been a grave at all? Growing inside me was a grim fascination to see. The mud sucked at my shoes. Through the dusk, I walked determinedly toward that spot where the headstone stood. I slipped through the fence. Then I was standing beside the tree, leaning against it. For I couldn't believe what I saw. There, beside the others, stood a third headstone. And stretching almost at my feet, a freshly dug grave. Even before I crept forward to see, I knew what the plaque would say. Catherine Holland, born June 7th, 1923... Dead April 21st, 1945. Tonight. April 21st. That was tonight. And I was still alive. Martin, listen to me wherever you are. I said I'd be with you always. But you can't force me to follow you. You can't force me to follow you. Tears filled my eyes. I took hold of a hateful stone and tried to flatten it into the ground. Tried to... Then through the tears I... I saw the dark bruises on my hands. Bruises on my hands, but well, it wasn't possible that... I touched one of the dark splotches. It rubbed away. Then the truth went through my mind. I fell to my knees. The letters. The letters I thought were carved into the stone. They too were blurred. I drew my finger along my name. It was lettered in black crayon. Thick archaic lettering darker toward the middle than at the edges, giving the illusion of depth, giving the illusion of being cut into the stone. Then that's how Stephen's headstone was made. That's how I stood up. Fear fell over me like a cold, wet sheet. Behind this adventure was a human being, a being like myself. Then I saw the thing in the grass, sending a tiny sparkle toward the dust-filled sky, and greedily I picked it up. A copper-colored metal cap from an eyebrow pencil. So that was how the letters had been drawn. That was how this thing had happened. 
Then I knew who had done it. And even before I turned to look, I knew she was standing there, staring at me, unmoving, a thin smile on her lips, her eyebrows thin too, penciled on with surety and deftness. Turn around, Miss Holland. I see you have guessed the truth. It was you. You killed him. But do you think my conscience will hurt me as yours does? Would it make your death any easier to know you didn't kill Stephen Corey? I don't understand you. I'm telling you the truth. I came into the cemetery just as the last visitor left, and I saw you throw the rocket, Corey. I saw you run for the road. You hadn't killed him, Miss Holland. He was only unconscious. But I made sure he was dead before I buried him. Then you dug the grave here. That spade in your hand. Will serve a double purpose. I shall kill you with it. Just as you murdered Corey. Why? Why did you kill him? Because Martin had willed all the family property to Corey. With the provision that when he died, it would return to me. I knew if his body weren't discovered, they'd think you and he had run away together. Then I'd have to wait for him to be declared legally dead. And so you put up the plaque. I felt sure I could persuade the county coroner to file a death certificate quietly. Then I'd show my lawyer the grave, show him that Corey, too, was dead. But you came back, so I have to kill you, too. Now you know the truth. Your time has come. That spade, Mrs. Bailey. Is for you, Miss Holland. Stay back from me. Stay back. I'm going to kill you. I'm not afraid, Mrs. Bailey. You're real. I can fight you. This will be your grave, and I shall bury you in it. Give me that spade. Give it to me. Go here. I said that spade. Mrs. Bailey. Ah. My eyes were clouded with flashes of blackness. I lay on the ground, feeling the cold, wet earth against my cheek. Without warning, it had happened. One wall of the grave gave way, and she lost her balance and fell forward into the gaping hole. Dirt from the mound began rolling down, clods of it covering the edges of her long skirt. And she lay still, silenced. At the bottom of the grave, a few wet clods of earth were still slowly tumbling down, as if they had an intelligence of their own, an intelligence that told them to bury the dead, bury the dead. For she was dead, and she had died instantly, her neck twisted beneath her loosened, flowing hair that hid the hideous sight of her eyebrows, thin and long. Her neck was broken. And she lay in the grave she had meant for me. Perhaps, now I've told it, I can forget the horror of what's happened. But not soon. Not soon. One way Martin was right. In my brain, he and Stephen will be with me. Always. From shadows and stillness. Mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour.
stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. Remember Hugo Carteret? Well, of course you do. The brilliant criminologist and charming gentleman who had such a wonderful flair for solving crimes which carried a hint of the macabre and savored of the supernatural. He died back in the 20s. And they say that everybody from the 400 of Park Avenue to the 400,000 of the Bowery and Hell's Kitchen came to his funeral. Anyway, Hugo Carteret left his memoirs. And the very first chapter deals with an infamous crime which in June of the year 1922 threw all of New York City into an uproar of horror. Such was the case of the Lonesome Corpse. Greystone Park used to be the private estate of old Caleb Greystone, eccentric recluse and incidentally millionaire many times over. When Caleb died, he willed the estate to the city of New York. The city fathers, properly grateful, promptly converted the estate into a park. It was public in that it was open to the public. But it had a private look, because a 15-foot wall of polished stone completely surrounded it. One day, back in June of 22, a big car drove up to the only entrance. In the back seat of the limousine was William Marsden, wealthy lawyer and executor of the Greystone estate, and he had come to inspect the ground. You wait here in the car, Edward. Yes, Mr. Marsden. Will you be long, sir? I don't think that's any of your business. I pay you to chauffeur me around, not to ask me questions. Yes, sir. I was only bringing up the fact that it's getting dark, and you said you had to be at the plaza by nine. I'm perfectly able to take care of my own business, Edward. I'll mind mine, and you mind yours. Now, you wait here in the car till I'm through in the park. Understand? Yes, Mr. Marsden. Suppose that big shot lawyer, Marston, disappeared. Think his chauffeur had something to do with it? I don't know, Tom. I don't get it. He tells his chauffeur to wait, walks into this here park, and never comes out. Chauffeur hears a scream inside the park, and that's all. Uh, you scared too easy, Tom. Ah, uh, nine that nice. Just broke my shovel. Well, I have to go over to the tool house and get another one. But, Joe... The tool house is way over the other end of the park. So what? It's getting dark. And it ain't healthy to be in this place after dark. Let's knock off, Joe. We can finish digging these flower beds tomorrow. If we knock off, we'll both be looking for a new gardener job tomorrow. Andrew, the superintendent, told us to finish up tonight. And that's what we got to do. Look, Joe, I, don't leave me. I got an idea there's something running around this park we don't know nothing about. When I think of that lawyer, Marston, I... <laughs> so, you see seen ghosts now, huh, Tom? <laughs> well, there ain't no ghost or nothing else that can scare Joe Donetti. You wait for me here. <laughs> and if you see a boogeyman, well, just offer him a drink and uh, ask him to stick around, all right? <laughs> Headquarters, Sergeant Hogan speaking. What? You saw a light floating around in Greystone Park? What kind of a light? Purple, eh? 
You see anything else? What? A white ghost walking down the park road, eh? All right, all right, don't get excited. We'll send a squad car to investigate right away. Hello, Sergeant Hogan. Oh, hello, Mr. Carteret. Miss Smith. Oh, I see you know my special assistant. Of course he does, Hugo. The sergeant and I are old friends. We met at the policeman's oh. ball. Keeping you busy these days, Sergeant? Busy? Mr. Carteret, we sure need your help in this case. The commissioner's going nuts inside. And you ought to hear the double talk coming in over this wire. <laughs> this Greystone Park business has got the people living around there walking around in circles. They're seeing everything from the king of the pixies to the ghost of my great-grandmother. I don't wonder. I've been working up a few shivers about it myself. Is Commissioner Williams in, Sergeant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go right into his office, Mr. Carteret. He's expecting you. Thank you. Here comes another screwball report. <laughs> Come on, Ann. Police headquarters. Sergeant Hogan speaking. What? You heard some kind of animal howling in Greystone Park? What kind of animal? So, Joe Donati left you to get a new shovel, eh, Farrell? And then a little later, you heard a scream. Yes, sir. It came from far off, and it must have been Joe. Oh, oh hello, Hugo. Miss Smith? Commissioner? Yes. Well, I guess that'll be all, Farrell. Stay pretty close to home, though. We may need you later. Yes, sir. Oh, that was Tom Farrell, the gardener. Hard to get anything out of him. He's so jittery. He's convinced there's some kind of murdering thing running around loose in that park. So is Mars and the chauffeur. And I'm convinced they're both telling straight stories. I trust you searched the park thoroughly, Commissioner. Oh, no, of course I have, Hugo. Had a detail, practically scrape every foot of the area with a fine-tooth comb. And you found nothing, Commissioner Williams? Nothing. Until yesterday morning. Oh, you have a clue? Yes, if you want to call it that, Hugo. But, well, it's almost incredible. Fantastic on the face of it. Hugo, we need your help badly. We're at our wit's ends down here, and, and I haven't even asked. Well, naturally, Commissioner, I'd be delighted. There's a touch of the macabre and supernatural here that I find very interesting. Don't you, Anne? I'm not so sure. Now then, Commissioner, you said something about a clue. Yes. Donetti, the missing gardener, was wearing hobnail shoes. The road was soft in the recent rain. And we were able to trace his footsteps as far as they went. What do you mean, as far as they went? I mean those footprints stopped dead in the middle of the road. What? Right next to Caleb Greystone's tomb in the center of the park. It was just as though some giant bird of prey picked on Eddie up and carried him off. But, my dear Williams, that doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't, but it happened. So Eddie couldn't vanish like that, unless he had wings. Maybe he does have wings now. <laughs> can't get those footprints out of my mind. They interest me. They scare me. In fact, I think I'll stop in at Greystone Park and have a look at them. You mean now? Yes. Oh, but Hugo, it's midnight, and there's something dangerous roaming around in that park. Something deadly. Why not wait until tomorrow in the daylight? Because the things that happen in Greystone Park, Anne, seem to happen at night. <laughs> Serene Greystone Park. The place that people just hate to leave. You should have let me drop you at your apartment, Anne. This is no place for a girl. Oh, no, Mr. Carter. I'm going right with you. Well, here's the gate. It's the only entrance or exit. Let's try it. There. Neatly locked with a heavy iron chain and padlock. The police want to keep people out, and I think it's a wonderful idea. Either that or they want to keep something in. The thing in this park couldn't be stopped by chains or padlocks. Well, they're not going to stop us either. Here, Anne, I'll boost you up to the top of this stone wall and climb up myself. Come on. There you are. How's the view up there? Oh, lovely. Now then, Mr. Carteret, let's see what kind of a second-story man you are. I haven't done this... Since I was a boy. <sighs> this wall is higher than it looks. You all right, Anne? Just dandy. Well, now, I'll drop down and, and then catch you. All right, Anne. Just let yourself go. All right, but don't miss. There you are. Listen, what was that? Only the wind. Why, oh, I, I thought I heard someone calling. Why, Anne... You're trembling. You're telling me. 
Hugo, where are we going? Up this road until we reach the place where that missing gardener's footprint stopped. Right next to that big square tomb in the center of the park, according to Commissioner Williams. Mm-hmm. That's the Greystone Mausoleum. All that remains of old Caleb Greystone, the philanthropist, lies within it. And that's the statue of old Caleb himself standing on the roof of the tomb. Oh, how nice. I hope you realize that William Marsden and Joe Donetti walked along this same road at night. And they did... <gasps> What's wrong? I felt a cold hand on my face. <gasps> that isn't a hand. It's a leaf on the end of a twig. Poor kid. You're frightened, aren't you? Who, me? I'm scared to death. I'm so scared my hair's standing on end. It's ruined my permanent. Oh, Hugo. What is it, Anne? That statue on the top of the mausoleum. The statue of Caleb Greystone. Yes. Well, what about it? It moved. What? Now, now, wait a minute, Anne. Hugo, I, I tell you it moved. I saw it lift one of its arms and, and turn its head in the moonlight. Now, now, Anne, it's just that you're on edge. What you saw was a mirage brewed out of moonlight and your own imagination. That statue's made of stone. Stone statues don't move. Come on, we leave the road and go down this hollow. Well, here we are. Here's the tomb. And here's the nutty's footprints, just as the commissioner said. They're pretty faint, but... Wait a minute. What is it, Hugo? Look up at that statue of Caleb Greystone. Up there on the mausoleum roof. What about it? Well, when we saw it on the other side of the hollow, it faced toward the road, didn't it? Why, yes. Now it's facing away from the road. And it did move, Hugo. It did move. More than that, Anne. While we lost sight of it down in that hollow, it turned completely around. strange phenomenon of the restless statue intrigued Hugo Carter at no end. Like a hound after his quarry, he scrambled to the roof of the mausoleum and made a thorough examination of both the statue and the roof in the moonlight. He reported his findings to Police Commissioner Williams, and the next morning, in the light of day, they revisited the scene. You two up there had better be careful. That roof's slippery. Oh, we'll be all right, Anne. Here, Commissioner. Watch what happens when I grasp this statue. Uh -huh. Yeah, interesting, Hugo. It turns loosely on that upright bar. Yes, and I've no doubt that old Caleb Greystone is turning down below in his tomb at this sacrilege we're committing on his image. You know what, Commissioner? What? This statue isn't marble through and through. It's merely a marble surface on a light aluminum base. A man could lift it right off this support and walk off with it over his shoulder. Yes, yes, he could. Well, not that it proves anything. But these scratches on this polished stone roof, man, almost looks as though they led to the door of the crypt on the other end of the roof. It's hard to tell. I tried the door of the crypt last night. It was locked. Well, it's still locked. Hey, it's a massive tomb. Big enough to take care of 20 dead millionaires. Yes, you'd think old Caleb Greystone would be pretty lonely down there. And his condition would be lonely anywhere. Well, you go. Where do we go from here? Let's have a talk with the park superintendent, Commissioner. His office is over there on the left. Maybe he'll be able to throw a little light on the proceedings. As the old saying goes, you never can tell. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Andrews, this is Hugo Carter at the criminologist and his special assistant, Miss Smith. How do you Mr. do? Andrews, how do you oh, do? yes, I've heard of you. How do you do? As superintendent of the Greystone Park, Mr. Andrews, we thought you might give us a little information on that tomb. Always glad to help the police, Commissioner Williams. Uh, thank you. Now then, uh, has that statue of Caleb Greystone always faced the road? Why, yes, as far as I know. It doesn't now, Mr. Andrews. You can see for yourself through the window. Why, bless my soul, you're right, Mr. Carter. Well, how do you suppose that happened? That's what we hope to find out. Interesting idea to build a statue of yourself and put it on your own mausoleum. Mr. Greystone had it made in memory of himself as a reminder to the public that he had converted his private estate into a park for their benefit. Mm -hmm. Somewhat of an egotist, huh? And from what the newspaper files say, eccentric. 
They practically accused old Caleb of dealing in black magic and selling his soul to the devil. Well, I understand the whole family was rather peculiar, Mr. Andrews. Well, yes, I suppose it's true. There were all sorts of rumors. Old Caleb was the eldest son, and he hated the rest of his family. Cheated them out of the family fortune, they say. It's said that he drove his own brother Arthur into poverty. Yes, yes, I remember the case. Arthur Greystone disappeared. Bureau of Missing Persons never did locate him. Mr. Andrews, that mausoleum out there is a pretty massive affair. Is old Caleb the only one buried there? Yes. As I said, he hated the rest of the family. He specified in his will that only he was to be buried there. That wasn't very hospitable of him. So old Caleb has that whole place all to himself, huh? What are you getting at, Hugo? Yes, that's what I'd like to know, too. Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. It's just that these cases of abnormal psychology interest me. Yes, Commissioner, they interest me no end. Come in. Oh, hello, Anne. Hello, Hugo. Relaxing at the piano, I see. Yes. Would you like me to stop? No, I like that melody you're playing. So do I. You know, music brings a certain clarity to the jumbled mind. It resolves things. It's a mental lullaby. Where have you been, Anne? Down at police headquarters. Poor Commissioner Williams. Why poor Commissioner Williams? Every newspaper in town is clamoring either for a solution to this Greystone Park mystery or a new police commissioner. Yes, I know. It's a pity. You know, Anne, Frank Williams is not only a gentleman, he's our friend. I think the time has come for us to try and crack this case. The time has come, all right, but how? Well, we've seen the outside of Caleb Greystone's tomb. It might be interesting to have a look at the inside. The inside? Yes. I've got an idea that's where our solution lies. But, but how are you going to get in? That door of the crypt on the roof is locked tight. <laughs> well, Anne, if I may boast a little, I have a certain skill with burglar tools. Yes, I know, but you can't go there in broad daylight and burglarize somebody's mausoleum. I don't propose to go there in broad daylight. You mean we're going tonight? I mean I'm going tonight. I'm taking you home right after dinner. Oh, no, you don't. You need someone to hold your flashlight. And besides, I'm just mad about mausoleum. Oh, it's a lovely evening. And outside of this storm, it's just as black as... <gasps> oh, look out, Anne. This stone roof is slippery. Careful now. The door of the crypt is right over here. Keep your flashlight trained right on this lock. But wait a minute. How did that happen? How did what happen? Why, the door of the crypt is unlocked. Unlocked? Yes. Somebody's been here ahead of us. Oh, dear. It's awfully dark down there. What are we going to do now? We're going inside. But... There may be someone in there. Well, I'll find out. You wait out here. Oh, no, Hugo Carteret. I'm not going to stand out here alone. I'm going in with you. Have it your own way. We'll take this hammer with us. It may come in handy. Careful now. There are stairs leading down into the crypt. You stay close to me. Hugo, I'm practically hugging you to death right now. Oh, it's cold in here. Well, it's dry at any rate. It's dark as pitch. I... Can't see a thing. Here, Anne, you take the hammer and let me have the flashlight. Now, let's have a look. Oh, uh, Hugo, look. There are two men lying there on the floor. They, they must be... Yes. The two men have disappeared in Greystone Park. William Marsden and Joe Donetti. Are they? Yes, I'm afraid they are. Oh, poor devils. Nobody would think of looking for them in here. How? How were they killed? They've got deep red marks around their throats. Typical of some kind of strangling cord. Oh, it's horrible. Why were they brought here? Why would anybody want to do a thing like this? The motive, Anne, like everything else in this tragic case, was abnormal. I'm beginning to see now why. Anne, listen. 
Footsteps on the roof. Someone's up there. Yes. They stopped by the creek door. Hugo, do you... Do you think it's the restless statue? Perhaps. I do know it's the killer. And he's coming down the steps. Put out that flashlight and flatten yourself against the wall. <laughs> Good evening. Oh, come now. I know you're in here. I can see in the dark better than you think. I have eyes like a cat. I saw you coming through the trees. I left the crypt door open for you. You walked right in, you fools. You walked right in. Who... Who are you? Why, my name is Arthur Greystone. This is the Greystone tomb. I live here with my friend. So you killed these two men? Yes, it was lonesome here. I wanted my brother Caleb over there in the casket to have company. He wanted to sleep alone in this big, beautiful mausoleum. It was so selfish of him, so selfish. But now he has two others to sleep with him. <laughs> and soon he'll have four. You took the statue of your brother off the supporting rod, didn't you, Arthur? It was light enough to carry. You hid it here in the tomb and posed as your brother's statue. In the dark, your victims couldn't see that the statue was alive. You dropped a cord around their necks as they passed below. <laughs> You're very clever, my friend. No, I wouldn't move if I were you. I have the strangling cord here in my hand, and I'm very good at using it. Why did you do all this? My brother Caleb cheated me in life. Drove me into poverty. Then he tried to cheat me even in death. He built this tomb and willed that only he would sleep here. This is your idea of revenge, filling his tomb with sleeping companions. Yes, I waited years to get even. <laughs> Caleb wanted to be alone, but now he'll never be alone. He'll never be able to realize his dying wish. Well... This talk has been very pleasant. Yes, indeed, but now we must get to work. What do you... I'll take you first, young lady. Please don't try to resist. I assure you I'm very strong. And really, I don't want to make you suffer. Look out, Anne. No, no, no. I can't blind you with your first sight with you. No. You fool, I've got hold of you. I you with my bare hands. Oh, yeah. I'm stronger than you do here. Nice work, Anne. You handle a hammer like a carpenter. Oh, Hugo, I, I'm afraid I killed him. No, no, you just stunned him, that's all, Ed. I'll tie him up in his own cord in a moment. But first, let's have a good look at him with this flashlight. Lift that white hood of his, will you, Ann? Hugo, it's Tom Farrell, the gardener. <laughs> And so ended the case of the lonesome corpse and another chapter in the memoirs of Hugo Carteret. Arthur Greystone had disappeared, only to reappear close to his brother's mausoleum as Tom Farrell, the gardener, a convenient alias. And the city of New York breathed a certain relief when this murderer, obsessed and poisoned by his macabre idea of revenge, finally went to the chair. <laughs> stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears, for mystery is a strange companion, a living memory. In the haunting hour.
No. No, stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour. Exceedingly strange is this world, and of all the things in it, the strangest to the ways of men. There are those who harbor up bitterness, along whose network of nerves, taut as fiddle strings, lurks the primordial passion which branded Cain. And there are those whose thoughts are like lighted shadows against the stars, and the fiber of whose individuality throbs to beauty and the revelation of music. This is the story of two men, and of the role a piece of music and a searing flame played in their destiny. Two men, Matt and Stuart Bannock, Twin brothers held together by the tenuous cobweb of blood ties, but poles apart in the warp of their lives. Matt, brooding and neurotic. Stuart, teeming with vigor, brilliant as a shaft of morning sunlight. That is Stuart playing. You're always playing that infernal piece. Why, Stuart, why? Matt, you've asked me that before. I like it. It's my favorite. You'd understand if you were a musician. That's right. Rub it in. You're a musician and I'm not. I can't play a note. So you're talented and I'm not. I didn't mean it that way. You're admired by everyone and I'm not. And no matter what you meant. The fact is, I'm just a forgotten half of twin brothers. Everything conspires against me. Matt, come on. You just haven't found yourself yet, that's all. Haven't found myself find that I've been robbed. Robbed? Yes, my dear Stuart, robbed. And apparently there's nothing I can do about it. What are you talking about? Nothing. Matt, you've never said anything to me about it. When did it happen? When we were born. Afraid I don't follow you. That's the trouble. I followed you. You were born first, ahead of me. (laughs) Sure. Sure, by all of ten minutes, but what of it? I don't see that that means anything. Oh, naturally, you wouldn't. Those who ride never understand why those who walk are footsore. Those who possess don't understand the hunger of those in want. Matt, you're talking in riddles. What are you trying to say? I say you're a robber, a thief. I... Yes, you, Uh... my own twin brother you've stolen from me. Matt, I... I don't understand. What have I taken from you? Talent, personality, intangible things that mark the difference between one man and another. Talent, personality. Afraid I'm confused. I don't know what you're talking about. Did you ever wonder why people have no trouble telling us apart? No, I can't say that I have. Look, here we are, twins. Identical twins. We look alike in every respect. Yet no one ever calls you Matt or me Stuart. Do you know why? Why? Because they can sense the difference between us, that's why. Because the man who has and the man has, has not. I don't look so amazed, Stuart. It's true. You're the one who has and I'm the one who has not. And the things I lack are the qualities you have in overabundance. Strength. Imagination. Vigor and talent. All the things that you've robbed from me. Matt, you're not making sense. Oh, yes, I am. I've thought it all out carefully. I've had years to do it, Stuart, and now I know. Now, now you know what? 
that a person is born with just so much luck or strength or talent. With twins, it has to be divided. There isn't quite enough of everything to go around, so one twin takes more than his fair share. He robs the other, just as you've robbed me, Stuart. It's quite a theory, Matt. It's a fact. A fact from which there can be only... only one escape for me. <laughs> Mavis? Yes, Matt? I... Well, that is, you look very lovely today. Oh, thank you, kind sir. But then, well, you're always beautiful. <laughs> Such flattery. It isn't flattery, you know I mean it. Mavis, you know how I feel about you. Please, Matt, we've gone all through that before. I can't help it, Mavis, I love you. I'd do anything for you. I'd even kill for you. Matt! Yes, I'd kill for you. I can't stand the thought of some other man possessing you. I tell you, I won't allow it. Please, please, Matt. You're, you're all excited. Well, why shouldn't I be? You expect me to stand by and do nothing while another man steals all the things that I want? No one is taking anything from you, Matt. I just don't love you. That's all. Tell me the truth, Mavis. Is there someone else? <sighs> yes. I thought so. I thought so. He always stands in the way of my happiness. He? But I haven't said who it is. You don't have to. I know. <laughs> well, then you must be psychic. Don't joke, Mavis. It isn't funny. Not to me. I'm sorry. Everyone is always sorry for me. Poor Matt, they say. He's not at all like Stuart, his twin brother. Oh, poor Matt. Isn't it too bad he isn't a musician, too? Oh, poor Matt. Oh, He's Matt, a... Matt, please. It's Stuart you love, isn't it? I... I didn't say You don't have to. I can see it in your eyes. Why are you afraid to tell me? I... I don't know. Maybe it's because of what I see in your eyes. I'll tell you what. I'll make you a promise. As soon as the news of my engagement is ready to be released, you'll be the first to know. Thanks. No. Now you feel like killing anyone? Yes, more than ever. <laughs> Mavis? Yes, Stuart? I... Well, that is, you look very lovely today. Uh, thank you, kind sir. But then you're... Well, you're always beautiful. Uh -huh. Mavis, what's the matter? You look faint. Oh, it... Uh, it's nothing. I... I just remembered something that someone else said. You mean there are others crazy enough to think you're beautiful, too? Well, so I've been led to believe. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was the only one. You are the only one. Oh, Mavis, Mavis, darling. I love you. And I love you. <sighs> oh, this is wonderful. You're wonderful. Everything's wonderful. I want to tell the whole world about us. Oh, but I, I promised to let someone be the first to know. Who is it? Anyone I know? It's a, um... Stuart. Hmm? You will be careful, won't you? Careful? Careful of what, dear? Of, uh... uh... Oh, oh, it's nothing. I, I guess I'm just being silly. No, no, you're adorable. Come here. <laughs> now, still feel silly? No, no. Oh, but, Stuart, darling. Yes, dear? Do be careful. For my sake, please. I said, who's there? It's I. Oh, Matt. Got me worried for a moment. I didn't know who it was. Guess I'm kind of nervous tonight. Mavis said something about being... Well, Matt. Matt, what's that you're carrying? A bottle. What's in it? A liquid. <laughs> a what? Gasoline. Matt! 
Brad, what's the big idea? See this match in my hand? Yes. That ought to give you your answer. Brad, that's dangerous. For you, not for me. What are you saying? You won't rob me this time, Stuart. You've taken talent and personality from me. Now you want the girl I love. But... I can't stand the thought of some other man possessing Mavis, I tell you, and I won't allow it. That I didn't know. Will you do now? I'm going to set the house on fire, and you're going to be burned alive, dear brother. My... You can't get out. The flames will have you trapped there in the corner, but I can get out. I'm standing here by the door. <laughs> Matt! Matt, don't strike that match. Goodbye, Stuart. I'm paying you back for robbing me. Matt, All I have to do is throw the burning match into the liquid at your feet, like this. <laughs> oh, oh, my face. Explode in my face. I, I can't see. Matt! Matt! Stuart! Stuart! Matt, Matt, where are you? Stuart! Don't save me! Matt, I can't! Save me! Matt, I'm cornered! Stuart! Matt! Go in there. Oh, my fiance is in there. Let go of me, officer, please. Sorry, but no one can go into that house. It's a solid mass of flames. Please, please. Nothing doing. Look, there's somebody at the window. He's going to jump. Oh, let it be, Stuart. Go on, jump. Hurry, jump. Stuart, Stuart. Hey, guys. Hey. Hey. He's still alive. I'm going to call an ambulance. And what do you want? May I see him? Well, you better not, lady. Oh, but please, you, I... Uh, you happen to know the people who lived in this house? Yes. My fiancé and his twin brother. Oh, let me see which it is. Well, all right. There. Do you recognize him? Well, which is it? I... I don't know. Stuart Bannock, twin brothers, yet different as day and night. Matt, bitter and neurotic. Stuart, a brilliant pianist whose favorite music is one of Chopin's nocturnes. Both are in love with Mavis, who loves Stuart. Matt believes he has been robbed of talent and personality by being born a twin. He sets fire to the Bannock house to kill Stuart. But he, too, is trapped in the flames. One man leaps from the burning building. Which is it? Matt or Stuart? And the chief says there's no doubt it was a case of arson. That so? Yep. We found a fellow who sold the gasoline. He swears it was Matt Bannock who bought it. He's positive, huh? Yep. As he knew both Stuart and Matt all their lives. Has never mistaken one for the other. Mm. Makes the case pretty easy then, doesn't it, Kelly? Bain, how long you been on the arson squad? Oh, about two months. Well, Bain, when you've been on it as long as I have, you'll know there's no such thing as a really easy case. We've got the survivor, haven't we? Yep. Got him under guard in the hospital. Then all we have to do is identify him. What's so tough about that? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Except the guys were identical twins and this fellow's badly banged up. And nobody knows whether it's Matt or Stuart. No way of identifying him. By fingerprints or something? No, nope, we've checked everywhere. The prints have never been filed. Well, I, uh... Yeah, go on. I'm listening. Oh, why can't we get him to talk and identify himself? We've tried that. He talks all right. He'll talk your arm off if you let him. But getting him to make sense, huh, that's a different story. <laughs> Yes? I want Mavis. I love Mavis, will you? You tell her that when you see her. Yes, I'll, I'll tell her. Make her come to me. Without her, I'm lost and everything is wasted. Oh, try to rest, please. You're not like Mavis. Shh, shh. Now, you must be quiet so you can get well. Shall I tell you a secret? I love her. Everybody loves her, but I love her most. Oh, she... 
She loves you, too. How do you know? Who told you? Go away. Tell Mavis I want her. I'll bring her to you if you just go to sleep. And when you wake, you'll be... She'll be here beside you. Tell her I love her. I'll sleep if you promise to tell Mavis I love her. Yes. Yes, I promise. Now, close your eyes. <laughs> And that's why we can't get him to identify himself. He doesn't talk sense. His mind's deranged. I see. Well, you got any more brilliant ideas on how we can find out if he's Matt or if he's Stuart? Well, uh, uh... Go on, I'm still listening. I got nothing else to do. Have you asked the doctors at the hospital how long it'll be before he recovers his senses? Of course we asked the doctors. That's one of the first things we did when we found we couldn't get anything out of the man ourselves. What'd they say? Oh, they were very helpful. Very helpful indeed. They said, as far as they could tell, he might be like that the rest of his life. Gee, that's tough. And then again, he might snap out of it at any time. A shock or something might restore his mind to normal. That gives us some hope. Uh, See, Kelly, uh, do you mind if I go along with you the next time you go to the hospital to see him? No, not at all, not at all. What have I got to lose? There it is. 8.02. This is room. Oh, it's a little bit wasted. Wasted, I tell you. She won't let it. She, she won't let it. She's good. Listen to she him, will She won't. It's dark most of the time. Lights go out. She makes it bright again. Kind of gives me the creep. Tell her to make it bright again. Tell Hello. Her. I... Someone's here. How are you feeling? I don't know you. Who are you? Oh, just a couple of friends. Who are you? You wouldn't understand. It's the darkness, but she makes Isn't it bright. Poor devil. She's Mavis, and I... You're Matt. I... You're Matt, aren't you? I'm Matt? I'm Matt. Huh. I'm tired. I... I'm tired. But you are Matt Pennock. We know that now. I love Mavis. I... Stop bluffing. You're Matt Pennock. You know you are. I know I am. I am Matt Bannock? Yes. Yes, I am Matt Bannock. I'm Matt Bannock, and I've been robbed. Mavis. Mavis makes the darkness bright. Stop that. I... Now repeat after me. I am Matt Bannock. Go on, say it. I... I am... I... It's no use, uh, Finn. It's cracked. I think uh, he's faking. I... Uh, What's your name? I... I'm Stuart Bannock. I'm Stuart Panic, and I have everything because What's I... your name? I'm Matt Panic. I'm Matt, and I've been robbed of my head. What's I... your name? I love Mavis. I love Mavis because she makes everything right. Oh, I give up. He's I fine. love her. Yeah, but I let's love... get out of here. I love Mavis. <laughs> well, Matt Bannock or Stuart Bannock, whichever he is, is leaving the hospital today. Yeah. Girl Mavis has taken him to her home. Why? Well, it seems she and Stuart became engaged the very day of the fire. She doesn't know whether this fellow is Matt or Stuart, but she isn't taking any chances. You know how loyal women can be. Yeah. I'd like to forget the whole case, but the chief won't stand for that. He won't rest or let us rest till he proves who the survivor is. Yeah. But even if he is Matt, we can't get a conviction. The man is mentally unbalanced. Or else he's putting on a darn good act. And an act always has a flaw that shows up in time. But whatever it is, he's still getting away with murder. You're home now. This is your new home. Home? Yes. I am home. Yes. This is where you'll get well and strong again. Strong? I will be strong again. You see? You've spoken two rational sentences in succession. Oh. Maybe the association of ideas and objects will help. Come along. Come along with me. That's it. I like to be home. I like to be home. Now, sit right down here. That's it. Look what's in front of you. See? It's the piano. Piano? 
Yes, a piano. Play it. Play the piano. Piano. Watch me. See, like this. Now you do that. Piano. Here. Let me help you. Put your hands on the keys. Like this. Now play. Please. Piano. Please try. Try again. Drink this glass of milk. If you see Mavis, you tell her I love her. Yes, I'll tell her. But first, take this glass. There, that's better. Oh, I'm so sorry for you. Everyone is always sorry for me. What? I don't want to drink this. I'm tired. I'm tired of this. Oh, you sound like me. Tired of them all. Robbed. Robbed of talent and personality. Oh, no, no, it can't I be. I said robbed. Don't wave your arm like that. Your love's upset the table. I can't stand the thought of some other man possessing Mavis. That's words. Rob. He said that the day you... I won't allow it. Oh, be careful of that table. There's a burning chafing dish on it. I tell you, I won't allow it. Oh, I... the table is now you've overturned it. I won't allow it. The rug. I won't. The rug is on fire. It's on fire. Get out of the way. Get out of the way while I put out this fire. <laughs> in it, the strangest are the ways of men. This is the story of two men and of the role a piece of music and a searing flame played in their destiny. Two men, Matt and Stuart Bannock, twin brothers held together by the tenuous cobweb of blood ties, but poles apart in the warp of their lives. Matt, brooding and neurotic, Stuart, teeming with vigor, brilliant as a shaft of morning sunlight. Shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. Young, romantic sort of a chap, and he lived in a little town called Ainsville. 
He had a bookshop there on the square. And like other people of the town, oftentimes Kirk stood in the small station and watched the 845 pull up to the shed. His life was a quiet life until that night. It was raining, and Kirk stood under the train shed. The steam engine puffed by in the mail car, a coach, and another. The train stopped. Directly before him, framed in the misty window, was the face of a girl. And it was a tortured face full of pain and sadness. Suddenly, Kirk felt an unconquerable impulse to help this stranger. He stood staring at the girl's dark eyes, and then, suddenly, the coach gave a little lurch forward, and Kirk ran to the steps of the car and swung onto the train. He knew that more than anything in the world, he wanted to speak to that girl. He had to know who she was. So he took a deep breath, pushed open the door, walked down the aisle, and sat down on the seat opposite her. Finally, he leaned forward a little and said, What's the matter? Why do you cry like that? What? I'm sorry, my name is Kirk Holland. I don't mean to bother you, but well, I couldn't help wondering if there's something I can do. No. No, I'm all right. Never seen a woman cry like that before. Maybe it's because women usually cry because they're sorry for themselves. That's not my reason. What is the reason, then? I'm crying for someone else. Oh. Because you're leaving him? You're going away? No, and yes. Where are you going? To a farm I used to visit when I was that hurry. Very out of the way, up in Canada. I'm going back again. On vacation? No. No, I'm going there to stay. Forever. But I'm glad you spoke to me. Made everything easier. You smile a little, then. Oh, I... I had a thought. What? Oh, it's nothing. Tell me what. Well, I was thinking... Suppose somehow in the next few minutes there'd be an accident. The train off the track, a, a mass of steaming, mangled coaches. And suppose I were to be killed. Well, why do you think of that? Well, it might happen. It might easily. If it did, I'd... I'd want you to do something for me. What? I'd send you on an errand. Tonight. I'd send you backstage at the opera house in New York. And what would I do there? I'd want you to go to a man who'd be standing in the wings, smoking a long cigarette. A little gray-haired man named Lawrence Blaine, my singing teacher. And what would I say? You'd say, I was with Iris Martin when she died. She said to tell you she was sorry for what happened. But the thing she did was all she could do to keep you from bringing unhappiness. Go on. I... I'd want you to take Lawrence Blaine by the arm and lead him to some place where it was quiet and stay with him for a little while because he'd need somebody. And after that? That's all. There's no after that. I, I can't help it. I, I'm sorry. Thank you for listening. Oh, train's slowing down. Where are we? Clarkston. Clarkston? Well, what's the matter? Nothing. Will you save my seat for me? Of course. My eyes are so red and ugly. You've been very kind. Goodbye, Mr. Holland. You're listening to The Haunting Hour on the Golden Age of Radio Theater. Now, back to The Haunting Hour. She took up her polo coat and purse and walked away. Kirk watched her slim body move down the aisle. A feeling of loss fell over him. Why had she said goodbye like that? He waited, his heart something fast inside him, breathing short and quick. Something was the matter. The watch on his wrist ticked away one minute, two. He didn't come back. Then suddenly the train was starting. Kirk sat up. Then from out the corner of his eyes... On the platform beyond the window, he caught a fleeting glimpse of a polo coat disappearing in the dingy station. He was running away. He's gone out of his life, desperately and forever. 
He ran down the aisle, out on the car's platform, and jumped off the train. The station platform was deserted. He ran across the platform into the almost empty waiting room. He got there. Then, through the large open window under a street lamp, he saw her just as she turned a corner out of sight. But when he reached the corner, the street was empty, except for a mist that hung like a ghost over the pavement. He ran on, his mind frantic with terror and haste. Then, ahead, like fuzzy balls of flame in the night, he saw two rows of light shining dimly over the curving span of a bridge. He strained his eyes to the misty darkness. His ears were taut for sound. Then, ahead, lying forlorn and solitary on the bridge, he saw a girl's polo coat and a blue bag and a pocketbook. He held onto the rail and looked down into the dizzy darkness of the river. His mind was spinning, felt helpless and lost, like a child. For a moment, he stood listening to the swift, dimming river. And at last, slowly, he took up the polo coat and the blue beret and the pocketbook and started back through the heavy fog. Hello, Merrill. This is Inspector Jones, headquarters. The fellow here says a woman jumped off North Bridge about 15 minutes ago. Better get the riverboats looking for her. Okay? Okay. Well, the boats will pick her up, Miss Holland. Only I've been sure I could have stopped her. She was too young. Here, let's have a look at this pocketbook. Mm Mm-hmm. Usual thing. Lipstick, compact, change purse. And uh, here's a note addressed to Iris Martin. Signed by somebody named Maestro. She mentioned him. No. I left it for music teacher, Lawrence Blaine. Mm-hmm. Iris, I'm determined. Tonight, at the second intermission, do not try to stop me. Be ready to sing. Maestro, does this mean anything to you? I know nothing at all. Probably has something to do with a suicide. It may be important. Inspector, I have an appointment. I'd like to go. Okay, Mr. Holland. But you'll have to identify the body. When we find it, I'll get in touch with you. As a matter of fact, this case can stand investigation. From this note, it looks to me like something more than suicide. Her column stood for a moment on the sidewalk outside the police station. She asked him to do an errand. He looked at his watch and started down the street toward the railway station. Now his destination was not unknown. Is this the stage door of the opera house? Yep. What you want? I'd like to see a man named Lawrence Blaine. Uh, nobody's allowed backstage. But it's about Iris Martin. She asked me. Miss to... Martin? Well, that uh, kid was. He was looking all over town for her. Uh, down the hall there. See those two men? The white haired ones, Mr. Blaine. Thanks. One minute. Second acting, one minute. Leave me alone, Barrio. One minute. I tell you, I've called everyone. But how could you let her out of your sight? She was upset, nervous. Oh, on stage, everybody. On stage. Oh, Mr. Blaine? Yes? I, I have a message for you. It's from Miss Martin. From Miss Martin? What is it? I'm Antonio Vario. The message is from Mr. Blaine. Where is he? He's been frantic trying to on find stage, her. On stage, Mr. Vario. The curtain's waiting. All right, all right. I'm coming. Please, Mr. Vario, on stage. Maestro, on stage, wait in my dressing room. I'll be back in 20 minutes, please. Where is Miss Martin? Why did she run away like this? I have bad news for you, Mr. Blaine. Bad news? What bad news? What's happened? Mr. Blaine, she drowned herself in the North River on Carson. They're searching for her body now. Drowned? No. Oh, Iris, my child. What have I done to you? Lawrence Blaine's face was gaunt and pale. He stood like a dumb man. And remembering what the girl Iris had told him, Kirk took the old man's arm and led him out the stage door. He hailed a taxi... And when they reached the master's studio, the old man sank in a large, easy chair, staring ahead into an empty future. Then he began to speak. Mr. Holland, this girl was my life. She was like my own child. I loved her with all my heart. I taught her to sing. I taught her to use the magic of her voice. And it was incomparable magic. Look at me, Mr. Holland. Look at an old man whose love outweighed his good sense. I understand, Mr. Blaine. But it was my dream that Iris be great. Greater than any singer who ever lived. That dream was my only reason for living. And nothing should stand in its way. 
Not even Madame Zadrini. Madame Zadrini, yes. She knew the greatness of Irish boys. She knew my Iris could surpass her. And she was determined Iris never had that chance. That is why I planned to kill her. Oh. And Miss Martin knew what you planned? I was mad to even think of it. But it was the only way, Mr. Holland. The only way I could convince Iris of her greatness. To have her seen in Madame Zadrini's place. Now it is too late. Too late. Maestro. Maestro, a terrible thing is... Please, please, Mr. Barrow, you're not excited. This is no time for pampering. Something terrible has happened at the opera, Maestro. What is it, Barrio? When the call came after the second intermission, Madame Zerdrini did not appear. They found her in the dressing room, murdered. Where the place was in an uproar. I will tell you, there was no understudy. They, they were calling frantically for Iris. Barrio, you mean Madame Zerdrini? How did she die? Poison, they said, poison. I do not know more than that. But where is Iris? This man said he brought you a message from her. here. But Iris is dead. Dead? What are you saying? It is true, Mr. Vario. Miss Martin drowned herself. Then it was you who killed the maestro. You! Please, Mr. Vario. He wrote her a note telling her what he planned to do. He planned to murder Madame Rizadrini. Iris told me all about it. Maestro. Then you... You did kill her. No, Vario, I didn't. I didn't, I tell you. And Iris killed herself to keep you from it. Maestro, Maestro, the police, they will find find out that the they police will... already know. They have the note. It was in her pocketbook. That note is incriminating, Mr. Blaine. I read it. My poor Iris. As you say, Vario, she killed herself to save me. And now, with a little piece of paper she left behind, she condemns me for a crime I didn't commit. <laughs> We'll return to Destination Unknown on The Haunting Hour from the Golden Age of Radio Theater in just a moment. Once again, The Haunting Hour. One night, Kirk Holland obeyed his impulse to talk to a girl he saw crying in the window of the night train from New York. Her name was Iris Martin. When she left the train, Kirk followed to discover she had drawn herself in the North River. Kirk went to New York to tell Lawrence Blaine, the girl's singing teacher, of Iris Martin's suicide. Later, in Blaine's studio, Antonio Vario, an opera star, appeared to say that Madame Zedrini had been murdered. Because of an incriminating note written by Blaine, indicating he would kill Madame Zedrini so Iris might sing in her stead, a note the police found in the pocketbook of Iris Martin, Lawrence Blaine was arrested for the murder of Madame Zedrini. Kirk Holland went back to Ainsville... During the following weeks, he walked the shaded streets of the town, and in his mind flashed images of Iris Martin. Sometimes in his sleep, he awoke, calling the dead girl's name. When Lawrence Blaine was brought to trial, he testified for the aging man, and listened as the district attorney said, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I ask you to consider the evidence. You have heard the analysis. Arsenic in Anna Zadrini's body and in the dregs of her teacup tea that she drank during the second intermission in her dressing room. Consider, then, that this murderer was a man of shrewd intelligence. Do not be deceived by the absurd plea of the defense that because Iris Martin was dead, Lawrence Blaine had no motive for murder. Remember, this fiendish little man was sick with hatred for Anna Zadrini. That's the reason he stole into her dressing room in the afternoon of that black day and placed the poison in those tea bags. Ladies and gentlemen, I demand the maximum penalty for Lawrence Blaine. Murder in the first degree. Before I pass sentence on you, Lawrence Blaine, have you anything to say to the court? Nothing, Your Honor. Then it is my duty as judge of this high court of justice to sentence you, Lawrence Blaine, to die in the electric chair on the last day of our court. Blaine was sentenced to die. That afternoon in the city prison, Kirk Holland stepped into the dark cell to find Antonio Vario talking to the condemned man. Good afternoon, Vario. Hello, Mr. Blaine. Mr. Holland, what can we do? There must be something we can do for him. There is nothing, Vario. And what does it matter now? What 
Does it matter? Have they found a body, Mr. Holland? You've kept in touch with the police in Clarkston. They found no trace of it, are you? Then we must get lawyers for you, Maestro. Good lawyers will appeal to the governor. Yes, yes, there's still a chance. It doesn't matter, I tell you. What reason do I have to live now? I'm an old man. My time has come. And Iris is dead. Without Iris, there is no reason to live. I know, Maestro. I know. There is something I've never told you. What, Vario? I loved her, too. I had asked her to marry me a day or two before she died. You, Vario? Yes, yes. I would have done anything for her. Anything. In the week that followed, the governor refused to reprieve Sir Lawrence Blaine. Kirk went back to Ainsville. The weeks passed. Finally, the day came when Lawrence Blaine was to die. Kirk left his bookshop that night and walked the wide streets of the little town. With every step, he walked deeper into the shadowy presence of Iris. She was everywhere. And she was not dead, but she was alive in his mind. There was the tilt of her head, a small, round face, a sad smile. Now and then he was sure he saw her. I was just turning a corner ahead. I was standing alone under the glow of the street lamp. But it was only the ghost of a memory. A memory he loved. It was this memory and his desire to be close to where she had been that led him to the station that evening. A winter's cold rain had begun to fall, and through it, out of the darkness, came the black engine, out of a cloud of white steam, moving slowly past the shed. The mail car, a coat, and another. Kirk felt his body tingle. Then... Directly before him, framed in the misty window. Iris! Iris! He bounded onto the car, pushed open the door, and stood transfixed in the aisle as she half rose from her seat with a little cry. Mr. Holland! Iris, Martin, it's you! All the way I've been hoping, wishing for you. And you came. I can't believe it. Where have you been? You thought you were dead. I know. I was in Canada, miles away from anything. I didn't know what happened till yesterday. I saw a newspaper in the village store. And you know Mr. Blaine has been convicted of murder. And he's innocent. I know he is. Come with me to help him, Mr. Holland. Oh, you couldn't keep me away. I've got to save him. There's something I know that may save him. Oh, please help me again. I will, Iris. You see, I thought if everyone believed me dead, it was the only way I, I could think of to keep him from killing her. He was doing it for me, and I couldn't stop him. I know. He told me. Oh, can you ever forgive me, Mr. Holland? That night on the train, when, when you spoke to me, I, I needed somebody to send back to New York to tell the maestro I was dead before you could commit this crime. So I used you. I thank you now for what you did. Nothing matters except that you're alive. Oh, take me to somebody in authority, to, to the district attorney. You see, I know who murdered Madame Zagrini, and there's only one way to prove it. Hello? Are you? This is Kirk Holland. Yes, yes, what is it? I have some news for you, good news. The reprieve? No, no, it's about Iris Martin. Have they found her body? Yes, she's alive, are you? What? It's true. We're on our way now to the district attorney's office. She asked me to call you. She wants you to come down to the DA's office right away. I, I can't believe it. Will you be there? Of course, right away, right away. Well, I must say, Miss Martin, your appearance is dramatic, to say the least. But as district attorney, I can't see from what you've told me how your evidence will clear Lawrence Blaine. But I, I told you, I have no proof. Can't you stay the execution for a day or two till we can get the proof? Well, it's very irregular. But with Vario's help and a little time, I'm, I'm sure I can prove the maestro innocent. Oh, please, he'll be here any minute. Give us the chance. If you'd tell me what you have in mind, Miss Martin, maybe the governor would intervene, but... Well, frankly, I couldn't call him with the scanty information you've given me. Why, you were miles away when the murder was done. Was I? How do you know I was? Iris, Iris, this is magnificent. I, I can't believe it. I'm glad to hear, Vario. My dear, my dear, what can I say? I missed you more than you'll ever know. Thank you, Vario. Why did you do this to us? Why? I'll explain to you later. Right now, Vario, we've got to do everything we can to save the maestro. We have to tell the truth. What truth? Vario here... Will back me up when I tell you that at rehearsal on the afternoon of the day Madame Zadrini was murdered, she used the last of her imported teeth. Ida, is that right, Mr. Mario? Yes, that is right. Mario was standing with me when Miss Madame Zadrini asked me to lend her a few bags of tea for my dressing room. That's true, isn't it, Mario? Iris, what are you? 
Yes, yes, that is true. So you see, the tea that murdered Madame Zadrini was tea she borrowed from me. Oh, you mean that... No, no, she doesn't mean that. Iris, what did you say? Lawrence Blaine did not commit the murder. Barry was trying to protect me, but he knows quite well that I poisoned the tea bag. I killed Madame Zadrini. Iris, but that's not true. She's only saying that because I... Mario loves me. He'd do anything to keep you from knowing. He'd let the maestro die to save me. Is what she says true, Mr. Barrio? I don't know. Iris, what have you done? The only thing I could do, Barrio, to save the maestro's life. But it doesn't make sense. It... Will you sign this confession, Miss Martin? Yes. Yes, I'll sign anything. Only call the prison before it's too late. Iris, tell them the truth. I have told them. No, no, she's lied. She did not do it. It was I, I who killed Madame Zedrini. I did it for you, Iris. Because I've loved you for a long time. But it was the maestro who kept you from me. He was so cautious of where you went, whom you knew. And then, when I discovered he himself was planning to kill Madame Zedrini, when he had written such an incriminating note, I took over to make sure he would be convicted. I was planning to tell the police about the note. But when they found it in your purse, and when you yourself were supposedly dead, You've I... Said enough, Ariel. You've almost allowed an innocent man to die for your own crime. Hello, this is the district attorney. Get me the governor's mansion and hurry. And tell Patrolman Hicks to bring a police car to the front door. He's to take a Miss Martin and a Mr. Holland to Southgate Prison. Lawrence Blaine is a free man. How did you know it was Valio who killed her? Well, I didn't suspect him, but I knew Madame Zagrini had borrowed some teeth from him. I heard her asking for him. Well, it's over now. Now everything will be just as the maestro wanted it. You will sing. You'll be a great star. No, Kate. No, because I don't want to be. I've never wanted to be, really. Then what will you do? I don't know. That'll come later. Iris, the first night I saw you in the window of the train, I, I had a sudden impulse to know you. That's why I climbed aboard. If you hadn't come back, I'd have spent the rest of my life in love with you. <gasps> With a ghost? With a brief memory. Now I have another impulse. Maybe to take you in my arms. Maybe to kiss you. And you always obey your impulses? From now on, I do. Imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. Tapping on the window. city that marks the end of a long trail is beautiful. That is why Mexico City, even now, is like a white, majestic monument to me. For here on the sun-drenched terrace, I dare, for the first time, to look back without fear. The echo chamber in my mind is sealed, and I dare to let the past parade its antic sounds, even its tappings on the window. For now I know that tapping belongs to the past, to the places in my mind that once were dark. Yet, it was but a few days ago, back in New York, that I heard the tapping, that it came to me out of the night to shatter my reason and almost to scare me. How well I remember that. Jim. Jim, wake up. Uh, uh, huh? What? Jim, please. Turn on the light. Oh. What's the matter, Laura? Jim. Somebody was tapping on our window. Oh, darling, for heaven's sake, you've been dreaming. No, Jim, I heard it. 
I was lying here wide awake thinking. Laura, do you mean you haven't gone to sleep yet? What? Why, it's two o'clock. I tell you, I heard it. Open the window, Jim. No. Laura, there's nothing and no one out here. There couldn't be, darling. It's a sheer drop of 20 stories. I heard the tapping. I know I heard it. Laura, try to get some sleep now. And promise me you'll go around to see Dr. Simmons in the morning. He'll give you something to quiet your nerves and make you sleep. All right, Tim. I I guess I am overwrought. You want me to leave the light on? No. Good night, Tim. Good night, Laura. I tried to go to sleep, but it was no use. The tapping was real. I'd heard it there on my window. And all the memories came back. They pounded persistently against my will to shut them out. And finally, when I couldn't fight them any longer, I let them take possession to slide into the past. Back five years to California. At the time, I thought I was so desperately in love with Courtney Lang. Courtney. I heard the tapping, Courtney. I heard it and I hated you. Hated every memory of you from that first evening we met in the little garden that separated our apartment. Oh. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't know anyone was out here. <laughs> Don't let me frighten you away. This garden isn't private. Thank you. I'm Courtney Lang. That's my apartment there on the left. I'm Laura Harding. I live here too. Yes, I know. I've watched you here in the garden from my window. You're very lovely. I'll be going in now. Oh, uh, please don't be offended, Miss Harding. That must have sounded rather like a fresh compliment, but it wasn't meant to be. I'm an artist, and I notice beautiful things and beautiful people just as a matter of course. I see. Still, it is getting late. I must go in. You're not angry, then? Of course not. Good night. Good night, Miss Harding. I hope we'll meet again. Several days passed, and I'd all but forgotten that chance meeting when... What's that? Who's there? It's Courtney Lang, Miss Harding. Open the window. Oh. Oh, why, what is it? You startled me. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have phoned you, but this method seemed more direct. Was something wrong? No. No, far from it. In fact, this bold, unconventional summons is an invitation to a party. I see. Or rather, I don't. Quite. Well, I, I have a few friends in my apartment who are about to pass judgment on my latest painting. I'd like very much to have you join us and pass judgment, too. Well, I, I, I don't know. Uh... Do come. Please. All right. I really would like to see some of your work. I'll join you in a moment. And that was how our strange love affair began. At first, I was aware only of Courtney's charm and his talent as a painter. He was handsome, self-assured, and, and successful. I couldn't help feeling flattered by his attention. Then one evening, as we sat together in the garden, I had my first glimpse of the Courtney I was to learn to fear. The real Courtney. Tired, Laura? Well, Laura, it's difficult getting used to spending a whole day in an art gallery. What did you think of those robe of black and white? They're really what I took you to see. Well, frankly, I didn't like them. No? Why not? Oh, I don't know exactly. They... Well, they, they gave me the creeps. I knew you'd like them. But I didn't like them, Courtney. They were morbid and ugly. They looked like something remembered from a nightmare. Uh, just what were they supposed to mean? They're Ruby's illustrations for a book on phobias. Phobias? Well, I suppose that explains them, but it doesn't add to their appeal. Ruber is a master. His brush begins where the psychiatrist leaves off. Oh, that kind of probing is horrible. No, no, it isn't, Flora. Every person has deep, dark recesses in his mind. Hidden, mysterious wells of doubts and fears that can be turned into sources of power, provided he isn't afraid of them. Courtney, I've never heard you talk like this before. You're psychic. You can understand this sort of thing. I'm psychic? 
Oh, Courtney, really? But you are. I sensed it the first time we met. You're, you're super sensitive to things, to people, thoughts. You've got that kind of tension in your consciousness that gives you a sixth sense. I wish I did. Maybe I'd be a more successful writer if I knew a few things other people didn't. No, really, I'm serious, Laura. It's a trait I never fail to recognize. You mean you're psychic too? Yes. I think you've always known that. Put me to the test. How? How can I test you? Well, suppose you concentrate on something we both know about. Some incident or conversation, even a person we both know. Let your mind take complete hold of it for a moment, and don't let go. Ready? No. Give me time to think of something difficult. Something you won't be likely to guess. Oh, let me see. Um, all right, I'm ready. Concentrate, then. I am. I've got it. You have? What? You were thinking of me. Right? Oh, yes, but that's just an obvious guess on your part. No, there's more to it. You were thinking of the way I tap upon your window when I come to call for you. Why, Courtney, that's exactly right. How did you know? Well, it's particularly easy for me to hear any sound in a thought. You heard the sound in my thought? The tapping? Distinctly. You see, it's pitch dark, and your eyes have no distractions. So I didn't even have to use the thought energy to keep them closed. Want to try something else? No. No, it frightens me. I, d I don't believe in it, but I'm... I'm afraid. It's because you don't want to recognize the psychical powers you know you have. You've been frightened and appalled by your own ability sometimes. By your hunches, your... your premonitions, even your dreams. Gordon, stop! This kind of talk is nonsense. Laura, Laura, if you are given this power to look on glory... You should be proud of it. No. No, I'm not. I... I want to go in now, Courtney. All right, Laura. I'll see you tomorrow evening, then. I should have left you then, Courtney. I should have run away. I knew that you were strange and even dangerous. But I thought I loved you. And I stayed. And then one day... I want to talk to you seriously about something, Laura. Yes, Courtney? What is it? I'd like to paint your portrait. Why, Courtney? Well, I'm really terribly flattered. In that blue dress you wore to Florence Whitby's party the other night. Mm hmm. That would be perfect. There's just one other thing, Laura. I have so many pressing commitments at present, we'll have to work whenever I can squeeze in the time. Oh, well, that doesn't matter at all. Fine. I suppose. Suppose I tap on your window as a sort of signal whenever I'm free. No, I'd rather you didn't do that. I... Oh, oh, of course, Courtney. Whenever you want me, just tap on my window and I'll be right with you. Come in, Courtney. I'll be with you in a moment, Courtney. Thank you, Courtney. I'm coming. It was during those weeks that I posed for the portrait that I began to be convinced at last that Courtney was right. That I did have a strange power in my mind to see beyond the perilous edge of reality. I began to read the books I found in Courtney's studio. Weird, twisted, mystical books. Books on spiritualism, telepathy, Phobias, books that dealt with pathology and neurology. Finally, I began to believe I understood something of Courtney's strange philosophy. The terrible dread took hold of me. I was afraid of him and of myself. And then, quite suddenly, the portrait was finished. Courtney invited a few of our friends to the unveiling. When everything was ready, he called for me. Laura. Laura, we're ready. Come and see yourself as an artist sees you. I'll be out in a moment, Courtney. Wait for me. Yes, Laura. Courtney, I'm so excited. I've never seen myself on canvas. I'm excited too, Laura. And yet, I'm... I'm rather sad. Why, Courtney? 
Don't you think the Pope is good? No, no, it's not that. What then? I've been thinking about us, Laura, and wondering. I think you know that I've fallen deeply in love with you. So much so that I'm beginning to be afraid for us. Afraid? Of what? Well, all these weeks I've been tapping out a tattoo upon your window, and you've come running to me. Now the portrait's finished, and I'm wondering if you'll go on responding whenever I call. Oh, Courtney, of course I will. Whenever your message sounds upon my window, I'll come, no matter what. Remember this promise, Laura. When I send a message for you, you'll come, no matter what. Now that everything is behind me and all the ghosts of my past have been shut out, I can look back with a clear mind without being afraid. I know I fell in love with Courtney Lang before I realized what a strange person he was. I had tried to make concessions for him because he was a talented artist and the most fascinating man I'd ever known. Dark, mysterious, and challenging. He had painted my portrait, and when it was finished, he took me to his studio where some friends were gathered for the unveiling. And when they were gone, Courtney said, Well, darling, now that you've seen it, tell me, how do you like your portrait? Courtney... I'm sure it's a beautiful piece of work. Artistically, I mean. But... But what? Well, don't be angry with me, but... It seems to me that there's something almost sinister about it. In the eyes. They're too deep, too dark. Somehow too knowing. But that's the real you, Laura. The you I love. Oh, Courtney, please. Let's not go through all that again. I have no special powers of mind or spirit. I know better, Laura. Think of it. To look into a world beyond this one. A world that we can find together if you will let me take you. Laura, we have but to combine our powers and the great unknown will open up to us. No, Courtney, no. Help me to pierce the veil into that mystic world. We could travel on wings, Laura. Together Courtney, we could... you're mad. Let me go. Courtney, please let go of my arm. I'm afraid of you. Laura. I'm afraid of you. I never want to see you again. I hate you. I don't hate Let me talk to you. Laura, remember you gave your promise to come when I tapped upon the window for you. Laura! Laura, where are you? She's gone. But she'll come back. She'll come back. I ran away to New York and tried to forget Courtney. When I met Jim Ralston, suddenly everything has changed. I forgot Courtney completely in my love for Jim. We were married, Jim and I. And for almost two years, I was divinely happy. Then came the night I heard the tapping on my window. And I was sure that Courtney was sounding his message for me. The next morning, Jim tried to convince me that the tapping was a nightmare. Laura, let's not talk about that tapping anymore. Eat your breakfast. I... I don't want anything, Jim. Darling, you must eat. Come now, make an effort. Here, have some fruit. All right, Jim. I'll try. Oh, by the way, darling, remember that artist by the name of Courtney Lang you used to know in California? Why? Why do you speak of him? Well, there's an article in the morning paper about him. Yes? He died last night. Uh, Well, Laura, what's the matter? Courtney's dead. That's what the tapping meant. I knew. Let me see the paper, Jim. Yeah. Well, darling, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Courtney Lang, well-known artist, died in an automobile accident near his Los Angeles home last night at 11 o'clock. Jim, that was 2 o'clock New York time. That's right. It was Courtney then. He tapped for me. I knew I would have sworn my life upon it. Laura, get hold of yourself. After all, you haven't seen Courtney Lang for years. You told me that was all over. You won't let me go, Jim. Laura, I'm going to call Dr. Simmons. No, please. I'm all right now. Really. (laughs) 
Hello? Hello, Laura. Yes? This is Florence Whitby, Laura. Do you remember me? We used to know each other on the coast. Oh, yes, I remember. I, I just read about Courtney. Isn't it tragic? Yes, tragic. Oh, I know how close you were to him once, Laura, so I was wondering if you'd like to go to the exhibition with me today. Exhibition? Yes. Courtney's works are on exhibition at the Dykeman Galleries. I'd like to come. Um, well, suppose I meet you at the gallery at 2.30, hmm? Yes, at 2.30. I'll be there. The gallery was a haunted place. Courtney looked down upon me from every frame upon the wall. I could feel his presence all around me. His spirit reaching out for mine. Florence. Yes, Laura? When did you last see Courtney? Oh, about two weeks ago. He often look up, look you up here. He... Well, I suppose you know that he never got over you, Laura. Yes, I know. Oh, you should never have left him, Laura. He was lost and unhappy without you. He never gave up hope that you'd come back. I know that. Did he know that I'd married Jim Ralston? Yes, he knew. But that didn't seem to make any difference. He said there was a bond between you that nothing could break. A bond stronger than marriage or even death. He... Oh, look, Laura. They're giving your portrait star Billy. My portrait? Where? Where is it? Oh, Marco. Come with me. I want to see it. Oh, of course. Oh, this portrait was by far the best thing Courtney ever did, Laura. Yes, I remember every line of it. Every shadow. The eyes. Mm, the eyes are strange, but somehow rather beautiful. They're horrible and ugly. But, but they're real. They're my eyes, Florence. Look at me. Those eyes in the portrait are just like mine, aren't they? Well, I don't know, perhaps. Yes, they are. I know they are. Courtney was right. He alone could see me as I really am. Oh, Courtney, I, I want to come back to you. I'm Laura. Laura, come, Laura. We'd better go. I want to be with you, Courtney. I was wrong to run away. I belong with you. No one else can ever reach me. I understand. Let me come to you, Courtney. Call me back. Come away. Courtney. Heaven's name, Laura. People are staring. Send your message, Courtney. I'll come this time. I'll keep my promise, Courtney. God. God. Courtney. Oh, miss. Oh, help me, please. This lady's home. Courtney. Courtney. Courtney, call me back. Courtney. <laughs> Give me your key, Laura. I'll open the door. Here. Are you sure you don't want me to stay with you till Jim comes home? No. I'm all right, Florence. Oh. Well, go to bed and try to rest. Oh, I wish you'd let me call a doctor. No. No, thank you. I'm all right. Goodbye, then. I'll call you in the morning. Yes. Goodbye. The door closed. And I was alone. I remember the thought that immediately took possession of me. I was alone, and now I had to face things as they were. I'd been a fool. All those years when I tried to live a normal life... Loving Jim, hoping he'd never discover the truth. I'd been a fool. Yet I thought, I must have known that one day Courtney would find me and take me away. And I felt myself sinking deeper and deeper into his grasp. That's Courtney now. He's calling to me and I must go. I promised. I'm coming, Courtney. I'm coming. I'll climb up on the sill and, and open up the window. Wait, Courtney. Wait. Get the window open, Courtney. Wait. Wait for me. Wait. Wait for me. Uh, Laura, what are you doing? I can't get the window open, Jim. Help me. Laura, get down. Oh, no, he's out there. Courtney, he, he tapped on me. There. You heard it, Jim. You heard it. The tapping. It's Courtney. Laura. Jim, let me go. You can't hold me any longer. Courtney, come for me. I've got to go to him. Courtney, I want to come to you, but Jim won't let me. Laura, Laura listen to me. <laughs> I'm going to open the window now, and we'll look out together. <laughs> Open the window. There. Do you see Courtney out there, Laura? Courtney? Who are 
you, Courtney? He isn't there, Laura. He never was. Yes, yes, he was. He tapped. No. Look, this is what caused the tapping. Take a good look, Laura. Uh, it, it's an aerial. Yes, an ordinary aerial with two clamps on the end of it. When the wind was strong enough, it blew the aerial against our window and caused a tapping. Like this. An aerial? The wind was strong last night and again this afternoon. There, see for yourself. The wind is blowing now. Look. And so, all the fears of the past that had been walled up inside me, the tappings on the window that to me had been living ghosts, were suddenly melted away into nothingness. The next morning, Jim and I were on the plane bound for Mexico City. I don't know how Jim managed it, but he did. During the flight, Jim was very quiet, almost despondent. But now I understand the reason for that. Jim had his own fears. This morning at breakfast, he asked me... Laura, you're feeling much better since we arrived here, aren't you? Yes, Jim. Much, much better. Then may I ask you something? Of course, Jim, anything. Did you and I make this trip alone, Laura? Yes, Jim. Just you and I. And that's the way it's going to be from here on in. And caught me lying? Jim, I've discovered something. The ghost of Courtney Lang was a living ghost. It's gone now. Courtney is dead. His strong spirit has found its place at last. Out there somewhere in the great unknown he loved. You'll find his peace there, Tim. I know you will. Laura. Come here, darling. I want to kiss you. No. No, stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward silently, swiftly. This is the haunting hour. The hand of Mr. Smith. Midnight, an alleyway, dark and ominously quiet, in the dimly lighted factory district on the outskirts of a big city. In the black shadows, two men wait, their hats pulled down over their eyes, their hands tense in their overcoat pockets. Suddenly, one of the men leans forward into the velvet darkness to peer down the deserted street. I, I don't see him, Russ. He'll be along. I can hardly wait to get my hands on that dough. Yeah. Hey, look, Russ. My hands. The way they're shaking. Take it easy, Tiny. <laughs> it's funny. Every time I wait to stick up a guy, my mitts get shaking like this. You'll keep them paws under control. Oh, sure, sure. I'm not kidding. Oh, I won't do nothing. I won't touch the guy. Remember that. But why don't he come, right? Get back here. But where is he? I can see the factory door, but he ain't come out yet. Get back here, I said. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> the car's coming. Cop. Huh? Police car. A couple of lousy cops. Shut up. Well, maybe they'll spot our car. Maybe they'll stop and start looking around. I said shut up. Oh, look, they're going by. They ain't stopping. Stand still. Uh, they turned the corner. Oh, that's better. Gee, now my hands are shaking worse than ever. I told you to keep them big paws quiet. I'm trying to, Russ. I guy can't do more than that. I'll do it. When this cashier comes along, keep your hands in your pocket, and you won't be tempted. I'll remember. I won't touch him, Russ. Here he comes. Are you sure? 
That's him. He's all alone. He just came out of the factory. He's carrying some paper bag. He's got the dough in a paper bag. Uh, this is one trip to the bank he ain't never gonna finish. Steady now. Uh, okay, mister, get him up. Well, uh, who are you? Get him up, the man said. Take the bag, Tiny. Don't shoot. I, I won't yell. <laughs> he won't yell, he says. Take that bag, Tiny, you sap. I don't like this guy. Keep your hands down, Tiny. Give me that bag. Sure. I, I said I would. How much is in here? $3,000. 3000 Look at you, punk. Stop. Get go of me. Stop it out, Tiny. Yes. But only 3000 he said. Stop. <laughs> Joking. I don't like <laughs> you. Go away, him, Tiny. But I don't like him. <laughs> he looks like that guy in the big house. I give you the money. Yeah, and I'm giving you something. Stop, Tiny. Let's go around like you're cold. Yeah, this guy won't stand still. Stop him. Let's go. Okay. Okay. I'll let him go. You killed him. Huh? You killed him, you sap. He's dead. But he looked just like that guy that slugged me. Get in the car. We're going to leave him here? Get in the car, I said. Where's the door? I got it. Get in. Move. Address him laying there. Suppose them cops come back. Shut the door. We're getting out of here. Hey, Russ, where are we going? This ain't the way to the apartment. We're not going to the apartment. Oh, why not? I told Claire I'd bring the money home tonight. Keep watching that rearview mirror. There ain't no cops on our trail. But where are we going, We're right? in this car, you dope. Oh, yeah. Sure, we don't need this hot jalopy no more tonight. I thought I told you to keep your hands off that cashier. Oh, now listen, we Russ. We had I... this stick up in the bag, but you had to go and scrag the guy. I didn't mean to kill him, but there was something about him. Once I got my mitts on his throat... I know, you can't make those big paws behave. I'm sorry, Russ. I had my rod on him. All you had to do was take the bag, get in the car while I knocked him cold, and we had smooth sailing. I said I was sorry, Russ. You're always sorry. But look. Look, we got the three grand, didn't we? We're in the clear. Nobody saw us. Nobody heard us. What do you mean, us? I didn't kill him. Hey. What's the matter? Back there. I think a power car just turned the corner. Well, is it? Uh, no. That ain't no power car. Just a black sedan like this one. They pulled up the curb. We'll turn off at the next corner, Brain. Plenty deserted around here. Why don't we stop here? Go on a little further along where it's darker. Yeah, Claire's going to wonder what's happened. I said I'd be at the apartment by half past 12. Well, no, soon enough. Yeah. <laughs> Wait till I show her the three grand we got. Uh, Wait till she hears about the murder. Oh, I won't tell her tonight. No, she can read it in the morning papers. Yeah. Hey, you know, we're getting kind of far out of town. When are we going to stop? Right here. I'll go off the road. Leave her here. Yeah, that's a good spot. <laughs> Not even a house in sight. Uh, give me your gun, Tiny. My gun? Your gat. Give it to me. Well, but what for? To keep you out of trouble. Ah, oh, now listen, Russ. Now, we're I... leaving this car. We're walking to the nearest bus line. If there's a cop on the bus and he looks at you twice, you're going to start shooting some uh, hand over your rug. Okay, here it is. That's better. And now, Tiny, give me the money. Huh? The paper bag with the money. Hand it over. Uh, what is this? Give me the money, Tiny. <sighs> oh, sure. Here it is. Come on, now let's get out of this car. Sit still. Eh? You're staying here. Wait, wait, hey, wait a minute. Keep those hands quiet. Hey, Russ, watch that gun. You're pointing it right at me. You said it. I'm washed up with you, and so is Claire. What? It? Claire? Yeah, Claire, your wife. She's fed up to the teeth, so am I. You and Claire... Oh, so that's why you didn't drive the apartment. That's why you came way out here. You and Claire are crossing me up. I... You're figuring I'm bumping me off? That's right. Give me that gun. You bet I will. Oh, <laughs> oh Russ, I'll get you for this. I'll get Claire and you if I have to dig my way out of my own grave. Beat it, Russ. 
We've got to pack up and beat it out of here tonight. What, at 2 o'clock in the morning? Not on your life. We're staying here until this whole thing blows over. But that cashier, maybe the cops have found him already. They're bound to find him soon. They're bound to find Tiny. What well, of it, Claire? They can't connect it up with you and me. I'm scared, Russ. Suppose Tiny wasn't dead. Suppose he drove the car back here to the apartment somehow. <laughs> you must believe in ghosts. He said he'd get us, didn't he? He said he'd get us if he had to dig his way out of his own grave. Oh, I shouldn't have told you that. Come on, let's get out of here. Nothing doing, Claire. We're staying right here. Come on, baby, unlock the trunk. The trunk? Sure, we'll hide the dough in your trunk until this whole thing blows over. Come on, honey, unlock it. It is unlocked. Yeah, this, this lid is kind of rusty, huh? There we are. I'll shove this three grand under all these clothes. Those are tiny clothes. Oh, come on, relax, Claire. Now let me lock it. Hey! Come on, what's the matter? You've locked the trunk. Oh, sure. But Tiny has the only key. He always carries it with him. Well, what about it? We'll get another one. I'll have a new one made tomorrow. What was that? Sounded like glass breaking. It was here in the apartment somewhere. Maybe it wasn't. I'm sure it was. It sounded like it came from the bathroom. Well, let's find out. Wait a minute. What for? Have your gun ready. My gun? That window in the bathroom. Maybe Tiny climbed up the fire. Oh, will you forget Tiny? He's dead, I tell you. Come on. Let's find out what that noise was. There, you see? There's no one in the bathroom. The window's open. I closed it and locked it tonight before you and Tiny left. Oh, now listen, Claire. Look. Look, there on the window, sir. Well, what's the matter now? Blood. Blood on the window, sir. Yeah. And here, on the floor, more of it. I tell you, Tiny did come back. He drove that car back here, climbed the fire escape, and he's hiding here in the apartment waiting to kill us. Quiet, Claire, quiet. I'm getting out of here. Oh, no, you're not. You go find down the street at this time of night. Some cop will pick you up as sure as my name's Rogers. But that blood on the cell, on the floor, the window open. Oh, wait a second. Oh, there's stuff on the floor. This isn't blood. Of course it's blood. No, Claire, you're wrong. Look, 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 look. There, under the bathtub. What is it? A bottle. A little bottle of that stuff you paint your nails with. I kept that bottle on the window, sir. All right, okay. So the wind, uh, something blew it off. That's what we heard. This bottle breaking. That's what made the spots in here. Listen. Police car. Sounded like it. Come on, let him. Suppose they followed Tiny here. Suppose he drove the car back here. Will you stop talking about Tiny? Put out the lights. What for? Put out the lights, Claire. All right. Peek under this window shade and see where that police car is. Are they out front? Yeah. Yeah, they are. Two cops in front of the building. What are they doing? They're, they're looking at a car. What car? Black sedan, parked in front of the building. You said the car you used tonight was a black sedan. All right, there's a million black sedans in this country, Mike. But why are the cops looking at the one out front? Why are they putting their flashlights on the running board? Why are they looking inside? How do I know? Because Tiny drove it here. He isn't dead. You didn't kill him. He drove that car back here, climbed the fire escape, and he's in the apartment somewhere waiting to get it. Somebody at the door. Shh. What are you going to do? Okay, folks. Sorry to get you out of bed at this time in the morning. That's all right, officer. 
I'll go up and talk to this Weaver guy. Uh, maybe that uh, stuff on the running board ain't blood, it's huh? It's blood, all right. Good night. Good night, officer. Tiny. Now listen, Claire. Tiny didn't die. He drove the car back oh, here. Oh, I tell you, you're nuts. Tiny's dead. That car in front of the building only looks like the one I, I, I used tonight. Then how do you explain the blood on the running board? How do you explain the blood inside? I can't explain it. I can, because it's the car you shot Tiny in. He came back here. He's hiding in the apartment somewhere, waiting to kill us. He said he'd dig his way out of his own grave to get us. Oh, what a sap I was to tell you that. Let's get away, Russ. Let's beat it out of here. And leave that three grand locked in the trunk? Uh-uh. Why did you have to lock that trunk? I told you Tiny had the only key. And I told you I'd have another key made in the morning. I heard it. Somebody's out in the kitchen. Oh, don't be a sap. There's no one in this apartment but you and me. Then what was that noise? I don't know. Probably the cat knocked over something on the kitchen table. There he is again. I tell you, Tiny's here. And he's dead. He's dead. Do you hear me? In that car, two miles away. Wait. Where are you going? I'm going out in the kitchen. Don't leave me alone. I'm not leaving you alone. You're coming with me. Maybe you believe in ghosts. I don't. Come on. Look. Look, in the bedroom. Oh, uh, it, it can't be. That, that's impossible. I knew it. I knew he'd come back. But it can't be. It, it can't be tiny. We're seeing things. Why doesn't he say something? Why doesn't he do something? Why does he just lie there on the bed? I'm going in the bedroom. No. Don't go near. I'm going to get the key to that trunk. Don't touch him. Don't go near. But Tiny has the key. You told me i got to get it out of his pocket. We'll get the money and beat it. He's breathing. I... I can't look at him. All right. Steady now. I'll slip my hand in his pocket. I got it. I got the key. Hello, Russ. <gasps> Let go of my wrist. I said I'd come back, Russ. Let go of my wrist. Drop the key. Claire. Claire, get the gun out of my back pocket. A gun won't help you, Russ. You ought to know that now. You're breaking my wrist. Then drop the key on the bed. Okay, okay, I dropped it. That's my pal. Claire. Don't come near him, Claire. Take the key, Claire. Don't come near him, I tell you. Pick up the key. Come around on the other side of the bed and get it. Yes, Tiny. You've always been a good wife, Claire. Take the key. The money we got tonight belongs to you. Tiny, with this money we can all get away. Sure we can. Pick up the key. Don't be afraid. All right. I will. Now. Stop! Let go of me! Now we're all together again. Your hand is breaking my wrist. We're all together again. <laughs> you and me and Russ. Russ, why don't you do something? Yeah, Russ. Why don't you do something? I can't even move. <laughs> These big hands of mine, they're better than a gun. They can hold you two here. Maybe forever. Go on, monks. Push the buzzer again. Ah, no, no, Dora, it's only 8 o'clock in the morning. The Smiths don't get up this early. We'll get them up. I'm going to find out about this. I'm going back downstairs and finish my breakfast. You are not. You're the janitor of this building, and you're supposed to know what's going on with the tenants. Uh, that don't mean I gotta wake him up and ask some foolish questions. I want to know if the man we heard about on the radio is our Mr. Smith. It can't be. How do you know? Go on, go on. Push uh, the button. We've had enough trouble last night over to your sister's house. Why go looking for more? This ain't looking for trouble. If it was him, we gotta know sooner or later, and I want to know now. Uh, sure gotta be mad. I want to know, that's all. You never can tell the tenants. Who'd think that mild old Mr. Weaver was the kind to go out hunting wild animals? Ah, that's different. All right, all right. Stop the buzzer, monks. You've buzzed long enough to wake the dead. For crying out loud, Dora, this is a fine way to start the day. I have Try the door. Uh, I uh, the door, monks. Go on, try it. Maybe it's unlocked. All right. Hey. It is unlocked. Well, go on, open it. Go on in. Hey, I got the light. 
lights in the living room all turned on. I knew it. I tell you, there's something wrong with them smooth. <gasps> For crying out loud. Do you see what I see, Dora? Money. It's money laying all over the floor. They must have been storing that money in that trunk. Look, it's open. Some money inside of it, too. Well, the Schmidt's never had so much money. Mm, as far as we knew. Ah, there was always something fishy about them Smiths. And their friend, too, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. Hey, what are we going to do? <laughs> huh? What's that? Someone in the bedroom. It, it, it don't sound like Mr. Smith. No. No, that's not Mr. Smith. Well, come on, let's get out of here. Are you crazy? We're going to find out what's the matter here. We're going into that bedroom. No, 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 no. Be careful, Dora. There's no telling who it is. <laughs> wait, wait. Don't go no further. Wait. It's Mr. Rogers. Yeah. What in the world happened to him? Listen. Listen to what he's saying. Huh? That was Tiny's car. He came back. Oh, you must have seen Mr. Weaver's car outside with all the blood on it. You'd better tell that old gent that he's scared of the other tenants. None of our business if he wants to go off shooting wild animals. But to bring them home dripping blood, it's enough to scare the wits out of anyone. Blood dripping. It was Tiny's blood. Now, uh, 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 no, Mr. Rogers, that was deer blood. Mr. Weaver's upstairs went hunting yesterday. No, make them let me go. Make them take the cuffs off. Ah, uh, cuffs? I need that. Is. He clamped me to the bed. Ah, uh, you're not clamped to the bed, Mr. Rogers. Your sleeve's caught in the rod at the edge of the bed. Monks, look at his hair. He didn't have white hair when he was here yesterday. Uh, what happened, Mr. Rogers? What happened to you? Tiny did it. He put his hands around her throat. Tiny did it. Oh, <laughs> he's out of his head. Dora, it's, huh? it's true. <laughs> on the other side of the bed, Mrs. Smith. Oh. She's on the floor. Oh, maybe, maybe she's fainted. No. No, no, there's marks on her neck. Say, Roger, <laughs> cut the act. Maybe you killed her. Tiny did it. With his hands on her throat, make him get off the bed. Make him get off the bed and open these cups. Make him get off the bed. There's no one on the bed, Mr. Rogers. Don't lie to me. I can see him. He's right in front of me, lying on the bed. But, Mr. Rogers, the bed's empty. The spread hasn't even a wrinkle But I see him. I see him. It's tiny, I tell you. It couldn't be, Mr. Smith. Even if something was there, it couldn't be, Mr. Smith. It couldn't? No, he was killed. Police found him with four bullets in him. He was in a black sedan, they said. Uh, we heard it on the radio this morning. They found him dead about two miles from here. Yes, they described him on the radio, too. And we knew it was Mr. Smith. Uh, he died about half past twelve last night. Yeah, they, they said he had big hands. Like Mr. Smith. <laughs> but the funny thing is, he had a key in his hand. A key? Yes, Mr. Rogers, a trunk key. A little trunk key in one of his great big hands. <laughs> From shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination in the haunting hour. Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour.
in the dark. Midnight. Midnight in the metropolis. Town of a thousand moods and contrasts. Of wealth and lightness and laughter. Of poverty, heartbreak and tears. Of shadowy people and dark, dark things. Big city. Hard-boiled and tender. Weak and mean and cheap and great and proud and powerful. And the metropolis at midnight, filled with the high spirits of joy seekers, revelers who give way to the goodness of living or try to forget the badness of living. Midnight that is brooding, sinister. The sounds of the big city at midnight the squeaks and roars of taxicabs, the rumble of trucks, the moan of river boats, and underground, the subway, and under and above, the sounds of the people, shrill, ribald, futile. But there is quiet, too, in the teeming city at midnight, the quiet that is broken by the wail of a child the rattle of a snore, or, as in the home of Earl Breton, a par private detective, and his partner, Owen Bailey, called the professor. The telephone rings, and the professor answers it. Hello? Earl Breton? No, this is Mr. Bailey, Breton's partner. Who's calling? This is Bill Henderson. Is Earl there? Uh, just a moment. It's Bill Henderson, Earl. You want to talk to him? Bill Henderson? What does that crooked politician want? Sounds very anxious. Well, that's too bad. Tell him I'm very busy. I got to go to sleep. Hello, Mr. Henderson. Yeah? I'm sorry, but Mr. Breton Listen is to not me, in. Bailey. If Earl doesn't talk to me, he may be responsible for my death. I can't possibly see how All that. Right, let me have the phone, Professor. Hello, Henderson. Is you, Earl? Yeah, what's on your mind? I got to see you right away, Earl. Can you meet me down at your office? Office hours are from 10 to 2, Henderson. You know that. I'll see you tomorrow. No, wait, Earl, wait. I tell you, you got to see me tonight. Now, look, I can't... Wait until tomorrow, because I may never get there tomorrow. How do you figure? I can't explain it on the phone, but I know what I'm talking about. i got to see you tonight. Got it. Uh, where are you now? I'm at my house. Okay. Give me a few minutes to get a cup of something warm. I'll meet you down to the office. Oh, thanks a million, Earl. Never mind the thanks. Bring some money with you. Don't worry about that, Earl. This is worth anything to me. Goodbye. What seems to be his trouble, Earl? Well, he's probably swindled one guy too many. Good. What do you mean, good? I mean he picked a good time for it. We can very well use the money, you know. Well, you can start drawing the bill now, Professor. And remember, after office hours, it's triple the usual. <laughs> Here comes the elevator now, Earl. If we ever make enough dough, Professor, remind me to move out of this broken-down building. All buildings are pretty much alike at this hour of night. How do they expect one old guy to take care of this whole thing by himself? He manages if you don't rush him. Yeah. What devil has got his finger on it? Oh, it's you, Mr. Britton. You'll never be known as a patient man. I hate waiting for elevators, old-timer. Good evening, Mr. Bailey. Good evening. You've got lots to do around here, haven't you? Sure, sure. I've got to make the rounds, you know. How's business? Oh, very slow, Mr. Breton. You're the only two people I've seen all night. Hey, it's pitch black out here, isn't it? You want me to put the hall lights on? Don't bother, old-timer. We'll make it. It might help if you throw your flashlight beam down the hall. Oh, sure thing. Uh, uh, how's this? That's fine. Here. 
I've got the key, Earl. Right. Ah, uh, thanks, old timer. We're okay now. Uh, I'll be seeing you on the way down. Now, if I can just find the switch. Uh, oh, here. What's the matter with the light? Looks like the switch don't work. Working all right when I left this evening. Where to find the desk lamp? Find it, Earl? Yeah, yeah. You didn't take the bulb out of this lamp, did you, Professor? Of course not. I've got an idea, Professor, that we have company. You're a very smart chap, Bretton. Who's that? Just stay where you are, both of you, and don't ask any questions. Mr. Breton knows that those lights are not out by accident, but if either of you makes a false move, there could be one. What are you looking for? Information. And why keep us in the dark? There's enough light for me from that street lamp shining in your window. I can see you both. What do you want to know? I understand, Breton, that you got some new dope on the Kennedy murder. Am I right? Kennedy murder? Why, the police gave Kennedy up as a suicide five years ago. What would I be... Stay where you are, Breton. I told you I can see. Yeah, yeah, sure. Seems kind of... Yeah, I guess our visit is a little touchy, Professor. You didn't believe that I could see you. Next time, I won't miss. Now, give it to me straight. I told you I don't like the smell of a body that's been buried five years, and I ain't digging it up. Now, what else do you want? Mr. Breton, are you in there? Don't make a move. Mr. Breton, Mr. Bailey, uh, whatever happened to you... <laughs> okay, I hope you get a big kick out of beating up a helpless old guy. That was very tough. Very. Duck, Professor, I've got a... What happened, Earl? Where are you? Right over here where that voice was coming from, and he's not here. Maybe he moved over to another corner of the room. Duck behind something, Professor. I'm going to light a match. <laughs> Careful now, Earl. Well, I'll be there's nobody here. Who, who's that lying in the doorway? Wait a minute. Looks like the old timer. Here's his flashlight. I'll turn it on. Yeah. Put him in this chair, Earl. No, no, it's too late, Professor. He's dead. He is. That dirty rat killing a sweet, harmless old man. Wait, well, what's this here on the floor? Let me see. Hotel it. key. Ah, Hotel Markham, room 517. Think that fell out of the old man's pocket? No, no, that's a mobster's hotel. It's full of gamblers and racket men. Then that means if we go to room 517, we ought to be able to find out the man who did this. You don't find anybody in that hotel. You smoke them out. Besides, that key might have been stolen just so somebody could plant it here. Don't you see that? Then how are we going to know? The voice, Professor. I'll never forget that voice. I'm promising the old man now that I'll find it. Well, what do we do, Oil? You go find Henderson and tell him we won't be able to see him tonight. I'm going to the Hotel Markham. Meet me there as soon as you're through, in front of the hotel. And what about the old man? On our way out, we'll ring the night alarm. That'll bring the police. But aren't we going to tell them what happened? Right now, Professor, we don't know any more than they do. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Anything I can do? Oh, hello, Breton. How's the hotel business? Oh, we don't complain. Uh-huh. Uh, who's up in room 517? Who wants to know? I understand there's a game going on. So? So, I'd like to get in. Well, there's a gentleman by the name of Sparrow who entered the room. Maybe you know him. That's all I wanted to hear. You can tell my good friend, Mr. Sparrow, I'm coming right up. Don't worry. I will. Oh. Uh, by the way, I hear there's a shortage of keys. You still lose many of them? Certainly we do. Every day. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Well, look who's here, fellas. My old pal, Earl Breton. How are you, Sparrow? Fine, fine. Come on in. How's the game? Pretty good. You want to take a hand? Yeah, maybe. How long have you been playing? Oh, about 12 hours. Now, meet the boys. 
Hi, fellas. This is Dan Huber. He's new in this town. Yeah? Didn't take you long to find this place, did it, Dan? Me? I got a nose for this stuff. <laughs> and you know Harry Jackson, Earl, don't you? Sure, I know Harry. How are you, Harry? Fine. What did you say, Harry? I said I'm fine. That's what I said. Ah, uh -huh, sure. Now, this is Willie Garvin, and over well, here... Oh, that's a funny name, Willie. What's funny about it? How do you spell it? G-A-R-B-I-N. Why? Does it sound familiar? Uh, no, uh, Willie, no. And I don't have to introduce you to my partner, Joe Murray, huh? Hello, Joe. Hello. Funny to find you and Sparrow in the same game, Joe. What's funny about that? <laughs> well, after all, you and Sparrow are partners, aren't you? Nobody said for you, Breton, and if you don't like what goes on here, you can shove off. Come Get on, it? Earl. When are you going to stop burning up Joe? <laughs> Anyhow, he just came in a few minutes ago. So we really just started playing together. Oh, just came in a few minutes ago. Where were you, Joe? Since when do I report to you? Well, I'm just curious, that's all. I told you before, Breton, I don't like coppers, and that still goes. Now, let's get the game going. Well, Earl, you taking a hand? Sure, sure, but uh, first I got to get the professor. He's got my dough. I'll be back in a few Wait minutes. a minute, Breton. What are you trying to pull? Why didn't you bring your dough in the first place? I just wanted to see who was in the game. Oh, sure, Joey's got a right to know. Go ahead, Earl, get your dough. Oh, but uh, don't forget to come back, huh? Otherwise, it wouldn't look so good, huh? Sure, don't worry. I'll be back. Earl, I'm over here. Oh. How long have you been waiting, Professor? Uh, I just got here. Did you find out anything? No, oh, not a thing. I listened to every voice up there. Not one of them was the right one. How about you? Did you see Henderson? Yeah, that is, I didn't see him, but I found out about him. What do you mean, found out about him? Well, when I got there, Earl, there were a lot of people outside the house, and the police were there. Police? What happened? Henderson was murdered. It was midnight when the phone rang in the home of Earl Breton, a private detective. A man named Henderson was calling. Henderson, a crooked politician who insisted he was in danger of being killed, and that he had to see Breton immediately. Earl agreed to meet him in his office, but when he and his partner, the professor, arrived a few minutes later, they were faced with a peculiar situation. The lights in the office wouldn't work. And before they could investigate, a voice challenged them from the darkness. Their unknown visitor fired at them, purposely missing, in order to warn them that he meant business. The sound of the gun attracted the attention of the night watchman. He came to investigate and was killed by the intruder, who disappeared, leaving Earl with the old man's body and a clue. The key to room 517 at the Hotel Markham. They rang the police alarm, and Earl sent the professor to intercept Henderson to break the appointment they had with him. Then he went to the hotel, to room 517, where he expected to find the killer. He interrupted a card game, but Spiro, the gangster who was registered in 517, invited Earl to sit in, much to the displeasure of his partner, Joe Murray. Breton accepted, promising to return soon. He went down to the street where the professor was waiting. The professor had news for him. Henderson had been murdered. How did you find out he was murdered, Professor? I overheard two policemen talking to one another. Did the cops know you were there? Oh, no. We wouldn't want them to know we was interested, would we? Good for you, Professor. But now that I think of it, Earl, shouldn't we tell the police what we know? Well, that's a good idea, except that we don't know anything. They can't find out for themselves. But they don't know that Henderson called us to meet him at the office. And then when we got there, we met somebody else. And it was that somebody else who killed the night watchman. I know there's some connection between those two things, Professor. In fact, if I didn't know Henderson's voice so well... You'd say that it was the man at the office who imitated it? Sure, that's an old trick. A man disguises his voice to sound like... Hey, 
Just a minute, Professor. Why couldn't it be... You mean you actually think that the man we met in the office was the one who called us earlier and he imitated Henderson's voice? No, no, no. That'd be too obvious. The killer's much cleverer than that. But you do think he had something to do with both of the murders? Certainly. If he didn't, how would he know that we were coming down to the office at midnight? He was expecting us. So he must have been with Henderson at the time Henderson called us. If you don't mind my saying so, Earl, it doesn't make sense. Why should this man have bothered to come down to our office just to ask us about some murder case that was over and forgotten five years ago? That's just it, Professor. He didn't want that information at all. That was just to throw us off the track. That was why he left the key there when he slugged the old man and disappeared. You mean he actually wanted us to follow him here to the Hotel Markham? Don't you see he was trying to establish the alibi that he was playing cards in this hotel at the time of the murder? And he could force us to testify as police witnesses that we saw him here. Then why don't we tell that to the police? Oh, Professor, you're slipping. You know the police don't want ideas. They've got their own. Besides, if we don't know whose voice we heard, what can we tell them? Well, at least we can tell them that it was somebody who's up in that hotel room now. Sure, sure. But can we prove it? Uh, I guess not. Well, then what can we do? We've got to go upstairs and find out who that phony voice belongs to. But, oh, life can be very short in a place like this. I mean, I'm not thinking about me. I know, Professor, I know. But I made a promise to that old watchman that I'd find the guy who killed him, and I like to keep a promise. But, uh, we ain't got enough money to play cards with those people. They don't know that. Well, I don't think it should take them more than one hand to find out. All right, then you'll have to stall. Now, one of those guys up there has a phony British voice. So? Uh, listen. Stay where you are, Breton. I told you, I can see. How's that? If I wasn't looking at you, I'd swear it was the guy in the room. Good, good. That's all I wanted to know. I knew you'd keep your promise to come back, Earl. Oh, why not? This is my night, Sparrow. Well, come on, take a chair. I think I'll let the professor play for me. I do much better when I'm looking over his shoulder. Suit yourself. Let's get going. You're holding up the game. How many chips, Professor? Oh, well, uh, uh, that's up to Earl. Chips? Why, um, uh, what do you say we start off with $10 worth, Professor? I got a hunch. I, um, I guess that's all right. Wait a minute. Who are you kidding, Breton? Since when do you figure you can get in on this game for 10 bucks? That's just a starter, Joe. I always like to play hunches. But you've got more than that, haven't you, Earl? <laughs> you know better than to ask me that, Sparrow. Yeah? We'll see. Okay, deal him out. Joe, if I didn't know that you just came into this game a little while ago, I'd figure that you were losing plenty. Why? Ah, oh, you're so touchy. I open. Five bucks. Uh, raise your ten. I'm out. Well, playing it safe, Professor. I'd rather not explain my game. Maybe if Joe played it safer, he wouldn't be so worried all the time. Oh, Joe. Joe's got lots on his mind. I don't know, Sparrow. You're Joe's partner. You never seem to worry like he does. What do you mean, worry? Who says I'm worried? I'm just careful, that's all. I don't trust nobody, see? Nobody? You mean not even Sparrow, your own partner? I said nobody. Oh, Joe thinks maybe I talk too much. That's huh? right. I didn't hear you say anything out of place, Sparrow. <laughs> he thinks I made a mistake telling you he, he just came into the game a little while ago. I told you to shut up, Sparrow. Oh, come on, Joe. You don't have to be afraid of Earl Breton. He's a cop, and I told you don't have to know nothing. He wouldn't repeat anything he heard up here, would you, Earl? I always play it safe. <laughs> I think you're all right, Earl. Uh, mind if I stand up? Where you going? I just want to walk around a little bit, stretch my legs. Uh, just don't go looking at any hands. Okay. I'll stand over here by the wall. You're going to let the professor play by himself? Sure. Hey, this is a very interesting electric light switch. You guys don't cut the chatter or blow this game off. Hey, hey wait a minute. Who put those lights out? Put the lights on. What are you getting so crazy about, Joe? You act as if you just murdered someone. Put up the lights. I said quick. I'm sorry, Joe. That was my mistake. I didn't know the light switched off this way. Shut up. And you, Sparrow. What was the idea saying I murdered someone? What are you talking about, Joe? I didn't say anything. Don't give me that stuff. I heard you. You can't fool me with that phony voice you put on. I told you I didn't say anything. Oh, yeah? Well, I happen to know that nobody else but you talks that way. Cut it, you dope. Didn't you know that wasn't my voice? 
Sparrow, if you're trying to pull anything... Okay, okay, Joe. Sparrow's right. Now, don't get sore. It was my fault. I didn't know. That ain't the point, Breton. I want to know what he's trying to pull. And it ain't none of your business, copper. I just wanted to tell you I'm sorry. It was my voice you heard, Joe. What? Why, you... All right, what's the game, Brett? No game, Joe. Just a joke, that's all. Sure, Joe, just a joke. Very funny, too. Can't you take a joke, Joe? Ah, uh, nuts. All right, Breton. You want to stay in this game, get up some real dough or beat it? Okay, okay, I'll come clean with you. That's all the dough we got with us right now. If you let me go in the next room and make a call, I'll get some sent up here right away. Sure, sure. You want to use the phone, huh? Yes, it's right in the next room. Thanks, Sparrow. This is the desk. Hello. Get me Spring 7 3 100. Spring 7 3 100? Right. Who are you kidding? That's police headquarters. Say, have you got any complaints to make? Hold on there. Hey, hey wait a minute. What goes on here? Here's one of your keys. Oh, hello, Sparrow. I, uh, I can't say much for your phone service. No? What's the matter with it? They, uh, they wouldn't get a number for me. I see. Who well, you're calling is so important. The police. I, uh, I guess I can wait. Well, say, I'm glad you came in here, Breton. I, uh, wanted to have a little talk with you. Alone. You wouldn't use that revolver right here in this room, would you? Wouldn't I? You know, I can do pretty much as I want to in this hotel. You know that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. But if you killed me now, wouldn't you have to tell Joe why you did it? Well, what do you mean? I mean, wouldn't you have to tell him that you were tired of being partners with him and Henderson? That you wanted the whole racket for yourself? So that you killed Henderson, trying to make it look as though Joe did it so he could take the rap? <laughs> yeah, if you're trying to talk loud so Joe will hear you, I might as well tell you he just left. Ah. Uh. Well, at least I found out it was you who slugged the night watchman in my building tonight. So what? Just that you killed him, that's all. Mm, you shouldn't have gotten away. Then you're admitting that you killed Henderson and the watchman. Only to you, Breton, to make sure that you'll never be able to tell it to the cops. Think. I don't have to tell him, Sparrow. They know about it already. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you gave him all this information before you came up here. No, I didn't tell him. You did. You know something, Breton? I'm beginning to think you're a little bit nuts. I suppose you wouldn't believe me if I told you the police are listening to you right now? They heard you admit all this to me? Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't tell me you hit them in my closet. No, no. But they're right outside in that room where we were just playing cards. You're crazy. Why don't you take a look? Because I ain't dumb enough to turn my back on you. Then that makes it easy for them to come in. Drop the gun, Sparrow. Give it here. What? It is the cop's... We heard the whole thing outside, Breton. Pretty smart. But how did you get the cops up here? I didn't get them, Sparrow. You did. Cut it out, Breton! It's true. You know the best way to bring the police is to leave a hotel key next to a dead man, and that's what you did. Yeah, but you picked it up. Not me. I just made a mental note of it, that's all. What puzzles me, Earl, is how you know the police were out here when you made Sparrow talk. Ah, oh, that was easy. When I tried to put through a call before, I heard a voice at the switchboard asking about a key. And I just played a hunch. Yeah, I'm glad we got here in time. Come along, Sparrow. Well, Professor, let's go home. Yes, sir. Oh, and look, if our phone rings again tonight, mm -hmm. don't answer.
shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubt and fear. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. break the stillness of this moment, for this is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. on East 67th Street in New York was no exception. Its rooms had seen the births and deaths of seven generations of Thatchers. Now they looked down with despair upon the three people living within its walls. Evans Thatcher III, his son Kendall, Kendall's lovely wife Margaret. For evil and hatred stalked the rooms and took you by the throat when you entered the house. Light and hidden, but sinister. Present so strongly that you felt you could reach out and touch it. Margaret, come in, my dear. I've been waiting for you. Oh, I, I didn't know you were home. Aren't you forgetting something, my dear? I didn't know you were home, father. That's much better, Margaret. I only ask that you behave as any daughter should to a father-in-law. Where's Kendall, father? My dear, Kendall is only my son, but he's your husband. I'm surprised you should ask me his whereabouts. Most wives All in my right. Things, sir. All right, Kendall isn't home. Let's stop asking. My dear child, I've never acted with you. It is you who pretends to like me. I take little pains to conceal my dislike. I hate you. I hate you more than I believed I could ever hate another human being. And if it weren't for Kendall, Why I... don't you divorce Kendall, my dear? I'd gladly pay for it. Kendall isn't the proper husband for you. You should have married the strong young detective. There was a suitable match for you. By the way, what was his name? 
Walters. Larry Walters. Oh, yeah. I remember the name first. Father. And I didn't marry him because I was in love with Kendall. Oh, come now, my dear. We both know the truth. You could hardly marry a representative of law and order if you told him the truth about yourself. But after tonight, why, I imagine that difficulty should be solved. Oh, you are completely vile. But there's one thing you've never understood. A mind like yours can't understand it. I love Kendall more than I hate you. And I'm not going to leave him alone with you so that you can ruin him completely. Too bad that you can't afford to move out of my house into an apartment of your own, isn't it? I'm sure that if Kendall could get a job and support you, you'd be deliriously happy. Yes, I would. But you've taken good care to see that Kendall is too weak to go out in the world, haven't you? Now, my dear Margaret... Don't think uh... I don't know what you're doing. You've hated Kendall since the day he was born and deliberately set out to ruin him by, by giving him everything he wanted. You've made Kendall so completely dependent upon you that he's afraid to leave. You've pampered him so that he's fit for nothing. You're insane. No, I'm not. I'm perfectly sane. I'm willing to stay here and fight you till I've made a man out of Kendall. We both walk out of this house together with our heads up. And I'll see you both dead and rotting first. Oh, good evening, Kendall. Did you take my message to the club? Yes, Father. Uh, Mr. Ainsley said there was no reply. Oh. Hello, Margaret. Hello, darling. Well, aren't you even going to kiss me? I haven't seen you since this morning. You bet I am. Nonsense, Kendall. Stop acting as if you were a newlywed instead of behaving like a man who's been married a whole year. Well, my mother and father were married 22 years, and he kissed her every night when he came home. There. You see, Father, kissing your wife Kendall, and... come along upstairs. I want to talk to you. My dear Margaret, you'd better change. We're dining with some friends of mine. But Kendall and I had planned to eat home tonight, Father. Did you? I didn't. I don't very well see how you can. I left instructions that there was to be no marketing today and gave the servants the night off. Are you coming, Kendall? I, uh, yes, Father. I'll, I'll see you later, Martha. I hate you, Evan Thatcher. I hate you. I wish you were dead. Is that you? Margaret, what is it? What's the matter? Larry, I've got to see you. you I... Foolish, foolish child. I, oh, I, I must have a wrong number. No, you haven't, Margaret. You're in trouble. I, I'll be right over. No, no, you mustn't. You mustn't. Goodbye. Well, are we all ready? Margaret, you look beautiful in that dress. I'm afraid that the dress will have to go back, Kendall. But, Father, why? You said yourself... I changed my mind. I will not pay for it. I don't want you to pay for it. I didn't ask you to buy it. Oh, Kendall. Kendall, can't you see what he's doing to us? I don't want him to pay for anything of mine ever. Kendall, please. Please, let's get out of this house now. Margaret is hysterical, Kendall. She doesn't know what she's saying. She's just done something very stupid and childish, for which I'm afraid I must punish you, Kendall. No. No, I'm not going to stand by and see this again. You're not Come going here, to... Kendall. I'm sorry, Father, really. I'm sorry. I mean it. I'll never do it's it again. It's a little late for that, my dear. Come here, Kendall. You can have the telephone taken out, I promise. Please don't hit Kendall. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> It was thoughtful of you to telephone, let me know you were coming. It enabled me to open the door myself. I don't like to let the servants know that I have detectives calling out. Oh, you don't like detectives, Mr. Thatcher? Not in my house. As a matter of fact, though, I've been expecting a call from you for a few days now, ever since Margaret was so foolish as to telephone you the other night. As a matter of fact, Mr. Thatcher, that's just the reason for my visit. Margaret didn't sound at all well to me. Very observant of you, Mr. Walters. Margaret isn't well. She's a neurotic. That's funny. When I knew her, she was a perfectly healthy young lady. Perhaps. But now she's definitely neurotic. 
Then, of course, you've put her under the care of a physician. I dislike your attitude very much. Are you implying that my son and I aren't treating Margaret properly? Because if you are, you can get out now. Actually, you have no right in this house. I received you because I wanted to show you that there was no reason for Margaret's call to you the other night. Now I shall let you see Margaret. You can hear from her own lips what I've been telling you. Yeah, I'd like to see her. If you'll excuse me, I'll go up and bring her down myself. Thanks. I uh, won't offer you a drink. However, the radio is over there. If you wish to turn it on, it may help you pass the time. music to bring you a special bulletin. Dandy Jim Carey broke out of the death house a little over four hours ago. Holy mackerel. With only two days before his execution, Dandy Jim became the first prisoner ever to escape from the death house. The police have thrown a dragnet all over the country and promise a speedy arrest. Keep tuned to this station for further details. Here he is, Margaret. Uh, Please tell him how you feel. Hello, Margaret. Hello, Larry. I I don't know what was the matter with me. I I was just upset and nervous. That's why I called you, Larry. Yeah, that's what Mr. Thatcher told me. Now, look here, Walters. I've stood for a lot from you because you were a friend of Margaret's. But I'm telling you I'm not going to stand for any more insinuation. It won't do either Margaret or Kendall any good at all. Remember that, Margaret. I'm not insinuating anything, Mr. Thatcher, but I'm not a fool. I know darn well that Margaret called me for some reason. And I don't believe a word of what you're saying. All right. You've succeeded in making me do something that's very painful both to me and Margaret. Please go, Larry. Please. I I don't need your help. I I don't want it. Don't worry, Margaret. I promise you that this won't affect Kendall at all. Now, Mr. Walters, here are the facts. Margaret's made a very good marriage. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Exactly. A girl in Margaret's position has no right to expect to marry my son. You see, Mr. Walters, my son was brought up with everything in the world he wanted. His for the asking. Margaret, on the other hand, had a much different life. Much different. You mean that she wasn't spoiled? That and other things. If I did spoil Kendall, Mr. Walters, it's only natural. When a child's mother dies at the birth of a child, and a man has to be both father and mother, his son is apt to be in doubt. Or hated. Have you ever heard of dandy Jim Carey, Mr. Walters? Of course. He's in the death house now, awaiting execution. You didn't know that he was Margaret's brother, did you? Oh. You see what your insinuations have made me do, Mr. Walton. Uh-huh. I see. But it may interest you to know that Dandy Jim escaped from the death house four hours ago. What? Thank heaven. I think that's your phone. I, I'll answer it. I uh, wouldn't dream of it, my dear. I'll go. Margaret, Margaret, why didn't you tell me? I can see you're in a jam. Let me help. I can't, Larry. Just leave me alone. It's best that way. Hello? Believe me. Hello. Hello, answer there. But, Margaret, I only want to help. Believe me. Evidently, a wrong number. Yeah. You seem to have a lot of them around this house. And now, Mr. Walters, I think there's nothing more for us to say to each other, so... Good uh... night. If you want me, Margaret. She'll know where to reach you. Good night, Mr. Walters. Now, my dear, we'll wait for the telephone to ring again. Only this time, when Mr. Walters isn't here, you will answer. No. No, I won't. I think you will. Won't you, my dear? I think you will. Won't you, my dear? Where's Kendall? I want Kendall. Kendall won't help you. He never will. Stop it! Stop! Stop! All you have to do is to pick up the telephone and say what I tell you. Well, you wouldn't want to disappoint your brother, would you? He desperately wants to get in touch with you. All right.
drama that was touching the lives of the people in the house on East 67th Street came swiftly to its violent conclusion. Evan Thatcher III was determined to dominate and rule his son, Kendall, at all costs. Hating his son from the day he was born, bringing him up a weakling by pampering him, he resented Kendall's marriage to Margaret Carey, a beautiful and strong-willed girl who is determined to break Evan Thatcher's hold over his son. Only Margaret had a brother, Dandy Jim Carey, who had escaped from the death house and is even now trying to get in touch with her while she sits on a bench in Central Park waiting anxiously for Kendall. Oh, Margaret, I'm sorry I'm late. I tried to get away, but Father... I know, darling. Sit down here right next to me on the bench. Oh, the park's beautiful at night, isn't it, Kendall? Mm. Gee, I look forward so much to sitting here quietly with you. It's the only time in the whole day that I'm happy. Do you think that's right, Kendall, darling? Huh? What do you mean? Well, that two people so much in love and and married should should live... Be only happy when they can sneak away from the house they live in to sit in the park and hold hands. Oh, Margaret. I know, I know. I'm, I'm no good. Why don't you leave me? Oh, stop saying that, Kendall. Don't you realize that's just what your father wants? I know, I know, but there is just nothing I can do about it. But there is. You're going to have to make a decision, my darling. You're going to have to come away with me. I, I want to. So, so much. But I'm, I'm scared. We'll, we'll starve, Margaret. Oh, we won't. I tell you, we won't. It's hopeless. Do, do you think that I could stand watching you work and support me? You wouldn't have to. You could go to work. I, I want to. But you know what happened when we tried it once before. Father saw to it that no one would hire me. And if I did get a job, he had me fired. No, we, we made a mistake. We'll have to leave New York. Where will we go? What difference does it make? We'll be together and... And we'll be happy. But you won't have anything. I, I don't care so much for myself, but I couldn't stand it for you. That's not true, Kendall. Do you mean I'm lying? Do you mean that I really don't want to go with you? I mean that you're afraid to face the facts. You have no reason to be afraid for me. I, I wasn't wealthy before I married you, and, and I wasn't unhappy. I am now. I won't be because I love you very much if we go away together. I don't care how little we have as long as we're people living together, supporting ourselves and and away from your father. Margaret, I will. We'll go away. We'll never see my father again. Oh, Kendall. Kendall, darling. Oh, when will we go, Kendall? Tomorrow? No, we... We'll have to make plans. Why? Your mind is made up, isn't it? Of course it is, but we can't just pack up and go like that. Why not? Well, there are... Well, there are things to do. We have to find a place to go, get the tickets. And... We'll go down to the station and get on the train. What difference does it make where we go? Well, we can't rush. We... Maybe... Oh. Oh. All right, Kendall, I... I, uh, I have an appointment now. With whom? Your father and my brother. I, uh, I don't suppose you want to come with me. No, no, uh, no, no, I, I, uh, I think it's better if I stay out of this. Yes, Kendall. I guess I have to face it. I, uh, think it's better if I stay out of your life, too. Permanently. Margaret. Yes, Kendall. I love you very much, but you'll never break away from your father. As he told me, he's done too good a job. Well, you talk as if father were deliberately trying to... You don't see it. You'll never see it. Goodbye, Kendall. Margaret, wait. Wait. Come in, Margaret, my dear. It's cozy in here. Why did you make me tell Jim to meet us here? 
It's an ideal place, my dear. Who would ever think of looking for an escaped murderer in the Castle Chess Club? Are you going to help him get away? The question is premature, my dear. This reunion between beautiful sister and doomed brother appeals to my sense of the dramatic. That is why I brought you to the Castle Club tonight. I hope you realize the honor I've conferred upon you. The first woman ever to set foot in the Castle Chess Club. That was your idea, wasn't it? You're the president of the club, and you made them put that rule into effect. Why, yes, my dear. Now that you mention it, it was. You see, I I don't believe that a chess club is any place for a woman. That isn't the real reason. You hate women. You've hated us all ever since your wife died. And that's why you hate the son you think caused her death. Shout. Silence. Shouting doesn't change anything. I'm right. That's the explanation for you. And everything you've done. You're impudent. And you should pay for it. I don't care. I... I'll do anything you want if you'll only help Jim get away. Do you realize, Margaret, that you're asking me to break the law? Aiding an escaped criminal? Stop it. I know all about you. How do you think I met Kendall? It was through Jim, of course. I knew that you were the leader in all the crooked business that Jim was doing. I begged him to stop, but he wouldn't. Thank you for being so frank. I often wondered how much you knew about me. And I know that it was your fault Jim killed Mr. Merritt. Hmm. Rather a bold knock for a man who's hiding. Open the door. Your brother will be glad to see. Kendall! What do you mean by coming in here? I thought that you should know that... Well, I... I followed you. You followed me? For what reason? I specifically told you I not... noticed Larry Walters following you, too, and I thought... I thought maybe you... there was some trouble. Well, that was very thoughtful of you, Kendall. Very thoughtful indeed. But as you see, there's nothing wrong. Margaret and I were just having a little, little chat. You can go now. Did you hear me, Kendall? I said you can go. I heard you, Father. Kendall, I want you to stay. You'll regret this, my dear Margaret. Go home, Kendall. If you won't do as I ask, then I want Kendall to stay. I hope you heard what Margaret just said, Kendall. A deliberate attempt to blackmail your father and to do something unlawful. Well, I don't... I'm, I'm not... It's time I'm... you knew the truth, Kendall. We've been married a whole year, and if, if you're ever going to become a worthwhile person, now is the time. Margaret. You can't stop me now. I'm going to tell him. Kendall. You can prepare yourself for some vicious lies. Kendall, you're going to have to be strong enough to face the truth. Your father is a blackmailer. I don't believe it. No, no, Margaret, It's you're... true. After your mother died, when you were born, Evan Thatcher became a bitter, rotten old man. He used his position and his reputation to find out things about people, and, and then he blackmailed them. But Margaret, father didn't need money. He, he... liked to hurt. To see them squirm. He wanted to hurt the world because he'd been hurt. Kendall, she hates me so much. She's trying to poison your mind against me. She hasn't one iota of proof. You covered your tracks well, didn't you? You had my brother Jim do all the dirty work for you. Didn't you ever wonder, Kendall, what business affairs your father and Jim could possibly have had together? Well, it did seem kind of peculiar. Kendall, go home. Let me handle this. I'll explain everything to you in the morning. My word of honor. But, Father... You I... have my word. Go home. Hello, everybody. Well, this is a nice little family gathering. Jim. Stay where you are, Jim. Stay right where you are, or this gun might go off. Go on, Kendall. Get out. No. No, I'm staying. I want to hear all of it. Yeah. Tell your son how you double-crossed me with Merritt. Shut up. Why? What have I got to lose? If you don't kill me, the cops will. But why don't you tell your son how you made me pack a gun when I went to Merritt's and how you knew he'd have one, too? So it's true. Margaret wasn't lying. You are an evil old man. One more step, Jimmy, you'll be dead. Jim, wait. Mr. Thatcher will help you to get away. Too late now, sis. But he could have helped me, he folded. And I kept my mouth shut in court for him. Now we'll have the truth. You didn't accuse me because no one would have believed you. I was too careful. What's the difference? First I'm going to kill you, and then I'm going to die happy. I'll get out of my way, Kendall. Stand back, Kendall. He's not going to hurt me. I'm going to kill him. I won't be blamed for it. He's an escaped convict. I'll tell. I swear I'll tell. I'll tell the police just how it happened. You're not going to be alive to tell anyone anything. Kendall, stand back. 
You're not going to shoot, Father, or you'll have to shoot me first. Get out of my way! Are you crazy? No, Father. Just seeing you as you really are. I'm growing up, Father. You idiot! These fools can ruin me. I'm going to say that Jim killed Margaret. Then we took the gun away from you. But I had to shoot him in self-defense. All right. Hold it. Everybody reach. Oh, thank heavens you come, Walters. You can arrest this convict. And you, Mr. Thatcher. Now I know why you dislike detectives. Drop that gun. Come along, Jim. Get, give me that gun, no, sir. I give it to me, all right? Break it up. Not. Break it up, you two. All right. Here. Take this. Better this way. Are you all right, Jim? I'm okay. I'll be dead a little quicker than you thought. And, well, thanks for getting Thatcher for me. I didn't get him for anybody. He took a shot at Margaret. Thanks, anyway. Now, now Margaret will be all right. Won't you, sis? You mean we'll be all right, Jim? Kendall and me. Yes, that's right, Jim. Don't you worry about Margaret. We'll be really together now. Mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. <laughs> Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free. And moves forward swiftly, silently. This is... The Haunting Hour.
occupation, murder. Those of us who have never stepped upon the stage and delved into a world of fantasy might believe that to do so would bring to one's mind and experience all that could never quite be grasped in real life. The actors, how perfectly they move, what excitement they entail, how straight they follow the paths of their planned destiny. Out of the portrait of real existence into a world of fantasy and fiction. And the players, what of them when the play is done? When they leave the world of make-believe for cold reality. But wait. Gregory Townsend's story can tell you better than I how life itself can plunge a man into conflicts of reality far greater than all the infinite imagination of the stage. It was a late summer afternoon when Gregory Townsend hurried into a little side street cafe to begin events of such a nature to bear careful consideration as to their probability were he to have acted them in a play. Say, Al. Al Henley. Hi, Greg. I've got to see you right away. It's very important. Uh, can't you see that I've got company? Oh, this, by the way, is Miss Valentine Simpkins. Oh, what a charming stage name. How do you do, my dear? I'm Greg Townsend. I'm pleased to know you. And Valentine Simpkins is my real name. It's beautiful, honey. You're a natural for Broadway. Why, I wouldn't consider myself your press agent if you weren't. Oh, you're too kind to me, Mr. Henley. Wait, kid, I haven't even stopped. I hope you'll forgive me, Miss Simpkins, for I must have a word with Al. Oh, it's perfectly all right. I'll excuse myself. Oh, stick around, honey. This won't take long. It never does. This will, Henley. Well, Mr. Henley, give me a buzz if you get my name in the papers. It's a cinch, Valentine. I'll phone you tomorrow. That will be charming. Goodbye, Mr. Townsend. Goodbye. Goodbye. Long. Huh. Where did you discover that item of brick and brag, Al? I'm protecting her from the advances of a punk named Dave Anderson. Know him? He's a professional shyster. No, he's not a member of my club. Listen, Al. You've got to think of an idea that will put me on the front page. What's the rest? John Miller is casting his new play. I phoned him this morning asking for a chance at the lead. He said no, of course. No, 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 not quite. He said he would have to have an actor with name value. That lets you out, Greg. Well, I'm not so sure. Well, if you can only get me some decent publicity for a change. Something spectacular. I can land that part. Oh, it'll miss me and you. I'll cut you in for a large percentage. Well, that's nice of you, considering the fact it says just that in our country. Come on, Al. You think of something. Get me on the front pages. Well, there's always one sure story. Oh? What's that? Murder. Are you crazy? No. I've got an idea that will make you one of the most publicized guys in the country. Practically overnight. You mean, uh... Commit murder? Yeah. Guaranteed to work. Money refunded if you don't grab the beef from the <laughs> Gosh, for a minute, I thought you really meant it, Al. Oh, come on now. Tell me what the idea really is. That's it. Homicide. You're going to commit murder, stand trial, and then be declared innocent. I know you can guarantee the first two items of procedure, but what about their... Well, it's all very simple, Gregory. You're going to murder yourself. What? Oh, is the thought so gruesome? I thought you'd be pleased. All right, Al. Sorry to take your precious time. I'm going to find myself another press agent. One without a sense of humor. Uh, cool off, Greg. Have a chair and give me five minutes for a lucid explanation. Is uh, this a gag? No, it's on the level. Listen and see how foolproof my idea is. First, uh, what's your real name? Well, I don't use it anymore. Greg Townsend is sufficient for your purposes. I have to know your real name. Now, what is it? Well, all right. It's Michael Armbruster. Fine. It'll fit perfectly. Now, here's my plan. You ought to rent a room under the name of Michael Armbruster. Yes. I want you to live there for three or four days. Mm-hmm. Change your face with makeup so that the landlady or the other rumors won't recognize you as Gregory Townsend. Then I want you to do this. <laughs> Sergeant Callahan, 13th Precinct. I want to report a murder. Don't ask me who this is, but listen to what I say carefully. Go to 2219 South Grove Street. In the rear room on the third floor, you'll find the body of Michael Armbruster. What's that address again? Matthew, take this call. I won't repeat the address. It's 
It's useless to trace this call. I'm not the murderer, and that's all I have to say. Hello. Hello. Emergency. Get me the district attorney's office. <laughs> Greg, mind if I sit down? No, uh, no, help yourself, Al. Well, uh, what do the papers say? Uh, look for yourself, Greg. The front pages are full of it. Oh, well, what's our next move? Yes, it's time. I'm running the show and guarantee when the time is right, I'll tip off the cops and send them after Armbruster's murderer. Oh, I'm getting worried, Al. Maybe we shouldn't have done it. What if something goes wrong? Oh, relax, Greg. The whole thing's airtight. There's not a chance of a slip. How can a guy murder himself? I just look at the story. The police and district attorney Ford remain baffled today as to the solution of the murder of Michael Armbruster. In response to an anonymous phone call, the police investigated Armbruster's room, but upon their arrival, it was discovered that the body had disappeared. Among the clues found were a blood-stained jacket, a wristwatch with the initials GT, and an unsigned letter to Armbruster threatening his life. There, Greg. What do you think of that? Gosh, it sounds too real. Naturally, that's the way I planned it. The police have got to think it's real or we won't even get a line in the Pleasant Valley Gazette. Oh, what's the matter? Worried about your watch? Yes, I didn't know about that letter. Oh, well, I forgot to tell you. I wrote it. What's in it? The usual kind of stuff. He did you wrong, so you were out to get him. I left it unsigned to make it tougher for the police. You didn't forget anything, did you? Not a thing. It's a terrific mystery. The whole town's talking about it. Why, Armbrust is a celebrated character. What about Townsend? Any time now, Greg. Any time now. What do you mean? You see that rather determined-looking gentleman walking this way? The one with the two policemen? Yeah. Well, Greg, old pal, that is the district attorney. Uh, I'd better get out of here. Sit down. Don't act like a murderer. What should I say? The DA will let you know. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Not at all. What can we do for you? My name is Ford, District Attorney. How do you do? Hi. I'm looking for an actor by the name of Gregory Townsend. Friend of yours? Not exactly. Well, this is him. Are you Townsend? Why, yes. Yes, I am. Will you come with me, please? What's wrong? We'd like to question you about the murder of Michael Armbrust. Better go quietly, Greg. It'll be better. Shut up, you fool. All right, Sergeant. Take him in full. I think we've got our murderer. Come along, Townsend. Don't let go of me. I didn't do it, I tell you. I didn't do it. Hello, Townsend. Hello, Ford. You can't keep me in here. I tell you, I'm innocent. You're playing your role quite expertly, Townsend. Your dramatic performance in person. But as a denial of your guilt is strictly on the ham side. You've no evidence. The initials we found engraved on the watch in Armbruster's room match yours. As well as several million dollars. That's no proof. The letter to Armbruster, the one that threatened his life, was written by an actor. Maybe it was. But you haven't got a case unless you find the body. I remember that from my last play. It was a murder mystery. You do have a good memory, don't you? Well, am I right? Perhaps, Townsend. We're looking for the body, and I can assure you it will be found. In the meantime, I'm holding you here on suspicion of murder. When you decide to confess, let me know. It'll save us both a great deal of trouble. Oh, uh, by the way, the newspapers have begun to treat you rather unkindly. I'm afraid your acting career is a thing of the past. Assuming, of course, that you're ever freed by the court. What? I'll send in some papers. You can read the bad news for yourself. Ford, Ford, wait a minute. Yes? I, uh, you see... Well, what is it, Townsend? Nothing, Ford. Nothing. This isn't a bad setup, Greg. You look very comfortable. Oh, cup of conning, Al. How's it coming? There's enough publicity for a hundred scrapbooks. Well, you're a cinch for that John Miller play. Fine. Now, when do I get out of here? Get out? Oh, well, uh, that'll be a little while yet, Greg. What do you mean, a little while? Sister's attorney was just here, and he thinks I'm guilty. So what? You know you're not. There hasn't even been a murder. Oh, boy, will he do a slow burn when the story breaks in the paper. Ford also said the papers were beginning to pan me. Is that true? Well, uh, a little, Greg. Some of the boys are knocking, but 
But that's because it makes a better story. That's nothing to worry about. You've just got to hold on a little longer. Oh, but I am worried, Al. We're playing with something big. Now, look, Greg, I'm the idea boy. I got you into this, and I'll get you out. And that result of the whole thing is going to make you a famous guy. Why, you'll have every producer on Broadway eating out of your hands. Oh, gosh, I don't know, Al. Well. It's gone too far. Maybe we ought to show our hands. Who's been feeding you that dialogue, Greg? It's all wet. Now, you listen to me. We haven't hit the cream of the press notices yet. I've never made a dime out of you, but I've always thought you had talent. Keep your faith in my judgment, Greg. You won't be sorry. Oh, I know you're trying to sell me, Al, but I have a hunch it's down the river. And if my hunch gets too strong, Al, I'm going to talk to Ford. of you to take me driving, Mr. Henley. It's a pleasure, Valentine, honey. After the cares of the day, there's nothing like a cool evening ride with one's favorite female companion. <laughs> How's your friend Gregory Townsend? Don't you read the papers, Valentine? Well, that's what I mean. He's where your friend Dave Anderson ought to be. Why don't you like him, Mr. Henley? He's been squeezing money out of me like a leech. Do you owe it to him? Oh, not exactly, Valentine. Ever hear of Blackmail. Oh, how exciting. Oh, yeah? Well, honey, right now I've got my mind on murder. Oh, Mr. Henley, you you mustn't. <laughs> Don't worry, Valentine. I'm only doing my job. Don't you remember? I'm press agent for the murder. <laughs> of the web in which Gregory Townsend found himself imprisoned were more unbelievable than any play in which he'd ever acted. In answer to a desperate plea for publicity, Al Henley, his press agent, had conceived the idea of Gregory's committing a counterfeit murder, the supposed victim to bear his real name, Michael Armster. But Gregory's order for the pretense cooled when the district attorney gave every indication of believing the story. Well, that's the whole story, Mr. Ford. You're a strange sort of fellow, Townsend. Well, what do you mean? You expect me to believe a story such as the one you've just told. But it's the truth, I swear it. Why, it's fantastic. A man murdering himself. Now, listen to me, Ford. I am Michael Armbruster. Gregory Townsend is only my stage name. Will the landlady identify you as Armbruster? Well, no, I purposely wore makeup. <laughs> you've covered all the angles, haven't you? Unfortunately, Townsend, your story is too incredulous for me to believe. Not even a wild-eyed press agent could create such a tale. But that's exactly how it happened. I needed publicity, and Al Henley, my press agent, invented the whole thing. How do you account for your watch being in the room? It was my room, I tell you. I rented it. Only your war makeup, so it wasn't you. Yes, I know. I don't know what else I can do to prove the whole thing to be a piece of fiction. There isn't any body. Surely that should convince you. But you're wrong, Townsend. There is a corpse. What are you talking about? I said there's a body. The body of Michael Armbruster. Are oh, you crazy? We've been told where it is. You shouldn't have trusted Al Henley. He's decided to tell us where you've hidden the body of the man you murdered. I have a car waiting. We'll soon discover who's been telling the truth. <laughs> Should be there any minute. Where am I supposed to have hidden my victim? Behind a large outdoor advertising sign. Hmm. Sounds like a nice quiet retreat for a dead man. That looks like the place up ahead. Well, there's a sign there at any rate. Would you prefer to point out the exact spot where the body is hidden? I couldn't do it with a Ouija board. As you wish, Townsend. This way. Speaking of publicity, Ford... This won't do you any good when the papers find out you've been persecuting an innocent man. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, what 
It's horrible. Well, there's your answer, Townsend. Will you confess now? No, no, I didn't do it. Look for yourself, Townsend. This body's been burned. The ebony ring on the finger with the initials M.A. I've never seen it before. This is the body of Michael Armbruster. I'm charging you with his murder, and so help me, I'm going to get a conviction. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Hanley. Just call when you're ready to leave. Hello, Greg. You get out of here before I commit a real murder. Take it easy, Take it Greg. Easy. Why, you cheap little crook. Do you know you're framing me with a murder? Well, it's all according to plan, Not Greg. my plan. I want you to get me out of here. The DA is putting me on trial next week. Exactly, and that's where I'm going to spring my big surprise. Where'd that body come from? A shady character I know tipped me off to it. The guy can supply any kind of body on order. <laughs> He'd make you an excellent partner. But first, you've got to get me out of this. At the trial, Greg, at the trial. It'll be the biggest news story of the century. I can just see those headlines. Oh, I don't know why I should trust you. I have a feeling you've got something up your sleeve. Oh, relax, Greg. You've got a nice room here and three meals a day. That should be heaven to any actor. Believe me, you haven't a thing in the world to worry about. <laughs> Court is now in session. The district attorney will continue with his presentation. Thank you, Your Honor. I should like to call as my final witness, Al Henley. Now, uh, Mr. Henley, what was your relationship with the defendant? I was his uh, public relations counsel. Did he usually confide in you? All the time. I gave him advice on his career. Tell the court, Mr. Henley, what you know about the murder of Michael Armbrey. Well, I'd known for quite a while that Townsend and Armbruster weren't exactly on speaking terms. One night, about a month ago, Townsend came to see me at my apartment. Yes? He had a good deal to drink and was talking pretty freely. He told me he killed Armbruster that night and that he was hiding the body out at the spot where I told the district attorney it could be found. Why did you keep this information quiet for so long? I wanted to protect Townsend. No man likes to convict his friend. You're lying, you rat. You're lying. Order in the court. Order in the court. The prisoner will remain silent. Stop me lying. I didn't kill anyone. I didn't kill anyone. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. We find the defendant... Guilty of murder in the first degree. <laughs> Too bad about Gregory Townsend, Mr. Henley. He looked like such a nice fellow. Well, that's life, Valentine. You can never tell by looking at a guy what's going on inside him. When's the execution set for? Uh, sometime next week. Are you going up to see him? No, it's hurt me too much to have to watch him suffer. The paper sure gave it a lot of publicity. I guarantee that for my clients, Valentine, honey. Well, anyone can get their name in the papers if they murder someone, Mr. That's Kelly. right, Valentine. But how many people can get their name in the paper if they don't commit a murder? That's not so easy, is it? <laughs> That's right. Well, now you're talking, baby. But I did it for Gregory Townsend. He was my client, and I always please my client. I'd like to do the same for Dave Anderson, but I don't think he'll be around anymore. Now, wait a One more other thing. Mr. Anderson is a nice man. You shouldn't talk that way about him. <laughs> All right, Valentine. Let's talk about you. I'll get your name in the papers, but in another way. You're not ready for courtroom scenes. Besides, the district attorney might believe you. It's nice of you to visit me, Valentine. I'm glad you remember me, Mr. Townsend. You shouldn't keep such unpleasant company, my dear. You're liable to wind up playing the lead in a murder courtroom. That's funny. Mr. Henley said exactly the same thing to me yesterday. Well, you just be careful, Valentine. He's also liable to get your name in the papers. And that, I'm afraid, is a blood brother to the kiss of death. Why, that's another coincidence. 
Huh? What do you mean? Mr. Henley and I were discussing that yesterday also. How does it happen you decided to visit me? Mr. Henley said it would hurt him too much to see you. But I don't think that's the real reason. I think he feels bad because he's hiding something. What do you mean, Valentine? He said it was easy for people to get their names in the papers if they kill someone. But he said he got yours in the papers and you didn't kill anyone. He told you that? Yes. And I'm worried about my friend, Dave Anderson. Mr. Henley doesn't like him. And he said yesterday I wouldn't be seeing him anymore. Uh, Valentine, do you know Mr. Ford, the district attorney? No, but I've seen his picture. How would you like to meet him? Oh, now, don't go to any trouble. Oh, it's no trouble at all, I assure you. It'll be a pleasure. Oh, what should I say to him? Just smile and tell him exactly what Mr. Henley told you yesterday. You mean about how to get your name in the papers? Yes, that's it. Will you do that for me? Sure, why not? Valentine, honey, whether it's February or not, you're more than welcome. Didn't think you had the guts to show up here, Al. Believe me, Greg, I just like jails more than you. I hope there were no hard feelings. Well, of course not. You're only paying for a murder you committed with my life. <laughs> you should have been a comedian, Greg. The serious stuff never did suit your personality. Well, keep up the good spirits. You're a credit to the acting profession. Laugh, clown, laugh. <laughs> or should I say, sucker? <laughs> you were right the other day, Mr. Henley. Uh, which bright thing was that, Valentine, honey? When you said you couldn't tell by looking at a guy what was going on inside him. Yeah, I said that all right. Did you try it out? I certainly did, Mr. Henry. Why, only yesterday. To look at Mr. Ford, you would never think that he had a sense of humor. You mean Ford, the DA? Yes. What were you doing with him? Come on, quick. What were you doing with him? Henley, you're hurting my arm. Don't twist the lady's arm, Al. It might come off. This is a private party, Ford. Thanks for the invitation. I'd like to join the fun. Oh, no use in saying no, huh? No. All right. What is it? Why, ever since Valentine told me your philosophy about publicity, I've been doing a little checking. And? I found that I haven't been particularly brilliant on this case. For example, the ring with the initials M.A. that I found on the body of the corpse was made of ebony. Pretty color. And a very pretty wood. The important factor that I completely overlooked was that if the ring were on the body when it was burned, why, the ring would have been consumed also. In other words, the ring was obviously placed on the hand after the murder had been committed. That's very good, Mr. Ford. Thank you, Valentine. Shut up, Valentine. With that clue, Henley, the rest was simple. Okay, Ford, you win. Dave Anderson was blackmailing me for every cent I earned. I figured I could put him out of the way and make you think the charred body was really ambrous. Well, goodbye, Valentine, honey. I'm going away. All right, Ford. I'm ready to change places with my former client. nice of you to invite me here, Mr. Townsend. Well, I can't think of anyone else I'd rather celebrate with, Valentine. After all, you saved my life. Oh, it wasn't anything much. I just listened to Mr. Henley, and he practically gave it all away. But even for the killing of your friend, Dave Anderson. I only wish I could have found out in time before Mr. Henley got to him. Well, it's all over now, Valentine. The best thing to do is to forget. Why, you're a famous girl now. Your name's in every newspaper in the country. Yeah. Wasn't that funny, though? Mr. Henley always said he'd get me in the headlines. He kept his word, Valentine, even if he had to commit murder to do it.
Mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. Imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. The skyscraper mystery. lunch hour on the crowded downtown street of a great American city. Come on, Sadie. Let's go into this store. I've simply got to get a dress today. Oh, gee, Hazel, I'd love to. Honestly, I'd love to. But I've been out of the office an hour now. My boss will be awful mad if I don't get back. Oh, come on, Sadie. It'll only take me a minute. I hear they got some wonderful buys. Maybe you can pick up something yourself? Well, I do need another dress. I'm simply having a thing to wear. I went... Oh, no. Oh, what is it? There's a man falling from that building. Oh, no. Regional Insurance Company Executive Office. One moment, please. I'll connect you. Regional Insurance Company Executive Office. I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Sanford is making no appointments today. Yes, sir. I'll be glad to see you. Well, why don't I B.S. himself wants to talk to us, Maggie? Oh, I have the faintest idea, Steve, but it must be important. Otherwise, you wouldn't be called up to the front office like this. Mm. Mr. Daly? Oh, yes. Miss West? Yes, that's right. Mr. Sanford will see you now. Come on, Maggie. And uh, keep your fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. Well, sit down. Oh, yes, oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanford. I've been informed that you two are the best special investigators on the company staff. Oh, well, I don't know. I've got a special assignment I want you two to work on right away. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Sanford? I want you to look into these window cleaner accidents. They've cost our company a lot of money in claims already, and we may have to pay much more. Then you think they may not be accidental? I don't know, Miss West. That's what I want you and Mr. Daly here to find out. Steve, I've just got to report. No window cleaner has died by accidental fall in over ten years. Thank you, Maggie. Yeah. And yet three of the poor devils hit the pavement in the last two weeks could be coincidence. It could. It could be something else. Look, Maggie, add this up now. There are only two big contract window cleaning companies in town, Intercity and Superba. They're bitter competitors. Between them, they handle all the skyscraper business in town, and the business runs into millions of dollars. Well? Well, doesn't it strike you as peculiar that all the accidents have happened to the Intercity company, the firm we insure, and none to Superba? Mm. Oh, I don't know. That could be coincidence, too. Yeah, that's just it. Case is full of coincidences, too full. What are we going to do about it? 
I think we ought to drop down to the Intercity Company and have a little talk with a man in charge. Do you understand, Mr. Daly, Miss West? I'm just the superintendent of Intercity Company. The firm is actually owned by hundreds of stockholders and operated by a board of directors. I see. Do you uh, mind if we ask you a few questions, Mr. Cooper? Not at all. I'll do anything, anything, if it will help stop these terrible accidents. Then you think they were accidents? I'm afraid they were, Miss West. I don't understand why they happened, but they couldn't have been anything else. Why do you say that, Mr. Cooper? Well, when the men fell from the windows, they were wearing their safety belts. And they were in perfect condition. Yes, that's right. That's what the police report says. Oh, what about the bolts in the sides of the windows where the cleaners hook in their belts? They hadn't been tampered with. They were in perfect shape. Then you think your men plunged to their death just through carelessness? I... I don't like to admit it, Mr. Daly, but I can't see what else it could have been. But aren't your men trained to be careful? Yes, they're trained to be very careful. They have to be. That's what I don't understand. These three men were old-timers with the Intercity Company. I knew them all well. You, their wives, their families, too. I, well, it's hit me pretty hard personally, Mr. Daly. They were friends of mine. Oh, of course, I can understand that. Well, how have these accidents affected the company's business, Mr. Cooper? We're taking a beating, Miss West. We've lost two big contracts to Superga already, and we may lose a third. If that one goes over to our competitor, well, I, I don't see how we can stay in business. You see, the skyscraper people in town don't like all that unfavorable publicity. Yes, I read that the exchange building and Midtown Towers went over to Suburba. That's only one of our troubles, Mr. Daly. We're losing men to Suburba, too. We can't hire any more. What do you mean? The window cleaners think our company is jinxed. They're very superstitious. We're having all kinds of trouble hanging on to them. And of course, you insurance people are in on the picture now, too, uh, Oh, not that I blame you, of We're course. just trying to get to the bottom of these tragedies. Of course. All of us would like to. I've been in this business 20 years, and I've never seen a mess like this. If this keeps up, we're going to have to sell out the Superba for a song. They've got our backs to the wall now. Uh, oh, excuse me, please. Hello? Oh, yes, Mr. Bates. Yes. yes I'll be right down. More bad news. What is it? The board of directors is holding a special meeting, and they want me to appear. It looks as though they're going to put me on the carpet. <laughs> I'll be lucky if I have a job when I come out. Good luck, Mr. Cooper. Thanks, Miss West. Oh, if there was only something I could tell them. If there was only something I could do to straighten out this mess. <laughs> Hey, taxi. Where are we going now, Steve? Back to the office? No, Maggie. Taxi. Where to, mister? The corner of 4th and River Street, driver. Okay. Corner of 4th and River? What's there, Steve? The Suburba Company, Maggie. Connie will see you now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You asked for a minute of my time. That's all I can spare. What is it? Uh, Mr. Connie, my name is Daly, and this is Miss West. If you're a salesman, you're supposed to see our purchasing agent. We're not salesmen, Mr. Connie. Well, well, what is it? Speak up. I'm a busy man. We represent the regional insurance company. Insurance? So you're agents. When will you fellas learn to stop pestering me? I'm not in the market for any more insurance. That's final. Now get out. Just a minute, Mr. Connie. You may own the Superba Company, but you can't talk to me like just that. Just a minute, Steve. Just a minute. Mr. Connie, we're not insurance agents. We're investigators. Well, what do you want of me? It concerns the little matter of those intercity company window cleaners suddenly dropping from skyscrapers. I see. Well, why come here to Superba? Our window cleaners aren't suffering any accidents. Why don't you go to see the intercity people? We've already been there. That still doesn't explain why you came to see me. We, um, we don't quite understand, Mr. Connie, why their men are having all the accidents and not yours. Look here, Daly, what are you implying? Why, nothing, Mr. Connie. We Carney. just 
thought that you might have an idea. I haven't any idea. I run my own business, a Superba company. What's going on at Intercity doesn't concern me, and I'm not interested. Is that clear? It's uh, clear enough, but we've heard that you may be interested in the Intercity company very shortly. What do you mean? Well, it's common knowledge that the Intercity people have lost several contracts to you. If they lose a few more, they may be forced to sell out to you. I'm not in the habit of discussing my business with anybody. I haven't any information to give you, and I wouldn't if I could. Now get out. I'm a busy man. Phew, just a nice, sweet, lovable man, this Mr. Carney. Yes, isn't he? We certainly didn't get very far with him, Maggie. In fact, we haven't gotten very far anywhere. Steve, what are we going to say to the boss? I don't know. Looks like we're licked. We just haven't got a lead to go on. But we just can't go into the boss, to Mr. Stanford, and tell him the only reason we found for the accidents was carelessness. Why, first. Yes, I guess he would. But, Maggie, what other reason could there be? The man slip and fall, their equipment checks okay... The police put every one of them down as accidental death. Who are we to say no? Still. Still what? Well, I just can't get over those statistics. No window cleaner falls in ten years. Then in two weeks, three of them drop. And all with the intercity company, too. Oh, it must be coincidence. Yes, maybe. Well, maybe you're right. Here's the regional insurance building, mister. Huh? Oh, okay, darling. Here you are. I keep the change. Thanks. Well, Steve, I suppose we might as well report to the front office. Yes. Steve. What is it? Up there, that window in our office. A man. Hey, look out! Oh, oh, Max, oh, right through the awning and onto the sidewalk. Oh, horrible! Oh. Hey, it's another window cleaner. All right, Maggie. All right. Pull yourself together, Maggie. We've got work to do. Come on. We're going up into our building and find the office that poor devil dropped from. So you know the office this window cleaner dropped from, Harrison? Uh, yes, Mr. Daly. I, I passed by it not five minutes ago and saw him doing the window. This is the 32nd story. Oh, the poor fellow never had a chance. I'll say you didn't. Oh, did you find out anything by talking to the elevator boys, Maggie? No. Nope. None of them delivered anybody on this floor or picked anybody up in the last five minutes. You see, Mr. Daly, there hasn't been any business done on this floor in the past month. The whole bookkeeping department used to be here, but... They moved it down two floors. Oh, here's the office. Hey. Maggie. Yes? Notice a faint odor in here, the odor of some chemical? Oh, yes. That's funny. It's kind of a... It's kind of a hospital smell. I'd say it was some kind of cleaning antiseptic, Miss West. You see, the scrub women were in here a half hour ago. Oh, oh, I see. Well, then it must have been the soap or cleaning solution they use. Anyway, it's not familiar to me. Oh, Steve, look. Why, oh, there's the window washer's pail and sponge on the windowsill just as he left it. Yes. Hey, wait a minute. That's funny. What's funny? The pail's on the outside sill of the window. What of it? Well, look at the window, Maggie. It's already been washed on the outside. The man was working on the inside when he was... when he was interrupted. He must have been. Good heavens, Mr. Daly. Then how could he fall out? Just what I'd like to know. The fact that it took place in an empty office is interesting, too. Just the place for a nice, quiet... Maggie. Yes, please? I want you to do a little research for me in a hurry. Well, what? Check back on every accident of this kind that's happened. Find out which offices these poor devils fell from. Then call me the moment you're through. But, Steve, what... I... Is... Just a hunch I've got, Maggie. But if it's true... Okay, Steve, I'm on my way. Hello? Steve, this is Maggie. I think I've got something. Yes? Every one of those accidents took place in the window of an empty office. Just 
what I thought. What, Steve? Murder, Maggie. Murder. Steve Daly and Maggie West, special investigators for the regional insurance company, have been sent out to determine the cause of a series of mysterious accidents which have taken place among the skyscrapers of the city. In the short space of two weeks, four window cleaners have plunged to their death. Now the two investigators have discovered that the men did not plunge far down into the street by accident, but were murdered. From that point on, they hit a blind wall. Well, here we are again, Maggie. Look. We know these men were murdered. The window in our building and the fact that all the offices from which these window washers fell were empty proves that. Yes. And naturally, the killer would pick a time when the cleaners were working in empty offices. We knew he wouldn't be disturbed. Oh, you wonder who he is, Steve? Well, if we knew that, we'd know everything. At least the motive seems to be a simple one, to ruin our client, the Intercity Company. Mm-hmm. And incidentally, to ruin us. We're paying out claims in four of these accidents now. The boss is raving. Yes, I know. He wants results. And quick. But good heavens, Steve, we can't watch every skyscraper in the city. Of course we can, Maggie. Be like looking for a needle in a haystack. Now, as I see it, we've got only one chance. What's that? Did you ever hear the old saying, if the mountain doesn't come to Muhammad, then Muhammad must go to the mountain? Mm Mm-hmm. But I don't see where it applies here. What do you mean, Steve? I mean that I'm going to ask Cooper at the Intercity Company for a job washing windows. What? Yes. If I can't find this skyscraper killer, maybe he'll look me up. Oh, now, Steve, for heaven's sake, you must be out of your mind. Maybe. But it might work. But you don't know the first thing about window cleaning. Well, I could learn. It doesn't look very complicated. Oh, now, listen, Steve. I won't let you do it. Sticking your neck out like that, why, it's... Well, it's perfectly ridiculous. What well, isn't only the chance to be taking running into the murderer, it's the idea of working 30 and 40 stories above the street. <laughs> don't worry, Maggie. High places don't bother me. Why, I used to be a champion high diver when I was a kid. <laughs> I can't give you a job with my outfit. This idea of yours, well, it's fantastic. Perhaps, Cooper, but it might work. And it's our only chance. But you've never had any experience. Now, how long does it take a green man to break into this business? Well, a couple of weeks. But it isn't the work itself. It's the idea of being careful. Now, don't you worry about that, Cooper. I'll be careful, believe me. Taking a nosedive from a skyscraper into a hard street isn't exactly my idea of a nice way to leave this mortal coil. You'd be running at dangerous risk. Not just from the work alone, but if, as you say, there's a killer running around loose. Well, your own men are running the same risk every day. Yes, I know. All right, then. How about that job? Okay, Daly, I'll give you the job. But it's against my better judgment. I... Well, I just want to say that you've got plenty of courage to stick your neck out like this. I admire you for it. Uh, thanks. Oh, uh, who's the man I report to? to? Oh, oh, Joe Lane, our crew boss. I was wanting to put you on and report to him here at 8 tomorrow. Fine. And, um, I wouldn't tell him who I am. As far as Lane is concerned, I'm just an unemployed looking for a job as a window cleaner. All right. There's only one thing I'm asking you to do, Daly. Yes? What's that? Be careful. Be very careful. Morning. Are you Joe Lane? Yep. My name's Daly, Steve Daly. Sorry, the boss phoned me about you. So you want to be a window cleaner, huh? Well, yes, I could use the job. Well, you don't look like a man that can do hard work. The window washing's hard work, Daly. Oh, uh, I'm not afraid of it. You know, 
I hear they're hiring laborers to work on that new subway. Maybe you'd like that kind of work better, huh? <laughs> no. I uh, like it out on the open air. Look, bud, I'm just trying to tip you off to something. Tip me off? To what? It ain't healthy to work for this outfit. We're in the city right now. We've had quite a few accidents. Well, I suppose accidents will happen. Okay, suit yourself. You want to work for us, we can use you. I'll break you in on the ground floor windows first, and then you work upward. You're as green as they come, but I haven't any choice. I'm just telling you one thing. Yes? What's that? Be careful. <laughs> I guess. Now, I've been using a lot of muscles that never belong to me. I... <laughs> By the way, young lady, you hardly touched your food either. I'm too scared. Scared? About what? About you. I haven't had a good night's sleep in the three weeks you've been working for Intercity. Oh, now, wait a minute, Maggie. And last night I had a terrible dream. I dreamed that, that you were a human fly. A, a what? A human fly. You were climbing up the wall of a new skyscraper, a hundred stories high, and, and there was one little window at the top you had to clean before you quit. Well, it, it looked like a little evil eye shining down at you, mocking you. Well, there you were, climbing up the side of that blank wall, and, and you'd almost reached the little window when you started to slide back down. You slid further and further, and, and then suddenly you couldn't hang on anymore and fell into thin air. Oh, that's a great place to stop. What happened then? I don't know. I, well, I woke up while you were still falling down. Oh. Oh, Steve, why don't you quit? Nothing's happened to you. Let's keep it that way. No, nothing's happened to me, but uh, we've got one result anyway. What's that? There hasn't been an accident in three weeks. Oh, and you think the killer's lying low? Yes, but only for the time being. I'm quite sure he'll strike again. Mm -hmm, and you may be just the one he's looking for. Well, if he's interested, he'll find me on the 40th floor of the syndicate building tomorrow. empty office where you wouldn't be interrupted. Naturally, my friend. Naturally. What What are you going to do now? Don't you know, Daly? You're going for a ride. A one-way ride. You'll never get away with this, Cooper. Oh, so you recognize my voice. You'll never get away with it. They'll get you sooner or later. Oh, no, my friend. I disagree. When you have a uh, slipped and fallen to the street below. The police will call it an accident. They always do. You see, your body will be so crushed that they will... No one will think otherwise. After all, we're 40 stories up. That's pretty high. Why are you doing this, Cooper? Why are you undermining and ruining your own company? Well, I see no harm in telling you daily. I'm quite sure it won't get any farther... You see, Intercity will have to sell out to Superba for a song. And then I'll get a dividend from Superba for my work. Yes, sir, quite a dividend. So Connie of the Superba is paying you for these killings, Killings? Huh? Oh, that's such a crude word, Mr. Daly. You mean, um, accident. Mm -hmm. However, this is no time for talk. Work to be done. I have a new cleaning fluid here in this little bottle. I'm going to demonstrate it to you. Chloroform, huh? 
You're very clever, Daly. You called your man inside the office on the pretext of demonstrating a new window cleaning fluid. Then you knocked them out with the chloroform and dumped the poor devils out of the window. And you knew that even if there were a coroner's inquest, nothing would come of it. Because chloroform is almost impossible to detect in an autopsy. You're too clever, Mr. Daly. Much too clever. Naturally, I knew you'd never fall for a pretext like that. That's why I brought this gun, just to be sure. And I wouldn't turn around if I were you. You feel no pain. It's just like going to sleep. Oh, oh, my eyes. My eyes. Try to blind me with a sponge, will you? You missed, Cooper. There goes your gun. Now, it's either you or me. I, I can't see you. But I can hear you, Daly. Once I set my hands on you... Cooper, look out! The window! I strangled you to death, Daly! Cooper! I strangled you to death! Well, Steve, they caught Connie at the airport. He booked passage for the West trying to make a getaway. Well, that seems to tie it all up, Maggie. Especially where Cooper was concerned. When a person falls 40 stories to the street, ooh, well, there wasn't any doubt. You know, there's one thing I don't understand, though. Cooper was walking up to you with a gun and a cloth soaked in chloroform, isn't that right? That's right. Well, then how did you manage to turn around and close with him before he could fire that gun? Well, you see, Maggie, I was facing the window when I saw his reflection in the glass. My hands were up and the sponge was in my right hand. It was soaked with soapy water and ammonia. Ammonia? Yes. Well, when I saw Cooper coming at me from behind, I had to take a long chance. He was about three feet away from me when I flipped the sponge backward. Luckily, it caught him square in the face and blinded him temporarily. And the rest you know. Mm -hmm. Hello? Uh, oh. Mm. Yes. We'll be right up. Who was that? The boss. B.S. Sanford probably wants us to start on another investigation. Well, if he does, I hope it's in a nice deep subway this time. stillness of this moment, for this is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour.
just part. Just a moment, Johnson. Do you think you can go on, Mr. Albert? Perhaps you'd rather wait. No, until... I... I'm all right now. Uh, read what you have so far, Johnson. Uh, my name is Nora Talbert. Exactly five months ago, I was employed by Marion Dunning, well-known play producer and widow of the late philanthropist Wilcox Dunning. I was to act as. And that's where she broke down, sir. Is uh, that correct so far, Mr. Albert? Yes. Yes, it is. Whenever you're ready to continue. I was to act as a confidential secretary to live at the Dunning estate and primarily read play manuscripts for Mrs. Dunning. I liked my job because, well, I liked Marion Dunning. She was very easy to get along with, very considerate. I hope you find your room comfortable, Nora. Just tell Tompkins, the butler, if there's anything you want. Pleasant, easy to get along with, considerate. She made me feel more a personal friend than just an employee. Now, look here, young lady. Stop working so late. A pretty girl like you ought to be out nights enjoying herself. I like Mrs. Dunning. I really was very happy there until Wallace Streber came into the picture. Nora, I want you to meet Wallace Streber. He's been kind enough to let me read his new play. And produce it. I assure you the pleasure is all mine, Nora. I disliked him on sight. He was always talking about money. Yes, Nora, I've always wanted the golden Midas touch. And soon I hope I'm going to have it. He was always talking about his play. It won't be long, Nora. I can see the blazing lights on the Broadway marquees. Talk to Death by Wallace Streber. The Rage of New York. Always talking about money. Always talking about his play. Yes, even always making advances toward me. And Mrs. Dunning was too infatuated with him to notice. I was far from surprised the day Mrs. Dunning told me she and Streeper were going to be married. He had mentioned to me several times that it would be a good idea. And Wallace Streeper wasn't one to abandon a good idea. He was the kind of man who would stop at nothing. I, Wallace Streeper, take this woman to be my lawfully wedded wife. To have and to hold in sickness and in health until death do us part. <laughs> I could see the smirk on his face as he repeated the marriage oath. And each word he said etched my hatred for him deeper and deeper. Then five minutes later at the reception party... <laughs> Nora! How about a kiss for the groom? I'm sorry, Mr. Streber, I'm busy. Oh, now, don't pull away at a wedding. It's unfriendly not to kiss the groom. You don't want to be unfriendly, Nora, do you? I have to see Tompkins about Mrs. Streber's baggage. Ah, but... it's just about time you paid some attention to Mr. Streber. You're working for me now, too. Doesn't the idea please you? <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Streber, I'm only your wife's secretary. Oh, come now. I think we should understand each other a little better. I understood him perfectly. He was out for money, the Dunning pocketbook. He was out for fame, his play on Broadway. He was out for all he could get, and Marion Dunning was the only way he could get it. One night, shortly after they returned from their honeymoon trip, we were having dinner. I know I've been talking about it for the last month. I know you don't like the play, but marry an angel, be an angel. Oh, he's incorrigible, isn't he, Nora? Oh, well, let's face it. The only way to get my play on Broadway is for you to back it. Why should we let $40,000 stand in the way of my happiness? After all, if my own wife hasn't confidence in... Oh, I do have confidence in you, Wallace. You know that. But I don't have confidence in your play. Talk to death is too... too... It's uh... implausible. Yes, Nora, it's implausible. Oh. So Nora's read the play, too, has she? Nora reads every play before I produce it. She has excellent judgment. Tell Wallace what you told me about his play, dear. Well, I... Go on, Nora. Well... Go on, Nora. Well, the play's illogical. A man talking a woman into suicide because of a wager, well, it's an incredible situation. Go on. Well, that's all. I see. I suppose you agree with that, Marion? Nora's absolutely right. A man could never talk a woman into suicide in real life, Wallace. It's silly. Why don't you try writing something else, darling? I'd love to read anything else you wrote. That's enough. Wallace. Why, Wallace? 
Swallows, what's the matter? Why, I just swallowed. <laughs> I soon came to learn that it was dangerous to cross swords with Wallace Streber. The very next night, Mr. Streber sent for me. You'll find Mr. Streber in the library, Miss Nora. All right, Tompkins, I'll be there in a little while. But <clears throat> Mr. Streber said you should come at once, Miss. Oh? Begging your pardon, Miss, but I watch my step, if I were you. He seemed to be quite put out about something. Oh. Thank you, Tompkins. You wanted to see me, Mr. Streber? Uh, yes. Uh, please come in, Nora. I do hope you'll forgive my actions last night. I'm afraid I lost my temper. But your criticism of my play seems more like a personal insult. My criticisms of plays are always objective, Mr. Streber. I, I'm sorry that you... I understand. I was only doing my job. I understand, sir. Nora, things could be very pleasant around here for you if you were a bit more, uh, more cooperative. Is that all you wanted, sir? No. Uh, sit down. Cigarette? I don't smoke. Nora, my wife has a very high regard for your opinion. Yes? Nora, how would you like to make some money? A lot of money. What do you mean? I mean that I'd make it worth your while if you'd convince Mrs. Streeper to back my plan. Sorry, Mr. Streeper. Not interested. I see. Nora, I said before that things could be very pleasant here for you. I say now that things can also be very unpleasant. That's all. Good night. <laughs> He tried every way to make things unpleasant. He tried everything to turn Mrs. Streber against me. First. That story Nora's writing, Marion. Did you ever read Walton's Night Ride? I'd say certain sections were copied verbatim. He accused me of plagiarizing a story I was writing, but that was only a start. But I tell you, Marion, she was paid to recommend that play to you. He accused me of accepting a bribe to recommend someone's play to Mrs. Streber. He even accused me of stealing it. Marion, my wallet's missing. I left it on the library desk. And Nora's the only one who's been in there since last night. But, Miss Nora, Mr. Streber's wallet was in his bureau drawer. It was there all the time. I thought as much, Tompkins. He'd say anything to get me into trouble. I'm terribly sorry. I told Mrs. Streeper. Thank you anyway, Tompkins, but I'm afraid it won't make much difference. He tried everything to get rid of me, but I stayed. Mrs. Streeper wanted me to, but I could feel the difference in her manner toward me. Not so considerate, not so pleasant, not so easy to get along with now, but I stayed. I stayed to find out why Streeper was so anxious to get me out of the way. Marion. Just a minute, dear. I have to get this letter off tonight. Marion. What is it, Wallace? After all I've told you, Nora's still around, I see. I know. I I wanted to speak to her, but you just can't accuse people of things like that without any proof. My word should be proof enough. Well, I'll talk to her tomorrow, Wallace. Tomorrow, tomorrow, everything tomorrow. Why do you always keep putting things off? And you keep putting me off about my play. Play. Wallace, must we talk about that again? I'm getting a little tired of talking about it myself, Marion. Are you going to produce it or not? I told you, Wallace. It's impossible to get away with anything like that on Broadway. A man talking a woman into suicide. Why, the critics would laugh at it. Laugh at it, eh? So that's what you think of. Oh, we've been over this so many times, Wallace. Your, your play is just incredible, that's all. I'll show you how incredible it is. Wallace, please. What if I prove that a man can talk a woman? <laughs> I tell you, I can prove it. Why, I could talk even you into suicide within 48 hours. Oh, Wallace. Well, if you're so sure it can't be done, why don't you take me up on it? But it's too ridiculous. Yes? I'll bet you $40,000 I can do it. Wallace. Don't worry, I won't let you go through it. And if you can't make me? If I can't? If I can't, I'll never mention my play again. Well, it's almost worth it at that. 
But if I'm talked into suicide, how can I pay you $40,000? Just put it in writing, that's all. I, Marion Streber, hereby declare in the event of my... The event of my suicide within 48 hours that I bequeath the sum of $40,000 to my husband, Wallace Streber. What? Have you got that, Nora? Mrs. Streber? Oh, it isn't as bad as it sounds, Nora. Wallace is just trying to prove that his play has possibilities. But, Mrs. Streber... I think it's very clever of Wallace. Of course, he's not serious about it. But, you see, even if he can persuade me to think about suicide, then he's proved his point. His play isn't so incredible as we say it is. But you can't possibly go through with it. The whole thing's fantastic. I think I'm a better judge of that than you are, Nora. Mrs. Streber, you must call this off. You must. Don't you see? Don't you understand? That's why he was trying to get me out of the way. That's why he told you all those things about me. Oh, it's all so clear now. I don't know what you're talking about, Nora. Your husband wanted me out of the way so he could... so he could murder you for your money. Nora! I know it. It's true. Something awful is going to happen. I could feel it the minute he walked into this house. I know. Nora Wallace was right. You can pack your things and leave in the morning. Good night. I was terrified. I knew Marion Streber was going to be murdered. And I was powerless to save her. Wallace Streber married the wealthy play producer Marion Dunning. Nora Talbert was much distressed. Nora was secretary to the new Mrs. Streber, and she felt certain that Streber's affections extended only so far as the fat Dunning purse. Having married Marion, Wallace Streber began vainly trying to get his wife to back his play, dealing with a man talking a woman into suicide. Nora and Mrs. Streber thought the plot ridiculous and implausible. Streber, infuriated, bet his wife $40,000 that he could talk her into suicide, and within 48 hours, having tried, meanwhile, everything to get Nora out of the way. Nora wouldn't leave, because she was sure some disaster would come of the suicide note that Marion Streber jokingly had dictated to her, setting forth the terms of the wager. When Nora told her employer of her fear, that Wallace Streber planned to murder Marion after tricking her into writing the note, Marion ordered her to leave the house in the morning. Now, Nora lies in her bed, terrified of what this strange and violent night might bring. During the night, I could see a gleam of light streaming through their window, and it seemed to be moving back and forth, back and forth. I thought my imagination was playing tricks, when I heard an eerie, monotonous voice that sounded like Wallace Stevens. I put on my robe and quietly went down to the end of the corridor near their room. I listened. It wasn't my imagination. The voice was Wallace Stevens. Eerie, monotonous, saying over and over again... You're going to kill yourself. You're going to kill Even yourself. Even the walls seemed to be echoing and whispering. Yourself. You're going to kill yourself. The wind moaned it louder and louder and faster and faster. You're going to kill yourself. Kill. 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 I found the body of Marion Streber in her bedroom, a bullet hole through her heart. Then later... Through her heart, Inspector? That's right, Mr. Streber. The coroner just gave me his report a few minutes ago. The bullet went right through her heart, causing instant death. Poor Marion. I'm sorry to have to ask you questions at a time like this, Mr. Streber, but... Oh, of course, you... Inspector. Anything. There were no fingerprints on the gun except those of your wife. However, there's a question of a letter. 
Miss Talbot said Mrs. Streber dictated it to her last evening. Correct, Miss Talbot? That's right, Inspector. Do you recognize this letter, Mr. Streber? I, Marion Streber, hereby declare in the event of my suicide within 48 hours that I bequeath the sum of $40,000 to my husband. Of course I recognize it, Inspector, but it was just a joke, a bet, a wager. Surely you can't think that uh, this... A has... rather odd sort of joke, Mr. Streber. Well, let me explain. Marion wouldn't produce my money. She thought the idea behind it inconceivable, a, a man talking a woman into suicide. So I made a wager with her. I thought by infiltrating Marion's mind with the lines of the play, she'd get to like it and, and produce it. It's the truth, I swear. But not the whole truth, Inspector. I never thought she'd really do it, I tell you. It was a joke. I, I just read the play to her, that's all. Inspector, if Mrs. Streeper wouldn't commit suicide, she wasn't the kind of a person who would commit suicide. Inspector, I think I'm qualified to know my wife's mental attitude and character better than her secretary. She was a sane, strong-minded person. I tell you, she wouldn't kill herself. Marion was depressed lately. She seemed to be brooding about something. She was morose and unhappy. That's not true. What are you trying to do, Nora? Pin this on me? Incidentally, I noticed your bags were packed. Perhaps to make a quick getaway? Were you perhaps leaving the scene of the crime? I was going to leave this morning, Inspector. Mrs. Streber asked me to because we had a disagreement about that wager. I told her something disastrous would come of it. I was right. However, Miss Talbot, there is no additional evidence to prove the fact that Mrs. Streber was killed by anyone but herself. Then... Then there won't be an inquest? I'm so upset by this whole thing, I, I just can't believe There's it. There's no need to bother you anymore, Mr. Strebo, or you, Miss Talbot. There will be no inquest. I am entering the verdict as suicide. The case was closed. The verdict was suicide. And I left Dunning Mansion. But as the days passed, I knew no peace. The shot I heard that fatal night tormented me. And the voices and the peculiar circumstances which surrounded Mrs. Streber's suicide. I knew there must be some way, some clue, something I could find that would prove to the police that Mrs. Streber was murdered. So one night, about three weeks later, I decided to return to Dunning Mansion to look for additional evidence. Oh, Miss Nora. Oh, good evening. Good evening, Tompkins. Uh, Mr. Streber isn't in, Miss. I left some of my things here, Tompkins. I thought oh, I might... certainly, Mr. Tompkins. Come right in. Ah, it's nice to see you again. Thank you, Tompkins. How is everything? Quite different without Mrs. Streber here. It was very sad, Miss Nora. Yes, it was. Very she was a fine lady. And very fond of you, miss. If ever I can do anything for you... That's very kind of you, Tompkins. I'd better get my things. I guess they're still upstairs. Yes. Oh, you don't have to bother, Tompkins. I know the way. Of course, miss. I went straight upstairs to Streber's room. I opened the door and walked in. I felt that somehow, here in this room, I'd find the answer to the questions that were in my mind. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I determined to uncover every possibility. I looked everywhere, but I found nothing. I was about to leave when I noticed an old book partially hidden in the magazine rack. It was a very old volume of plays with a bookmark at a certain page. I opened it there, and the title of the play was Talk to Death. The same as Streber's. I thumbed through the pages. There was the suicide plot, the wager, even the letter. I, Evelyn Forbes, declare in the event of my suicide within 48 hours that I bequeath the sum of $40,000 to my husband. It was exactly the same as Streber's play, word for word. Only this had been written more than 30 years ago. The pieces of the puzzle clicked neatly together. I finally found the answer to the riddle of Marion Dunning's murder. <laughs> well, Nora? Wallace Streeper. Yes. Wallace Streeper. The two 
presumptuous of me if I ask what you're doing here? I, uh... I... I just came up to... Uh, to read your play. I see. You went through my things quite thoroughly. I, uh... I, I thought... You thought you'd look around. And you found the book. Yes. You plagiarized admirably, Mr. Strieber. Better than anyone I know. Since you're so very much interested in my play... Your play? You mean the play you copied word for word. Too much knowledge can be very dangerous, Nora. Also very helpful. Like finding out that you never intended to have a play produced at all. You copied this only as an excuse for murder. A frame-up to get your wife to write a suicide note. So you could murder her and get away with $40,000. Sit down, Nora. Since you're so interested in my play, we're going to read it together. No, I'm leaving. Nora, I said sit down. There. That's better. Now we'll run through the big sea. Go ahead, Nora. You start from uh, here. <laughs> Why are you trying to mesmerize me into suicide? I've been half out of my mind. Go ahead, Nora. Half out of my mind. Since I agreed to act as your guinea pig. Yes. You were trying to help me accomplish something that no psychiatrist has ever done before in medical history. To prove that a man can have enough influence over a woman to persuade her to kill us. Let's... Let's drop the whole thing, Roger. Look, dearest. We'll end the joke right now. You write out a suicide note, there's a topper, and we'll all have a laugh about it. Here. Here's a pen and some paper. Now, write this. I have decided to kill myself. Life no longer holds any meaning for me. No longer holds any meaning for me. Now, sign it. Evelyn. There. That's over. Yes. It is over. That's not the next line, Mr. Streeter. No. The next line is... I'm going to have to kill you. I'm going to have to kill you, Nora. And then... Easy, easy, Miss Talbot, easy. It's all right. You don't have to say any more. I can finish it from there, Johnson. Yes, Miss Martin. Miss Talbot screamed. A shot rang out. But this time it was the killer who was killed. Tompkins, the butler, having overheard the conversation, telephoned in time for this office to apprehend Wallace Streber and close the case. Inspector, I... It's all right, Miss Talbot. Everything's all right. Wallace Streber is dead. He's committed his last murder.
shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubt and fear. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hours.